This is Audible. Audible Studios presents Outcast, Star Force, Book Ten, written by B. V. Larson and David Van Dyke, narrated by Mark Boyette. Chapter One. My name is Cody Riggs, and I'm the son of a legend, which totally sucks most of the time. My dad had made a lot of enemies in his day. During the long years of the Macro War, he'd marshaled Earth's forces and commanded them through countless battles. Star Force had fought the machine invaders in space, in Earth's skies, over land, and even under the sea. Billions of humans had died, and large swaths of our planet had been poisoned. Afterward, my father had ruled all of Earth as an emperor for a brief time, most people have subsequently formed a good opinion of the part my father played in those days, but not everyone. In the angry minds of many grieving souls, my family came straight from the fires of hell. As I grew up, adults who had the misfortune of being put in charge of me often said I had an attitudinal problem. They claimed I wouldn't listen to authority. They called me rebellious and stubborn. But I never saw it that way. I've always been naturally curious and prefer to do things my own way. Individuality is its own reward. I think they focused on me because of the family name. Anything I did was scrutinized more than it would have been for a normal kid. Like I said, it kind of sucked growing up in my dad's shadow. If there was one thing that was cool about having Kyle Riggs as my dad, it had to be the opportunity to meet interesting people Perhaps the most interesting of them all was a weird robot named Marvin. He was an eccentric metal creature my dad had built a long time ago. No, that's not quite right. Marvin had pretty much assembled himself from the very beginning. I was a kid when I first met him, about eight years old. The first thing Marvin did was make a big deal about how I was a genetic combination of my parents in appearance. I had skinny arms, tanned skin, big eyes, and dark hair that was cut short. Marvin had come to stay with us for a few days in September, and although he wanted to live in our house, and I'd even offered to share my room with him, Jasmine, my mom, wouldn't allow it. She pointed her finger sternly toward the barn, and Marvin had slunk away on coiling tentacles. Marvin was strange that way. Being sent to the barn was insulting to him. He didn't even like being called a robot. He preferred to be thought of as a full-fledged person, an artificial person, to be sure, but a person and a citizen of the Federation, nonetheless. To me, he wasn't anything like a normal human, which was good, because that would have been boring. He was an extremely intelligent, strange, electromechanical creature, and I found him fascinating. He'd been on humanity's side in most of Earth's battles, and in many cases, he'd caused us to win— it was well documented that Marvin had saved our collective butts on more than one occasion throughout history. But it was equally true that he'd nearly triggered our extinction on less happy days. As I said, an interesting guy. Marvin's one and only visit to my family farm lasted about two weeks. He spent most of that time in the barn he'd been assigned to, but he came out now and then to wander around the property. One crisp fall morning as I left the house and walked toward the school bus stop, I noticed Marvin going for one of his seemingly aimless walks. Suddenly he returned to the barn and entered, moving quickly. Not thinking much of it, I kept heading toward the school bus. Many years later, I can still see the events that followed in my mind. The bus had pulled up and was idling, waiting for me to board. The vehicle hovered there not ten inches from the ground, it was maybe a hundred feet ahead of me with the wavering, bluish light of an energy field flickering underneath it. The idling repellers caused swirling eddies of dust to form. Funny how some visuals stick with you years later. The waiting door of the bus was so close, but not close enough. I heard the first ripping explosion. A fraction of a second later, I felt a surge of heat wash against my back. It was like being too close to a fireplace when it flared up behind you. I took a look back. I couldn't help it. A blazing plume of orange fire shot up into the sky. The barn was gone. 
in its place was an inferno. What I remember best were the flaming chickens. Like cotton balls soaked in gasoline, they ran around the yard aimlessly, living fireballs with churning feet. I started to run toward the road. The flames surged behind me, flaring bright. Then a secondary blast, bigger than the first, knocked me flat. When I opened my eyes a second or two later, my eyelashes and eyebrows were gone. I thought this must be what it was like to be breathed upon by a dragon. I tried to get up and run to the road, but the bus had roared away to save the rest of the children. I threw myself down again and crawled toward the road. My dad had taught me that. When the shit really hits the fan, son, he'd always said, get low and crawl on your belly. Looking back at the raging fire that had engulfed the barn, I spotted Marvin. He wormed his way out of the flames, his tentacles smoking. I could tell he was alive, but damaged. Determinedly, I kept crawling toward the road. There was a ditch out there alongside the pavement. I could roll into that and find shelter in case things went from bad to worse. Before I reached the ditch, something grabbed me and lifted me up. I hissed and struggled, thinking it was Marvin and expecting to be branded by those white-hot tentacles of his. Instead, it was my mom. She wasn't happy, and she carried me at an amazing pace toward the house before she finally put me down. I'm okay, Mom, I kept repeating, but it was as if she couldn't even hear me. That damned robot, I heard her say, along with a lot of bad words. We should have scrapped him years ago. I never did learn exactly what had gone wrong inside our barn. I don't think my parents ever figured it out either. But they were sure pissed off. They threw Marvin roughly off our property. I found a tentacle which my dad had ripped loose. My parents weren't standard-issue humans. They were ex-Star Force. That meant they'd bananatized and, in my dad's case, genetically enhanced. The tentacle was blackened and still smoking hot. It continued operating, whipping around in the ashes long after the flames had died down. I picked it up when it cooled enough and took it to the porch to fool with it, snapping it around like a whip. Mom had gone inside to find her first aid kit. She wasn't too happy to discover I had a squirming memento in my hands as she came out to patch me up. She made me drop my prize in the dirt near the porch. I wasn't too badly hurt. Sure, I had half a dozen nail-like splinters in my back. They hadn't gone in more than an inch, and they didn't really hurt. I think Mom was more upset than I was about my injuries. She picked at the splinters and fussed over the puncture wounds as if they were bullet holes. My parents had always known there was something unusual about me physically. Microbial baths had changed my dad forever, and he'd passed some of that altered DNA down to me. As a result, I was a tough kid who'd always ignored the kind of pain that brought others to tears. While Mom stitched and salved me with nanite sutures, I stared at that tentacle I watched it whip around like it was alive, which I suppose it was in a way, as much as the rest of Marvin was alive anyway. Over the next hour, the burn barned down to black sticks. The chickens were transformed into little round heaps of ash. I can still remember the smell, a campfire-like mixture of wood smoke and burnt feathers. I wanted to keep the tentacle as a souvenir, but my mom wouldn't let me. She took it away and I never saw it again. When I asked if Marvin would ever come back, Dad told me Marvin was always up to some kind of mischief and couldn't be trusted to do anything quiet and normal. He said if Marvin did come back, it would be because times had changed and events were going badly for humanity again. In other words, because we needed him. I didn't quite understand at the time. I do recall Dad trying to explain that the robot was a devil and an angel, all wrapped up into one. I guess the devilish side had risen to the forefront that day. It was years later, before I really understood what he was talking about. Chapter Two Fifteen years after Marvin incinerated every chicken on my dad's farm, I graduated from the Star Force Academy as an ensign and enjoyed a brief period of shore leave before coming on active duty. I was proud of my commission, and so was my old man. He'd offered me a beer in the basement, and one had led to twelve in short order. 
When the party was in full swing, Mom showed up at the top of the steps that led down into what she sometimes called the brewery. She informed me that Olivia had arrived, and that changed everything. Olivia was my girlfriend. She wasn't just any girlfriend. We hadn't been together more than a semester at the academy, but I already thought she was the one girl in the universe I might marry someday. I staggered up the steps, laughing. Dad followed. We had beer grins on our faces. Mom responded to our expressions with a dour one of her own. She'd never really liked it when we got drunk. I think in the past my dad hadn't been at his best when he drank too much. I'd expected Olivia to be in the living room, but she was outside. I went to the window, and that's when I saw it. Her father's space yacht, Greyhound, sat in the yard right between the tractors and the new barn. My jaw sagged. Seriously? I asked her. She smiled, showing me a lovely curve of glossed lips, and nodded. She was British, rich, and attractive. Whenever we spent time together, I found myself grinning a lot. We're going for a ride, Cody, she said. The only person who didn't think a celebrity flight into space while intoxicated was a good idea was my mom. She was right, of course, but I was too happy to listen to her. With a sigh, she rolled her eyes, forced a smile, and wished us well. Olivia and I rushed off to Greyhound before anyone could think of a good reason to stop us. My dad shouted behind me, and I waved over my shoulder. I knew Mom had been hoping my shore leave would be a quiet family affair, a brief period of family togetherness. But it wasn't meant to be. I was more like Dad than I was like Mom in personality, and that meant I liked to get into situations. I'd gathered more than my share of bumps and bruises while growing up. Just having the rig's name had been a pain in the ass, but not for the reasons you might think. I'd been nanotized and microbe-optimized from birth, so I had to be really careful about pushing back against all those assholes that wanted to test my reputation. With this name, some guys just wanted to take a swing at me in a bar, and I had to make sure I didn't win too easily. The knowledge that I wasn't as likely to die or get permanently maimed did make it easier to get into trouble. Like the time I'd borrowed a flitter, and Repeller dived onto the top of the Academy water tower with a backpack full of spray paint. I'd been slightly drunk and on a mission to tell the world how much I thought of my new girlfriend and classmate Olivia Turnbull. They'd never proven it was me, and even if they had, what were they going to do? Kick Cody Riggs out of the Academy? Once aboard, Olivia and I quickly piloted the boat up into space. We approached the refueling station in orbit, waiting our turn. I stared through the nano-glass front viewing port of her father's sleek space yacht. From the ground, Greyhound had seemed huge, the size and shape of a jetliner of the pre-war days. But here in Earth orbit, it was small, especially when compared to the Star Force battleship looming off the port bow. There's our future, Olivia said as we watched the warship glide into a docking station and begin to refuel. We'll be captains some day. Think big, I said. We'll be admirals. She laughed, that throaty laugh I loved. Our turn at the orbital refueling station came quickly. The Turnbull family pilot had flown us up from the farm and now guided Greyhound in with a deft touch. I'd wanted to do it myself, but the man had been adamant about following his instructions. I decided now was not the time to push the issue, not with my girl watching. Later, when we were out in deep space, I would get my hands on the controls, and we'd see about some real piloting. I looked over at Olivia, running my eyes up and down her shapely form. She had high cheekbones like a model, and straight dark hair. Her legs were long, and her body had just enough curves in the right places to give her a sleek, sexy look. We'd started dating in school, and I'd known right away I'd hit the jackpot. All that and money, too. The Turnbulls were one of the British Isles' richest and most influential families, and I was a Riggs. Between the two of us, we had fame, fortune, and guts. Who could ask for more? Olivia grinned as she noticed my scrutiny. She leaned over and whispered in my ear, What are you thinking about? I was wondering how wide the bunks are on this yacht. 
She snorted and shook her head. All you think about is shagging. I put my arm around her and kissed her, but didn't try anything else. I'd take my time. I figured I'd make my move as soon as we got past the refueling station. She had to be expecting me to try, or she wouldn't have brought me up here. Things were definitely heating up with Olivia. As freshly commissioned officers, Olivia and I had two months before we had to report for duty, so we were going to spend some time running around the solar system on a last fling before we started full-up pilot training. We'd both been qualified as pilots on civilian models like the Greyhound since our teenage years. Also, the brain box on this ship could fly it by itself, so we weren't worried. Suddenly, the yacht gave a bump and a lurch. I glanced sharply at the pilot who ignored me. I knew that if I'd been at the controls, I would have come in much more smoothly. We latched onto the magnetic grapples of the orbital refueling station, and the rich deuterium-tritium fuel for the fusion generator flowed to the tanks. At that point, the pilot stood and said, This is where I get off. Ma'am, sir, have a nice trip. I thought I saw something disdainful in his eyes as he looked at me. Maybe it was envy over the babe at my side, or maybe it was more of the rig's mystique. Olivia nodded to him, and we watched as he left the small bridge. He'll take a shuttle to his next job, she said, as if I really cared. More bumps and thumps came as the automated station refueled us. I sat down and began to customize the controls for myself. This was going to be fun. A few minutes later, we cast off. Following Olivia's instructions, I set course for the Tyche ring. Olivia still refused to tell me exactly where we were going. An adventure, she declared, and then sealed her sexy lips. Once we were out of the control zone and Earth's orbit, I told Olivia to strap in. Even with the high-end inertial fields on this boat, it was safer to be cushioned, especially for Olivia, since she had yet to undergo the nanite treatments. The seats formed smart metal shells around our backs and sides, and straps extruded themselves across our bodies in several places. It wasn't very comfortable, but it was much safer. I rammed the throttles forward, pouring power into the three huge engines. As a racing yacht, Greyhound was overpowered. I loved that surging feeling of acceleration. The floor seemed to tilt as the G's leaked through the inertial field, which I deliberately set slightly low, so we could feel the kick in the ass. We blasted out of orbit and into interplanetary space. Don't you love those G's? I yelled over the roaring engines. You're welcome, Olivia replied. Oh yeah, thanks for letting me drive. Just don't tell father she said, referring to Lord Grantham Turnbull, known simply as Lord Grantham, to friends and family. Eventually, I came off the throttles to give Olivia a break. I let the gravity stabilize and decreased our acceleration rate. This gave us a steady flight path toward Tyche, which would take a couple of days to reach. Back in my dad's day, it had taken much longer, but with the new technology, ships could sustain constant acceleration while those inside hardly felt it. The ship's brain box reported a couple of sensors on the hull needing repair. I frowned, thinking an expensive yacht like this should be maintained better. Maybe I'd accelerated too hard and torn them off. Letting the brain box fly the ship, Olivia and I sat staring at the naked stars. She cuddled in my arms. All in all, this was a wonderful start to the voyage. Look, I said, pointing at a constellation. The Pleiades, the Seven Sisters. Funny, I always wanted more sisters, but I guess one is enough. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'd heard the story of Olivia's mother dying in childbirth with her, an event even more shocking than usual in these days of nanomedical miracles. Maybe we'll have seven daughters, how's that? Brilliant, she snuggled closer. Hmm, this is nice. Yeah, it is. You sure you don't want more? She kissed me deeply. I knew then that this was going to be the night. We'd hinted around and I'd tried every trick I knew. But so far, Olivia and I hadn't done more than make out. Curiously, this had me more determined to get together with her. 
The fact that I hadn't become bored and wandered off to find a new girl I'd taken as a sign of commitment on my part. Funny how these things sneak up on a guy. Of course I want more, I said. Let's check out the bunks. She headed for the staterooms, and I followed. At the door to mine, she went inside first and then closed the smart metal in my face. Let me get ready, she said. I grumbled, but walked away to a nearby observation port. I stared out at space through the triple-thick nanoglass. It showed the heavens ablaze with more stars than could be seen from an earthly mountaintop. Disaster struck, just as I was beginning to wonder what she was doing in there. It started with some odd clunking noises and then the sound of tearing metal. I noticed it first as my nanotized hearing was sharp. What's that? I said, looking around. What's what? Olivia called through the smart metal hatch. Suddenly an explosion rocked the ship, and the smart hatchway melted away and became metallic grit. A hole had been blown in the hull directly in front of Olivia. The shock wave threw us down onto the deck. Almost immediately the storm of debris reversed itself, and all the air was sucked out of the chamber. Whatever had just happened had cut through the tough multiple layers of the outer hull that were supposed to keep us safe from space-borne hazards. Half-blind, I struggled to my feet. My hands had been torn up by the blast, but gritting my teeth, I found I could move them. I already felt my nanites and microbes rushing through my bloodstream to the injured areas. The vacuum hadn't sucked us out into space, at least, but Olivia had been pulled to the breach in the hull, and for a second I thought the suction might have ripped her guts out— I tugged, and she came free in a shower of frozen blood that looked like floating rubies. We'd lost gravity and pressure. Only my unusual physique was keeping me moving, but I knew it wouldn't last. My first thought was to restore pressure for Olivia's sake. I could survive hard vacuum for a minute or more, but I knew she couldn't. I leaped across the room to the tear in the wall and grabbed the pieces that had been folded back like aluminum foil— the smart metal in them was trying to close the hole, but it needed some help, so I bent and pushed the flanges back into place until the various edges found each other and started their self-healing process. As soon as the metal had formed a rudimentary seal, I pressed my head against the wall speaker and yelled with the remaining air in my lungs, Greyhound, initiate emergency repressurization! Even without atmosphere, the vibrations should travel through my skull and be picked up by the ship's brain box. A moment later, I was rewarded with a blast of warm oxygen from the vents. I stayed with Olivia as a warm breath of oxygen hissed back into the chamber. Gravity returned, too, and her blood droplets showered onto my back and pattered on the deck. Now that we were getting air and heat, I returned to my girl. I realized she wasn't moving. She was lying face down on the deck. Blood was flowing out of her still. It was everywhere. Rolling her over, I was horrified to find the whole front of her face and torso covered with blood. Clearly, she was in shock. I managed to get her breathing again, but it was ragged. Her eyes roved the room as if seeing everything except me. Olivia, Olivia, can you hear me? I said urgently. Cody? She focused briefly on my face, and then the light in her eyes went out, and her head sagged. I realized her skull must have impacted something, and part of her hair had been torn away and now hung by a flap of skin. I had to get her to the auto dock on board, a rich man's medical toy combining a brain box and all the surgical tools, diagnostic software, and drugs that could be packed into a machine the size of a coffin. It was as advanced as a Star Force military critical care unit. I knew it would be able to fix her up. It had to. I scooped Olivia up with a pounding heart, spewing curses. I shoved my shoulder against the pressure door and roared at the brain box, Open the wardroom door! Unable to comply. Air pressure not restored in outer passageway. I growled in frustration and carried her across to the other door, went through the galley and then out the other side. All the while, I could feel her blood running down my arms and spattering onto the floor, making me more and more frantic. I charged down several corridors, taking the long way around to the auto dock, until once more a locked pressure door stopped me. Greyhound, open this damn door, I yelled. Unable to comply, air pressure not restored in outer passageway. Is the auto dock on the other side of this bulkhead? I asked. 
Affirmative. Open an emergency portal through the wall. Command not accepted. Only authorized personnel can issue emergency orders. I roared and kicked the wall, denting it. If I didn't get Olivia into the auto dock, I knew she was going to die. The only authorized person is incapacitated. You must have some kind of override protocol. A pinhead camera on a stalk focused on me and then on Olivia. Temporary authorization granted. I watched the smart metal of the wall thin until a circular hole opened in the center. As soon as it was wide enough, I stepped through, hitting the auto dock's open button with one bloody hand as I juggled Olivia's body. The nano-glass canopy rose, and I placed her into the coffin-like enclosure. Slamming the cover closed activated the auto dock, and it went to work on her with four arms. The machine jammed needles and probes into her, fired up laser scalpels, and deftly began slicing away her clothing before starting on her body. I turned away, not able to watch the machine cut up the love of my life. I felt sick. I wondered what the hell had happened. Had we hit a meteor at a speed high enough to burst through the triple-walled hull? That was the only thing I could think of. I'd been stupid and Olivia was going to pay for my complacency. I should have insisted she get nanotized before we went on this trip. Though the treatments were scheduled for two months from now, I knew that with our family's influence we could have gotten them early. Pretending to receive the nanite injections as an adult would have been a perfect cover for the fact that I had had the nanites my whole life, and the early injections would have given Olivia a much better chance of surviving what had just happened. Process Failure the autodoc suddenly announced. Patient vitals are diminishing. Extreme life-saving measures will be initiated unless override is input. Extreme life-saving measures? What kind of extreme life-saving measures? I looked at the screens and displays trying to decipher the medical readouts. These things were supposed to be cutting edge. I racked my brain trying to remember what I had heard about their capabilities. The autodoc didn't answer me. Nanites! You're going to nanotize her, I said. My parents had filled me with nanites at an early age, but Olivia wasn't due to get her nanite injections until she received her first assignment. In Star Force, being injected with nanites was a requirement for active duty. They rebuilt the human body from the inside out and became symbiotic with the host organism. As a result, personnel in Earth's space-going military healed faster, were stronger, and had better reflexes than normal civilians. At this point, Olivia was still a natural woman. Nanite injections proceeding. Extreme life-saving procedure in progress. Please back away from the canopy. Not knowing why, I did what it told me to do. I backed away from the curving nano-glass. The warning came just in time, for suddenly the material starred from an impact, as if a bullet had struck it from the inside. My head swung wildly looking for the source of the damage before I realized what it must be. Even sedated, Olivia's body was reacting to the nanites pouring through her body, rebuilding her flesh for the very first time. Hugely strong with pain and adrenaline surges, her convulsions were cracking the glass on the auto dock's cover, although I could see the glass uncracking, repairing itself. I hoped it would hold. After a few minutes, she seemed to settle down, so I eased over to look through the glass again. Her skin writhed, and she grimaced in pain, her head jerking back and forth as if having the most horrible nightmare imaginable. It made me want to break something, especially because I had no idea how she would come out of the treatment. Nanites were determinedly stupid little creatures, fulfilling their program to rebuild shattered flesh and bone, even if the patient died in the process. I'd heard my dad tell of marines under his command, who had been buried with perfect corpses, as the nanites repaired body structure, but couldn't preserve life. I sat down on the floor and uttered a stream of low, vile profanity directed at myself that would have shocked my mother and surprised my father. I'd never been subject to recriminations, but now I got to experience them in spades. With no idea what else to do, I tried to think of a Hindu prayer for healing— Mom had taught me when I was little, but I just couldn't bring it to mind. Extreme life-saving measures have failed, the autodoc announced after an indeterminable time. I bolted to my feet and pressed hands against the glass. She seemed to be resting, at peace. 
but I couldn't tell if she was breathing. Frantically, I pulled up the patient vitals. Everything showed flat and red. Olivia was dead. I smashed my hand against the nano glass, starring it yet again, and then crumpled to the floor. I began to take deep breaths, but it felt like I wasn't getting any air into my lungs. I wanted to yell at the stupid machine, but I knew that wouldn't help. Even something as automatic as an autodoc worked better if the humans involved had at least read the instruction manual. And I hadn't. In fact, I'd totally screwed up by just jumping aboard Greyhound when they picked me up at the farm, and flown off without a safety briefing or even rudimentary familiarization on this specific ship's systems. Four years of academy training, and I'd thrown it out the window the first chance I got. I'd never believed the people who called me an arrogant jackass. Until now. That's just what I was. And now Olivia lay dead in front of me, because I thought we were both immortal. When I could breathe again, I began to wonder just how this accident had occurred, and who might be responsible. Chapter 3 What else could I do but go back to Earth? Where before I'd loved the idea of taking the controls, now I just wanted to take it all back. I wanted to drink and sleep. Maybe when I woke up, it would all turn out to have been a bad dream. I forced myself to instruct the brain box to land back on Olivia's family estate. It took more arguing, but once I convinced it the only command personnel aboard was dead, some kind of backup protocol kicked in, and it complied. Then I drank and slept. We landed in the English countryside on a gray and drizzling day, perfect for the way I was feeling. I'd given minimum information to Olivia's father on the way in, but he knew something terrible had happened. The whole household of servants, groundskeepers, stable hands, and security guards, maybe seventy people, had turned out to watch the big yacht land in its cradle near a small lake in the back of the mansion. Medical personnel rushed up the ramp, and I pointed them wordlessly toward the auto dock. I hadn't moved her from it. If there was any remote chance that I was wrong and she was able to be revived, the machine and the nanites were her only hope. Olivia's father, Lord Grantham Turnbull, greeted me with a frozen face and a rigorously proper handshake, his back ramrod straight. I'm terribly sorry, sir, I told him. I'd rehearsed this moment in my mind, but found everything I'd thought of saying sounded pointless now. You are. That was as far as I got before my mind shut down, not willing to face the pain. I'm sorry, I repeated. Thank you, the older man said stiffly. He glanced up at the ship, his eyes taking in the damage and then narrowing. What exactly happened? Not much more than I reported before, sir. Something struck us. Or maybe something exploded, ripping a hole in my stateroom. Olivia took the brunt of it. I got her into the auto dock as soon as I could, but it was too late. Your stateroom? His eyes bored holes in me. Yes, sir. There was no point in dodging the facts, and I decided to just stick to the unvarnished truth. It's not like we weren't old enough to sleep together. Then this was aimed at you. Part of me was relieved that he wasn't upset at me for defiling his daughter. The other part of me clutched at the straws of his implication. You don't think this was an accident? Lord Grantham shook his head. I did some blasting in my younger days, mining and so on. That, he pointed at the damage, was an explosion. Not a big one, mind you. Not big enough to destroy the ship. Just big enough to kill you. I think that's what they wanted. Olivia was supposed to be alive, bringing you home in a box. I looked at him in surprise and grief. Another wave of guilt passed through me. With sad eyes, Grantham touched my shoulder. 
as God is my witness. I'll find out who did this. Thank you, sir. If there's anything I can do, I'll let you know. The way he said it made me think he wasn't going to let the loose cannon Cody Riggs anywhere near the investigation. About then, the medics walked down the ramp with the auto dock on a repair lift, Olivia's body still inside. Everyone watched, sadly, but made no move to interfere as they loaded her into an ambulance. I suppose the authorities had to go through their procedures no matter what. Mr. Riggs, I have arrangements to attend to. You've met Adrian, I believe. Lord Grantham turned to a striking young woman standing nearby. She was cast in the same mold as her sister Olivia, but dark blonde where Olivia had been a brunette. She was also more fit-looking. From what I recalled Olivia saying about her sister, she worked out a lot and had been a yoga instructor in the past. She had the well-sculpted body to prove it. She was a year older than Olivia, if I remembered correctly, and was working on her doctorate in industrial engineering at Oxford. She was something of a prodigy, as I understood it. Olivia often bragged about her. Used to brag. Yes, we've met, I said in a flat, bleak voice. Adrian stared for a moment at the hand I'd extended, then shook it firmly, searching my face as if answers waited there. Unfortunately, I had none to give. Adrian can look after you for the moment. I bid you good day. With that, Lord Grantham dismissed me. He turned to supervise his staff as they began to swarm over the ship. Adrian drew me away toward the main house, and we walked the quarter mile in silence instead of taking one of the electric carts. It seemed to make sense just to plod down the path, hoping Earth's gravity would suck away all my hurting. Olivia's sister didn't ask me any questions, and in my numbed state I didn't volunteer to talk. I wasn't ready yet. When we got there, Adrian showed me the sitting room and left me there. She didn't offer to put me up for the night. I got the impression that she was angry and blamed me. No surprise, I blamed myself. Eventually, an automated servant dropped off my bag. I'd left everything on the ship because I knew it would all have to be searched for the investigation. I might as well just let them do it up front and clear my name of all but stupidity as quickly as possible. With no idea what else to do and no instructions, I called for a cab to take me to the academy located only about a hundred miles away in these English Midlands. I wasn't a student there anymore, but at least the area was familiar. It was better for me to remove myself from the family's grieving. No matter what, they would tend to see me as the source of the tragedy. Once at the academy, I found an empty room in the dorms and slept until late the next morning. The grounds of the Star Force Academy in summertime were sparsely populated. My friends had scattered across the globe after graduation. There was no one to talk to. The only thing that made sense now was to go home. So I called a cab to take me to the airport. With modern, repeller-powered, suborbital transport, I arrived back in California within two hours. Mom greeted me with a sad face and a hug. Dad with a handshake and a back slap. I'd sent them a message so they knew the basics, but I hadn't felt like talking about it on the way. I appreciated their sympathetic eyes, but I didn't really want any part of a feelings dump right now, especially with my mother. Maybe some other time, but not now. Dad understood, I think. He'd seen plenty of death, and he knew how to handle it. All he did was jerk his head toward the man cave in the basement, where a fridge full of beer and a cabinet of harder stuff awaited us. Somewhere, long after a dozen, I passed out. He left me sleeping on an old, familiar sofa. The next day I did it again, and then the next, until I got a message from Adrian. Staring at my phone through bleary eyes, I realized I hadn't even said goodbye to her, but it didn't seem important that day. I'd been stunned. The text of her message told me the time and date of Olivia's funeral, which was tomorrow. I thought about calling her, but in the end, I just sent her a short note saying I'd be there. Sobering up after three days sucked, but it had to be done. Getting nanatized guys like me and my dad drunk was harder than normal. 
On the other hand, I never had much of a hangover. A long, hot shower and a ten-mile run fixed me right up. Slowing to a jog at its end, I noticed my father working outside. I walked over to him. What the hell am I going to do now, Dad? I asked him as he tinkered with one of the farm's tractors. What do you want to do? My fists balled up and my jaw clenched. I want to hunt them down. Whoever did this. What's stopping you? I stared at him. I'm a Star Force officer now. I can't just go kicking down doors and making waves. What else do you think Star Force officers are supposed to do? It's not like the old days, Dad. We have rules, and I'm not the supreme commander. He shook his head. To hell with the rules, boy. If someone had taken a shot at me, and it was your mother lying dead, what would you expect me to do? I saw his point. Something hot within me flared up. I'd expect you to kick down doors and make waves, like when Sandra... Dad showed his teeth. Now you're talking. You're a Riggs, son. Bend the rules or break them if you have to. I'll back you up or bail you out. I still have a few favors to call in. Pride in my name and Dad's confidence in me surged in my heart. He was right. I had to do something. If they court-martialed me, I could always come back and work on the farm after I got out of prison. I drew myself up, taking a ragged breath. Thanks, Dad. That's what I'm going to do. I packed a bag and after hugging Mom one last time, hopped the next suborbital back to the UK. Adrian picked me up at the suborbital spaceport. How are you holding up? I said as I tossed my bag into the back seat and climbed into the car. Fine, Adrian lied. Sorry it had to be me picking you up. Father has all the staff working on the... She swallowed a lump in her throat. The funeral. No problem. I kept glancing at her and she finally noticed. What is it? Adrian asked gently. Just the absurdity of life. Self-pity, maybe, I don't know. Nothing seems real with her gone, and now you. You're like her ghost, sitting here, alive. I think I know what you mean. I also wish she was still here. Adrian. I turned to look at her profile, so much like Olivia's. Has your father found anything out? He won't tell me. Adrian slammed a palm against the steering wheel. He thinks he's protecting me. I just wish we could do something. She glanced over at me. Maybe he'll talk to you. He'd better. Don't push too hard. You know how he is. I didn't answer. I'd push him as hard as I saw fit. I needed to know. Once we arrived at her family's estate, she showed me to a room. I hardly unpacked, as I had something else on my mind already. Olivia's memorial service proceeded in the stately manner I had expected it to. I tossed a red rose onto the casket as it was lowered into the ground, but found I was too angry to shed tears. Afterward, everyone sipped tea and nibbled numbly on hors d'oeuvres, mumbling kind words that eased their grief. But not mine. Later, I slipped away to my room, feeling no connection to these people, save Adrian. As the sole remaining woman of the family, she stayed busy mingling and accepting endless condolences. Eventually, the visitors left. I wasn't sure what I was going to do, but it had to start with the yacht and figuring out what had happened. It was probably too soon, but I couldn't wait, so I hunted down Lord Grantham. A servant showed me to his study, where he sat behind a desk reading a report, a pot of tea at his elbow. Yes, Riggs, what is it? His voice hovered between coldly polite and abrupt. I'd like to know what you've uncovered, sir. The investigation is still ongoing. He closed the file he was looking at. I'd appreciate something more than that, sir. Lord Grantham's face hardened. You'll be told what you need to know when you need to know it. All I will tell you is that I still suspect sabotage and an attempt on your life. Dealing with powerful men like this was always tricky. If you were of lower status, you were expected to shut up and do as you were told. 
However, I wasn't one of his lackeys, and my family name was just as prestigious as his. Sir, I can't just hang around doing nothing. I'm a Star Force officer just like Olivia was. I need to do something to be involved. Put me to work on the investigation, or at least give me a general idea of what you found. Riggs, I have employed two dozen professionals to look into this matter, not to mention the security services and the police. There is really nothing you can do. Not to put too fine a point on it, your ties to this family were broken when my daughter died. Now I will thank you to stay out of the way. Good day. But good day to you, sir. His voice was steel. Keeping tight control of my temper, I wheeled and marched out of the room. Seething, I wandered the corridors of the mansion, drawing curious glances from the servants. I found several men drinking and smoking in the billiards room, a post-funeral wake, I suppose. Inviting myself to the bar, if not to their company, I swallowed one shot of fine single malt after another, hardly tasting the liquor. I couldn't see why Lord Grantham was shutting me out. He'd always treated me with courtesy before— although I'd always suspected he had reservations about my suitability as a husband for Olivia. A thought flitted through my mind. Was it within the realm of possibility that he himself had tried to kill me? The idea had a certain logic to it, but I eventually dismissed it for three reasons. First, doing it aboard his own yacht would automatically make him a suspect. Dad had told me he'd made a call to a friend in the world government's security services, so that angle was covered. Second, trying to kill me seemed too extreme for a guy with so much to lose. It wasn't like I was some gold-digging bum trying to get a piece of the inheritance. Third, too many things could have, and in fact did, go wrong. I couldn't see him putting Olivia at risk that way. That was the last coherent train of thought I had before the numbness of alcohol overcame my frustration, and I found my way to my room to sleep. Chapter 4 I awoke in the middle of the night with a clear head and the vague beginnings of a plan. Dressing and packing my bag, I slipped out into the hall and shut my door as quietly as possible. I'd left my shoes off, so I padded silently down the corridors, counting turns and doors, until I came to the one I wanted. Raising my hand to knock, I paused and instead tried the handle. The door opened smoothly and I slipped inside. Moonlight shone in the high windows and fell on Adrian's sleeping form. Suddenly she sat up. Reeks, she hissed, turning on the bedside lamp and clutching the blanket to her chest. That's me. What in the bloody hell are you doing in my room? Coming to see you. I set my bag down and took a seat in a richly upholstered chair near her bed. This had better not be some twisted romantic fantasy of yours, of me replacing Olivia. I held up my hands. No, no, Adrian. I just want to find out what's going on. But your father is freezing me out. You could have come to talk to me a bit earlier, instead of the middle of the night, before you decided to get drunk. Yes, I saw you in the parlor, sucking on that bottle. Well, I'm sober now. I'm here, and I need you. Riggs, not that way. Just listen, will you? Tell me what you know. I mean, you must have heard something. I'm not supposed to talk about it. Besides, it's little enough. Tell me, I said, insisting. There is one thing I overheard. An investigator said the bomb had been perfectly calculated to kill whoever was in your stateroom, but not endanger the rest of the ship. I nodded. Then it was an assassination attempt, for sure. I believe so. Leaning forward, I stared into her face. In the car. You said you wanted to do something. Did you mean it? Bloody well right I did. Then get dressed. You have to help me get aboard the yacht. Why? You think you'll find something the others missed? No, I want to steal it and fly it to where Olivia wanted to go. It's my only lead. That stopped her. She stared at me open-mouthed. Are you having me on? I'm serious. 
Her face grew thoughtful, then she said, If you want my help, I'm going too. Hell no. I already got Olivia killed, and I'm not risking you. That's not up to you, Cody Riggs. It's my father's yacht, my biometrics that will activate it, and you don't even know where she was taking you. My eyes narrowed. And you do? She was my sister. Of course I knew. We talked every day, nearly. So where are we headed? Adrian shook her head. I'll tell you once we're on our way. I've heard about you. You'll drop me in a ditch and steal my ship otherwise. People often make up stories about me. Being named Riggs is a curse sometimes. Just get me aboard and let me go. She shook her head and crossed her arms under her breasts stubbornly. We glared at each other for a moment, and I did not get the impression she was going to give in. Hell, I don't have time for this, I said. Okay, you win. Pack a bag and let's go. To Adrian's credit, she packed quickly. Soon she was dressed in traveling clothes with a backpack over one shoulder. We slipped through the mansion unnoticed and out the back door. Adrian stopped us for a moment on the patio. We watched as a security guard strolled by. Then we hurried quietly across the lawn into a nearby copse of trees. Nobody ever looks for people trying to leave a guarded place. On the other side, I led her down the path to the yacht's cradle next to the small lake. Adrian placed her hand against the recognition plate near the main hatch, and it opened. Once inside, I insisted Adrian give me command authority right away. Not being able to give instructions to this ship had cost me valuable time in an emergency. That was one mistake I wasn't going to make again. I also checked the new auto dock to make sure it was fully stocked with medical supplies. You sure you don't want to be nanotized before we go? I asked her. She rubbed her arms and shivered, though it was not cold. No, I never liked the idea of things running around inside me, no matter how beneficial. I didn't argue with her as I needed her cooperation, and we had to get away before we got caught. I ran through the standard pre-flight checklist as fast as I could. I was cursing the delay, but wasn't willing to take unwarranted chances. I confirmed all damage had been repaired by a combination of replacement parts, constructive nanites, and smart metal reprogramming. Lastly, I turned off the transponder so we couldn't be tracked. Then, we lifted as quietly as possible. We rose straight up, smoothly, the porpoise-bodied yacht shoving the atmosphere aside easily as its powerful repellers accelerated us to just under Mach 1. We could have pushed through the sound barrier using the engines, but I didn't want to cause a sonic boom. We might as well try to get as far away as possible before Lord Grantham found out what we'd done. I assume we're heading for the orbital refueling station, she said as I nudged the controls. Yes, I said. The bomb had to have been placed there. I agree, because Father has had the estate security video gone over with a fine-toothed comb, and there's nothing. The brain box readout showed a small mass gain discrepancy upon Greyhound's departure from the station, just a few pounds, not enough mass to trigger an alarm. Maybe that's why the bomb was small, anything larger, and it would have been detected. That's what I believe. I looked at her in delayed surprise. So you do know some things about the investigation. Adrian shrugged. Well, now that we've nicked Father's yacht anyway, I'll admit I eavesdropped as much as I could. Good. I smiled at her as the yacht climbed upward, like an old-style rocket minus the blast, slowly accelerating as the air thinned. In two minutes, we gained the edge of space, and in twenty minutes more, we would be at the orbital truck stop where ships topped off, before heading out into the black. Adrian asked, So what are we going to do at the station? Father's people have already interviewed the crew and sequestered the records. She turned from the nanoglass windshield to stare directly at me. We're not going to the station to investigate. Whoever planted the bomb is long gone, and like you said, the pros have been all over it. No, we just need to top off our fuel like anyone else would when heading out on a long trip. I don't want to have to stop later on and get impounded. It wasn't long before we reached the refueling station. This time I told the brain box to be especially vigilant and report any anomalies. 
Everything went smoothly without the bumps and thumps I remembered from last time. Snapping my fingers, I said, Did they interview the pilot who flew us up to this point last time? Yes, he's clean. Worked for us for years. I twisted my lips into a grimace. That would have been too easy. Still, the look he had given me as he left had seemed suspicious in retrospect. With refueling completed, I eased Greyhound away and along the same flight path we had taken before, but this time I went at a normal acceleration so as not to draw attention. I aimed at the Taiki ring that led to Alpha Centauri. Adrian turned her co-pilot's chair toward me once more. So, Hotshot, how are we going to get through the ring without Star Force intercepting us? I thought we'd just blast through at high speed. I'll broadcast that you and I are aboard so they won't fire on us, even if they could catch us. There's just no way to stop a ship in space without violence, and I'm betting they won't be willing to do that. But they could follow and apprehend us when we get to where we're going. Yeah, I sighed. I'm not sure how I'm going to handle that, but I'll think of something. By the way, where are we going? The Thor system. But actually, you don't have to think of anything. Adrian smiled impishly at me. I raised one eyebrow. I don't? I left Father a note, telling him what we did, and not to report us if he ever wants to talk to me again. As far as everyone else is concerned, we're just rich space tourists. Spontaneously, I grinned at her. You got balls, girl, just like... Horrified, I bit my tongue. Adrian coughed. Just like Olivia, you were saying? God, I'm so sorry. It's all right. She was brilliant. I loved her, and you did too. Why would it bother me to be compared to her? I tried to detect any edge of bitterness in her voice, but found none, only the tinge of grief. Even so, I resolved to be more careful about what I said. We passed through the ring without slowing after getting clearance from the control station there, this allowed us to maintain our speed and even accelerate once we'd reached Alpha Centauri. In this way, we transited the distance through several rings all the way to Thor. Adrian and I spent the days talking in circles, endlessly discussing every aspect of what had happened and who might be behind it. But we really didn't have enough facts. I kept trying to get her to tell me exactly where we were going, but she always declined with a smile. I guess she liked the air of mystery, though it was driving me nuts. I again raised the issue of her taking the nanite treatments, pointing out that if Olivia had been nanitized, she might have survived. Adrian still refused. At last we came to the end of the line of linked star systems. We reached the Thor ring and passed through it. A binary star system, Thor had been home to the crustaceans before the vicious battles that had rendered their three water moons uninhabitable. Thor possessed three rings, which was unusual. One linked to the dead sun, a cosmic cul-de-sac leading nowhere. The second one led back to Eden, which we'd just traveled through. The final one I knew lay half buried in the mantle of Yale, one of the lobster's former homes. It had been turned off and dead for decades. So, we're here... I asked Adrian, who sat expectantly in her seat, obviously waiting for me to say something. She seemed to savor the drama, just as Olivia had. That thought sobered me. Seriously, where to now? I asked. You know about the Yale ring, right? Yes. Once the macros turned it off, we could never get it turned back on again. Dad believes the machines might still be on the other side, building up. But nobody wants to hear that. Adrian held up her hand as if to get back on track. Yes, there was a big expedition about twenty years ago that failed to achieve any breakthrough. So Star Force left an orbital station and a few spy drones monitoring the dead ring. But now they're secretly trying again. They? Who is they? A fleet-sponsored civilian science team. One of those lobsters is long, too, since it was their system originally. How the hell do you know all of this if it's supposed to be secret? I have my ways. I bugged Adrian to tell me, but couldn't get any more out of her. So this was Olivia's surprise, I said, studying Yale. There was a ship drifting there, just as she'd said there would be. 
It was a Star Force warship. Just wait until we get there, Adrian said. That evening, Greyhound announced we would be turning over and gradually decelerating from our high speed. Just after it did, the brain box came back with possible anomaly in the aft cargo bay. That got my attention. When we had left the refueling station, I had instructed the ship to keep watch for anything out of the ordinary, no matter how small. I could hear the way it hesitated, as if it was uncertain. I suppose that even the words, no matter how small, were open to interpretation. There had to be a cutoff or any measurement below which anomalies were ignored, or the thing would be forever reporting false positives every time we ran into a piece of space dust. It could have just been cargo shifting due to the turnover. What kind of anomaly? I asked. Unknown. That was all it said. Okay, I was going to have to dig it out of the brain box. These things didn't have much imagination. What parameters have been exceeded? I probed. Mass, chemical composition, movement, energy? That seemed to prompt the ship's mind to finally give me something definite. None of the above. No single parameter is sufficiently divergent, but taken together, there is a better than 50% chance of an anomaly. Give me visual in all spectra and audio from within the aft cargo bay. Several displays lit up with various shots using visible light, infrared, ultraviolet, and others. What's that? Adrian said, taking a stylus and drawing an outline on the smart screen. Oh, shit, I said, as the shape of a mechanical monster became clear for just a moment before all the cameras shut off. Then my head jerked at a mechanical sound, a kind of scraping and dragging, which came through the speakers and then cut out. It's a macro. Interior alarm tripped, came the abrupt voice of Greyhound. Unauthorized access detected. Stay here. Close the bridge up tight, I told Adrian. Give me a gun, she said. I'll back you up. You're not trained with weapons, are you? I can shoot. Okay, I said. But hang back. If something goes terribly wrong, you'll need to seal the hatch and fly the ship. Contact Star Force. So you want to go in there alone and play hero? I'm a Star Force officer. Macros are my job. Adrian finally stopped arguing and nodded. All right, Cody, what's the plan? This machine must have gotten aboard somehow, maybe back at the station, and I bet it plans to finish what it started. I bet the old machines still have a base out here, like my dad always said, building up to attack humanity and its allies again. Or maybe it's a new thing the Blues have released. Maybe they're slipping small machines into Earth space as spies and assassins in revenge for bombing them. If I can get evidence, it might make Olivia's death mean something. Adrian looked like she wanted to keep arguing, but finally just nodded. Go. Leaping to my feet, I ran for the weapons locker. I'd already checked out just what weapons they carried aboard. Nothing military, but even civilian spaceships were allowed to have some serious gear. Never knew what you might meet out here. The locker metal shivered and then opened as it read my palm. I strapped on a big pistol and the largest laser rifle I saw— it was powerful enough to have its own polarizing goggles. Rethinking what I had told Adrian, I grabbed another set of weapons for her and took them to the bridge so she could defend herself. Then I went hunting for whatever the hell it was that had killed my girl. Greyhound, I yelled as I walked down a passageway. What kind of macro is the intruder? Question not understood. Reference macro unclear. The intruder, I mean the anomaly. Stupid civilian brain box, it didn't even know what a macro was. Probably it had never even watched a documentary. There ought to be a law that all brain boxes be loaded with a basic understanding of our enemy. I bet the manufacturers of non-military brain boxes believed the macros were all destroyed. But I agreed with my old man. There could easily be an infestation out there just waiting, building and multiplying, like a hidden disease getting ready to burst forth and attack us again. The anomaly is a mechanical construct. That wasn't very illuminating. Is it still in the aft cargo bay? Yes. I hustled down two doors to the main airlock antechamber and quickly jumped into a suit, leaving the faceplate open. It would snap closed in case of pressure loss, and I wanted to not have to worry about my air supply. 
a macro wouldn't care. In fact, the smartest thing for it to do would be to rupture every chamber and bulkhead it encountered. Killing unnanatized humans was easy for a machine. I wondered why it hadn't done so already. Probably it had waited for the right time, so we would just disappear with no evidence. We would be lost in space. Greyhound, the anomaly is an intruder. Give me a report whenever the intruder moves to a different space or passageway. Command accepted. The voice stopped, so I took that to mean the macro remained in the aft cargo bay. I worked my way around the back of the ship and entered the engine compartment. The three high-performance motors were wedged in tightly with only enough room to squeeze among them for maintenance, but I managed to get to where I wanted. There was an access panel I could open and shoot through from here. Greyhound, confirm. The intruder has not left the cargo bay. Confirmed. How is it armed? Please clarify question. Does it possess firearms of any sort? None detected. How about explosives? None detected. It must be a low-grade model. Maybe a worker that might only have pincers or tools as improvised melee weapons. All right, I thought I could handle that. Hell, my old man ate workers for breakfast with nothing but his bare hands. If you could believe the lurid documentaries I'd watched as a kid... When I was old enough for Dad to show me some of the raw, unedited footage of the carnage, misery, and death the macros inflicted, I came to understand the truth. How large is it? Approximately 1.5 meters in diameter, mass 300 kilos. That was much smaller than any macro I had ever heard of. Maybe it was a miniature model, or perhaps it was damaged. Greyhound, does the macro intruder appear to be in good working order? Greyhound replied, the intruder appears to be damaged, unable to fully evaluate. No such machine baseline in database. What's it doing? The intruder appears to be reconstructing itself. Shit. So a small macro somehow sneaked aboard. It had managed to evade the brain box's sensors, gotten into the cargo bay, and was now cannibalizing our ship to add to its own capabilities. I couldn't let that happen. Yet, I had to be smart. I'd already gotten one girl killed. If I lost another, I might just consider sticking this pistol under my chin and blowing my brains out, because I was obviously worthless as a Star Force officer. Greyhound, can you immobilize the intruder? Yes. Then do it, for God's sake. Command accepted. Intruder immobilized. I sighed with relief. Greyhound would have used its cargo-handling tentacles to grab the thing, just like the original nano-ships had done. This macro must be small and weak. Is there any chance it can break free? Yes. I almost panicked, but how much chance? 0.00958% over the life of this vessel. Right. Machines were literal-minded. Even smart brain boxes took a long time to learn their master's quirks, and I was new to this one. Greyhound, unless otherwise instructed, round all numerical answers to the nearest percent or digit, whichever is more precise. New parameters set. So, now, is there any chance that it can break free? No. Perfect. It had rounded down to zero. I had a macro prisoner in my ship. Make sure you notify me and Adrian of any change in the intruder's status. Oh, and keep it as immobilized as possible. Do not let it rebuild itself further or in any way access ship resources or systems. Command accepted. That relieved me of the need to open the panel in the floor of the engine room and risk beaming the thing inside the ship. I had no idea what was stored in the cargo bay, but I could imagine there might be flammables or pressurized gases, and given our current unknown state of repair, I really didn't want to start shooting up my own boat with no atmosphere outside. As I returned to the bridge, the brain box said, Star Force Space Control Regulations require all emergency situations to be reported within one hour of the ability to do so. I thought about that for a moment. Presumably a macro encounter fits something on its list of parameters. Do the regs specify what an emergency situation is? Emergency situations are defined by command personnel. Like Dad had said, with machines, there was always a workaround. 
Okay, then I specify this is not an emergency situation. Command definition accepted. Once I got to the bridge, I asked Greyhound, Are there any other anomalies or intruders nearby? Anything out of the ordinary for the programmed voyage? I heard the brain box hesitate, probably adjusting for my 1% rounding command, and then it said, No. I was glad of that. At least there weren't more macros sneaking up on us. Just to make sure, I activated the radar and pinged once all around, finding nothing. Doing so was a slight risk, as it could give away our position, but it wasn't as dangerous as another surprise anomaly. Let's land this thing, I said to Adrian. Keep heading toward Yale, she said. You said there is a fleet ship out there, right? Yes, the battlecruiser Valiant, commanded by my uncle Sir William Turnbull. I cursed the stupid brain box that hadn't figured out we had something on board for days. The monster must have gone dormant to avoid detection. I hefted my weapons. I'm going to go take a look at the macro. We have no working cameras in there, and I want to be sure it's not doing something sneaky. Okay, be careful. I nodded and then made my way to the aft cargo bay. Is there normal pressure inside? I asked the brain box. Yes. Open the door. The portal slid open and the internal lights came on. The cargo bay was stacked high with supplies, with just a narrow walkway in the middle. I could see the two black segmented cargo arms that hung from the ceiling. Hefting my laser rifle and seating my goggles in place, I walked slowly down the aisle until the cargo arms came fully into view, wrapping the macro up like two pythons. Within their embrace, I saw a flat metal, what looked like a brain box, and several appendages similar to the friendly nano-style tentacles. That seemed odd because macro arms were usually much cruder, being built for brutal toughness, not flexibility. I also spotted a camera, and then another, as well as what looked like a gas cylinder and several pieces of metal shelving, attached by the kind of constructive nanites every ship carried for repairs. It appeared the thing had been incorporating handy materials into its structure. The cameras turned on the end of their stalks to focus on me. Lowering my laser rifle, I switched it off so as not to accidentally burn anything, popped the goggles to the top of my head, and spoke to the creature looking at me. Despite its odd appearance, I recognized the machine. Memories of an exploding barn and flying splinters filled my head. Hello, Marvin, I said. Chapter 5 Marvin shifted within the confines of the cargo tentacles and said, Person not identified, not Kyle Riggs. Nope, I'm his son, Cody. We've met before. Remember my dad's chickens? Marvin paused for a moment, panning his cameras. An unfortunate incident. Facial scans correlated. Son of Kyle Riggs. Greetings, Cody Riggs. Greetings to you too, Marvin. You are Marvin, right? I am Marvin. Marvin, what the hell are you doing here? Hell is not completely inaccurate. I am trying to repair myself, but my evolutionary progenitor refuses to release me. He gestured at the confining cargo tentacles with the tip of a manipulating arm. I shook my head as I eased over to sit on a crate, weapon still handy. I wasn't letting him move until I got a good explanation. You'll be released when I'm satisfied by the answers to my questions, Marvin. Why are you on this ship? I have to be somewhere. I groaned. Brain boxes were bad enough, but I could already see a fully sentient robot was going to be a pain in the ass. If you don't tell me, you can stay there immobilized. I attached myself to this vessel in order to get to Yale. Why do you want to go to Yale? There is a fascinating experiment going on there. I wanted to help. I ran that through my mind. It seemed plausible. From what I knew, Marvin always seemed to want to help if it involved anything cutting edge and technical. I wondered what Marvin's legal status was now. I heard he'd been given citizenship some time back. I guess I'd have to look it up. More to the point, what do you know about the damage to this ship? 
Release me, and I'll tell you. Tell me, and then I'll release you. If the bastard wanted to bargain with me, I'd bargain hard. Three cameras looked at me, seeming to contemplate. Accepted. When this vessel, refueled ten days ago at Orbital Station 133, a maintenance worker placed a suspect device on the hull. It aroused my curiosity. However, when I tried to investigate, perhaps even intervene, the high G acceleration of your departure damaged me and left me drifting in orbit. It took me five days to throw off enough of my own mass to propel me back to the station. When this vessel returned to refuel, I hacked the external door and entered the cargo bay. I then shut down to conserve energy. His story intrigued me, but I wondered if it was just that, a story. More likely, you shut down to avoid detection, I said. So, someone put a bomb aboard this ship, and you just happened to be there to see it and try to save us? Exactly. Quite a coincidence. That is true. Why would anyone want to blow up this ship? I asked, just to see what he would say. To kill you, he replied. Just like Lord Grantham had said, Marvin also thought I was a target. I was reminded of a time when poisonous antifreeze had somehow ended up in the shots I'd imbibed at an off-campus bar, enough to kill a normal human. Several people had died, and there'd been an investigation that had failed to turn up anything. I'd survived because of my superior physical enhancements, which was another reason I'd kept them hidden and told no one. Back then, I hadn't thought it was aimed at me specifically. But now... Do you have any idea who wants me dead? Marvin said, I can provide a rank order listing of over 1,000 individuals and organizations that have excellent motivation. Really? Over a thousand? Number one, a Chinese secret society called Fu Chu still blames your father for killing millions during the macro wars. Number two, Never mind. We can worry about that later. Marvin rattled his restraints. Cody Riggs, you are failing to live up to our bargain. Hmm. I wondered whether I should let the troublemaker stay restrained, but he might be telling the whole truth, in which case he was on my side. And if I was really in great danger, he wouldn't want to be anywhere nearby unless there was a very good reason. From what I had heard, self-preservation was Marvin's top priority, and after that, technical challenges of any sort. So far, his story made sense. Also, I might have need of him later, in which case, I had to keep my word, otherwise he would be much less likely to cooperate. Greyhound, release Marvin. Command not understood. This intruder the cargo tentacles are restraining is designated Marvin. Release Marvin, but do not let him access any ship systems or endanger this vessel or personnel in any way. He is not command personnel. Command accepted. The black tentacles coiled back up into their recesses in the ceiling. Marvin followed me out of the cargo bay. Once we were in the corridor, I could see he still had scorch marks and blast damage along one side. He looked rather unbalanced, as if he'd lost pieces of himself and made hasty repairs. So that part of his story checked out. One of his cameras also appeared different from the others. Wait a minute, I said. That's a camera from the cargo bay. Yes. That's all Marvin said. I made a sound of irritation. Whatever. Greyhound, clean up the cargo bay and repair any damaged systems. And... Do not allow Marvin to further cannibalize ship parts for his own use. He can have a barrel of constructive nanites, but that's all. Command accepted. We made our way back to the bridge. Once the door opened, I said, Adrian, this is Marvin the robot. He says he saw a device being placed on the ship. He tried to stop it. I gestured toward the awkward tangle of parts that formed Marvin's body at the moment. Marvin the robot. She lowered the laser rifle she was pointing at him. Marvin, this is Adrian. Is she your girlfriend or your wife? Neither, Marvin. She's... she's a friend. His limbs squirmed around, but I had no idea what that meant. And she's command personnel. We're the only two aboard. The bomb killed her sister Olivia, so Adrian's not in the mood for your shenanigans. 
I have no shenanigans, as far as I am aware. Marvin seemed to draw himself up as if offended. But I am bored after being in that cargo bay for so long. He moved over to the nearest console and sat down, if that's what it could be called. Don't touch anything, I said as I noticed his tentacles heading for the controls. Not yet, at least. I relented a bit. Is there anything else you know about this attack? I know many things. Such as? Such as the maximum temperature achieved by the explosive, its mean specific density, its... Marvin, I'm not interested in the technical specs of the bomb, unless they have relevance to who planted it and why. Then I cannot help you. I stared out the windshield at the pinpoint stars. Tell me more about this expedition to Yale. Marvin perked up, all of his cameras looking in different directions and his tentacles twitching, as if he wanted to manipulate something. It involves the ring there. I find it absolutely fascinating. How did you learn about this? By a careful interpretation of certain secure communication metadata. In other words, you were eavesdropping on secrets, hacking even. Marvin remained silent, making abortive motions toward the controls. I can be useful if I may collate sensor readings. Oh, go ahead, I said, waving at him. Greyhound, allow Marvin to access whatever data he wants, but not to make inputs or changes of any kind. Revised protocol accepted. Marvin immediately plugged into the control station and became engrossed in accessing all the data he could. Adrian, I said, turning my chair around and waving her to the co-pilot seat. Do you know exactly what Olivia wanted to do on Yale? Was it something to do with the Yale experiment? Adrian stared at me with those blue eyes. Not exactly. She said it was going to be an adventure. I just assumed it was an excuse for you two to be alone and shag. I cleared my throat, tugging at my neckline and trying to figure out how to reply to that, and decided on honesty. We never, um... Adrian's eyebrows went up in what looked like genuine astonishment. Never? We... We had plans. Why? Do you care? Oh, no she said with forced casualness, turning away to tap idly at the controls. Not really. That was bullshit, I could see. She cared all right, and I could tell she was trying not to show it. About an hour out, Greyhound announced an incoming transmission. The display in front of me confirmed it came from the fleet battlecruiser Valiant, now grounded on Yale's surface and commanded by Adrian's uncle, Captain Sir William Turnbull. I cleared my throat, glancing at Adrian. I noticed Marvin was studying his console with not even one camera pointed at me as if avoiding eye contact. Sir, this is Ensign Cody Riggs aboard the Greyhound, and your niece Adrian is with me. For now, I didn't mention Olivia or what had happened. I had no idea if he'd heard, and I didn't want to be the bearer of that message. Yes, Grantham told me, said a stern voice. Are you thick, man? Turn on your blasted visual. I made sure the pickup would not show Marvin, and soon I saw a man with a face to match the voice, florid with an impressive mustache. He wore a tailored dress uniform rather than the usual smart cloth, which said something about him right there. On the other hand, I hadn't thought to put on even my own ordinary working utilities. Adrian spoke up. Hello, Uncle William. Do you mind if we land and come aboard? No, you may not. This is a restricted area. Now you two have had your fun, and you can turn right back around and go home. Uncle William, we really must see you in person, she said. Or at least see Anson Riggs. He's a Star Force officer, after all. Sir, I broke in, we've come all this way and would really appreciate your help. By the way, my father said to say hello and ask how you've been. He remarked how well you fought at the dead sun. Oh, he did, did he? Turnbull brightened. My bullshit was working. I blew a little more sunshine at him until he grumbled, but eventually assented to our landing near Valiant, which was grounded on the bleak surface of Yale. Yale wasn't always like this. 
but during one of the final battles with the macros, all three moons had been devastated. On Yale, the vast oceans had been drained by the ring we were now investigating. Then the macro bombs had fallen. Harvard had been treated even more horribly, stripped of its mantle by Marvin, to build a probe out of stardust. Dad had managed to find and defeat the macros at the dead sun, but the crustaceans had never forgiven us. Beneath us, on the surface of Yale, the mysterious ring lay exposed, with Valiant settled just inside its curve. The ship looked like a toy caught in that hoop of dense star stuff. The ring itself was the color of graphite. We set Greyhound down next to the battle cruiser and instructed the brain box to extend a short smart metal passageway, sealing our two airlocks together. I quickly put on my new Earth-bought Star Force Ensign's uniform. Then Adrian and I walked aboard. A junior lieutenant led us to Valiant's Bridge. Captain Turnbull greeted us there, receiving my salute with weighty dignity. Adrian had informed me that her Uncle William was a stickler for protocol, so I put on my best academy manner. He knew about his niece Olivia's death, but I wasn't sure if he knew all the details. I wasn't looking forward to explaining them to him. Well, young Riggs, now that you're here... He got no further before Claxons wailed. Unauthorized entry detected. Investigation of breach required. Unauthorized entry... The automated voice of the Valiant's brain box repeated its message relentlessly. Chapter 6 The alarm kept blaring aboard the Valiant. Turn that sodding thing off and tell me what's going on, Turnbull shouted. Sir, said a lieutenant, the Marines report they have apprehended something trying to sneak aboard. Something? What do you mean, something? They say... Sir, they say they'll be bringing it up directly so you can see for yourself. I was pretty sure I knew what it was. I had forgotten to restrain or restrict Marvin from leaving the yacht. When the main doors eventually opened, I saw a huge Asian guy in a Marine uniform that I recognized as Sergeant Major Kwan. He'd visited us on the farm years back. He and my old man would sit around, drink beer, and swap war stories— when I was younger, I would sit on the floor and listen if they would let us, or hide at the top of the stairs if bedtime had passed, to eavesdrop on them talking about the old days. When I was older, I had had my first beers with them on the back deck, looking at the California night sky. Quan had a sidearm, but no armor. He carried Marvin into the Valiant under one arm. Marvin had the look of a madman's creation, a mechanical octopus composed of spare parts— Quan hauled the mess to the center of the bridge and dumped it with a clatter on the deck. Turnbull watched in concern. Don't worry, sir. It's just a robot, Quan said to the captain. A robot? You recognize this intruder? Yeah, I know him, Quan said. He'll talk your ear off if you let him. Marvin rearranged his body with more clanking noises and stood on several of his tentacles. Captain Turnbull looked him over with displeasure. Is someone having a laugh? He demanded. You've brought this thing out here, haven't you, Riggs? You must think you're very clever. Get this metal rubbish off my ship. I sighed. Sir, my father built this robot, more or less, and he helped out during the macro wars. His name is Marvin. Marvin that infamous slithering disaster, and you brought it here? Are you off your box, man? Fully sentient machines, with free will, are against the law today, Ensign. We'll have to disassemble it immediately. Marvin focused all his cameras except one on Turnbull. The last one he pointed at me. Disassembly isn't permissible, he said. I have specific dispensation from Emperor Emeritus Kyle Riggs. I held up a hand. Sir, Marvin is a special case. He's grandfathered. You can't disassemble him. Legally, he's a citizen. Preposterous. I shrugged. Sorry, sir, but it's true. Even so, what the bloody hell is he doing here, invading my ship? I turned to Marvin. You want to explain yourself? No. 
I stared at the odd machine. By now, I agreed with Dad he was obstinate and evasive, as well as a loose cannon. Marvin, whether or not you want to, you have to explain why you're here, or the captain is going to have to lock you in the brig until we return to Earth. I hoped to plant that idea in the captain's head and have him take Marvin off my hands. Why? Marvin asked. Because you're not authorized to be here, I said, exasperated. More and more, I had sympathy for what my dad had gone through back in the day. Incorrect. My authorization is fully valid. Look, robot, I began. I don't see a need for disparaging language, Marvin said in an almost indignant tone. Robot? That's not disparaging language. It's just what you are. If I said, look, confused male biotic, how would you feel? He asked. Like I wanted to kick your ass. Marvin, if you have some kind of authorization, you have to show us now, and even if you do, sneaking aboard a ship of war without announcing yourself is against regulations. Explain yourself or you're going to the brig. Marvin reached over and activated the hollow tank, causing it to light up and display a dozen pages of text. The device was like the old planning tables, but it could project 3D images above it, using swirls of nanites held in magnetic fields, all enclosed in nanoglass. This is my last mission order from Starforce, which authorizes me to survey all the known star systems in order to, and I quote, locate, examine, catalog, and report remaining alien installations. The ring here is a remaining alien installation. I leaned over to read the highlighted section. He's got us there, I said. Hey, this order is almost twenty years old, Marvin replied. Space is large. I've been busy. I turned to the captain. Marvin stowed away. He also observed someone tampering with Greyhound. I realized I wasn't telling the story very well and suddenly found myself defending him. Turning back to the robot, I went on. So why didn't you just fly out here on your own, Marvin? My father said you used to have your own space drive systems. Emperor Riggs ordered that I be limited to this basic body, and I have not been able to legally procure a ship of my own. I wondered if that meant he was able to illegally procure a ship of his own. My dad always said that Marvin's interpretation of laws, regulations, and instructions was amazingly flexible. He could figure out loopholes like a politician's tax lawyer. But I put those thoughts aside for now. What did you expect us to do here, Marvin? I asked. Help investigate the new ring, of course. I can be of great assistance to the scientific team. Yes, I've heard of the way you help, I said. I detect a hint of sarcasm, Cody Riggs. If you ask Kyle Riggs... He will confirm that, on several occasions, I helped save the entire human race from extinction. Are you completely thick? Sir William demanded. His red face had finally faded back into its natural piglet pink, and his breathing had returned to normal. I'm in charge here, and I say you're going into the brig, Marvin replied. That would be unwise. Your silence, the captain roared. Sergeant Major Kwan, seal this miscreant into a cell, and make sure he doesn't escape. Excellent idea, sir. Kwan grabbed Marvin and began to drag him away. Your research team needs me, Captain, Marvin said, not resisting, but using his stalked cameras to look back at us. I have extensive experience with ring technology. If you do not... At that point, his words were cut off by a closing hatch. Well... At least we know he's as irritating in person as people always claimed, Turnbull remarked, straightening his uniform jacket. Riggs, you certainly bring trouble in your wake. I felt like telling the captain to go to hell, but he was the ranking commander on the spot, and I still needed to try to find out who was behind Olivia's assassination. Sir, may Adrian and I speak to you privately? Once Adrian seconded the request... Turnbull led us reluctantly to his office. Well, he demanded. Adrian let me talk. I gave a report on the last week as matter-of-factly as I could, leaving out the fact that we hadn't asked permission to take the yacht. The man ripped me up one side and down the other anyway. That was okay, I'd expected a butt-chewing. 
In fact, I was used to them being on the receiving end of many, but this time I really deserved it. After all, he was right about my shortcomings leading to Olivia's death. Once he wound down, and I'd apologized at least a dozen times, he ordered me away so he could talk to Adrian. Family stuff, obviously, or maybe he wanted to double-check my story. In his place, I'd be looking to hang me somehow. Well, Ensign's bars weren't called shields of ignorance for nothing. Out in the corridor, I spotted Quan. He had changed into his armor and was now clomping around as he moved about. I went to renew our acquaintance. He said he'd secured Marvin, so I suggested that the huge Marine show me around. Though he was pushing fifty years old, he still looked great, fit, and hale as ever. The nanites kept people healthy and were expected to retard aging though nobody had ever lived with them long enough to be sure how long their lifespan would be extended. Glad to see you out here, Sergeant Major, I said as we walked through the passageways of the battle cruiser. I had to let Quan go ahead of me as he was so big in his armor he filled the passage. Glad to see you here, sir, Quan said. Your voice sounds familiar, like your father's twin or something. How long has it been since I saw you at the farm? Five years, I think, before I left for the academy. I filled him in on what had happened with Olivia and my present trip with Adrian. I wasn't sure if I felt like I owed him an explanation, or maybe I just wanted to secure a friend and ally aboard ship. Quan shook his head. That's a messed up situation. Sorry about your girl. Yeah, thanks. I pushed the pain aside with mental effort. What's with this ring? We're just sheepdogging a bunch of tech geeks and their gear, Quan grumbled. He was clearly not happy with his current lot in life, and I could see why. After fighting macros and aliens for years, being the senior enlisted guy for a ship's marines in peacetime must be boring. I bet he'd wangled this assignment in hopes of something interesting happening. Mind if I see the ring for myself? Sure. Something else to do. He led me down a few decks into the belly of the battle cruiser, down toward the moon's crust. It looked like the science team must be accessing the surface from beneath the sheltering ship. My guess turned out to be correct. We exited a hatch at the very bottom and descended a ramp to the surface of the moon. Yale's atmosphere had been poisoned by the macros, so we'd set up a dome of smart metal to provide a breathable atmosphere. Off to one side, we saw a wall of the stardust metal that made up the ring material. I'd always expected the rings to be shiny and pretty, but this one was just dull and lifeless, the color of raw iron charcoal gray with a slight gold tinge. In fact, the whole chamber smelled like metal. A group of civilians had portable consoles and brain boxes set up next to the ring. There were all sorts of leads and instruments attached to the ring or pointed at it. More cables snaked back into the ship. Then I stopped dead in my tracks and gaped as I saw a weird lobster-shaped critter crawling around among the techs. I was startled but quickly realized the thing wore a pressure suit and seemed perfectly at home in the mess of strewn equipment. It had to be a crustacean. It was big, the size of a steer, standing about waist-high to a man. I sidled closer. I'd only ever seen an actual crusty once at the academy, when some dignitaries had come for a tour. Rumor had it they might send officer candidates to attend and actually join Star Force, rather than just fly along as Earth's allies. That would be pretty difficult from a logistical standpoint, I figured the worms had a better chance of it because at least they could survive in our atmosphere. Crusties needed water to cover certain key parts of their bodies, a function their suits could provide. You, human, what are you staring at? I realized I had been wool-gathering, letting my eyes follow the strange crab-like form, and it had noticed. Or he, I guess— I had no idea how to tell the difference between a male or female lobster by appearance alone. As his voice came over my suit radio, it sounded exactly like that of an irritated, middle-aged male, probably using a finely tuned translation program. I'm staring at you. I've never met a crustacean before. I wasn't going to let some lobster push me around. 
I knew Krusty's always thought they were smarter than everybody else. Well, now you have. Singularity saved me from becoming a tool for the education of immature humans. Why I bother conversing with anyone below the level of professor is a mystery to me. The Krusty shifted back and forth on his several legs, as if he couldn't keep still. He waved his big front claws for emphasis. His attitude was starting to piss me off. It's one thing to read about it in a book or even watch it on a vid, but to experience this level of rudeness personally made me want to poke the bastard in one of his stalked eyes. I wonder why you bother, too. It's fine by me if you space yourself. I turned away. You have not been dismissed, the lobster complained. I am Professor Hoon. It is I who persuaded your benighted government to return to my homeworld, which you ruined, to unlock the secrets of this ring. Only I can ensure success. You cannot ignore me. I felt the thing slap me hard on the thigh with its suited claw, as if to get my attention. Maybe it was everything that had happened in the last several days getting to me, but I lost my temper. I turned and booted the crusty across the room. I'm sure he never expected a human to be able to do that, but between my enhancements and the low gravity, it was not that difficult. He sailed through the air, flipping end over end until he collided with the far wall and slid down. I had pulled my kick so it was more a lift and a shove than a killing blow, but I'd still put some strength into it. Uh, sir, let's get out of here, Quan said as all the scientists and Star Force personnel turned to stare at me. Don't worry about the lobster. They have tough shells. I let Quan drag me up the ramp to the ship. I still felt like I wanted to punch something. The crustacean got me wondering about all the different biotic aliens. Before humans met any extraterrestrials, many scientists had theorized that evolution would be convergent, and the most efficient form to nurture tool-using sentience would be bipedal, something like humans, even if the biology was a lot different. As on many other occasions, the scientists had been completely wrong. For example, the centaurs ran on all fours. Though they had useful hands up front, they never had made the transition to a bipedal form. The crustaceans had hands of a sort, along with a bunch of legs for locomotion and big claws up front, I guess for fighting or mating or both. You'd think the claws would have atrophied away as evolutionary dead ends once intelligence and use of tools became the paramount determinant of whose genes got passed on. They didn't have a reputation for being fighters, either. Then there were the worms with their tentacles, and the microbes who didn't even have multicellular bodies as we understood them, and the blues, which were just really bizarre, dense aerogel with almost no form at all. So much for the theory of convergent evolution. My own personal theory was that the ancients— that was the word humanity had given to the unknown builders of the ring network, had seeded different worlds with biotic packages that favored or even programmed the uprising of species along specific lines. I mean, if I were a powerful alien race running around tinkering with the galaxy, I'd probably have fun experimenting with different forms of life on various planets, kind of like a running computer simulation. Maybe we were a game to them or like pets. Maybe our life forms were the result of some ancient kid's science fair project. What would they do to Marvin? I asked Quan. Maybe a little guilt for booting the professor was making me feel kinder toward the robot, who at least didn't try to be an asshole. If I know Captain Turnbull, he'll keep Marvin locked up until we return to base in a month or two. I persuaded Quan to take me to the brig. Why the hell did I want Marvin free to cause trouble? I wasn't sure. I just felt that if I talked to the robot long enough, I might start to figure out the whole planted bomb thing. There had to be something he hadn't told us, even if he didn't know it yet. When we reached the lower decks, I saw the brig cell had been sealed with smart metal. Every crack and crevice gleamed with a fresh layer of constructive nanites. When we went in, I noticed Marvin jump away from the back corner, and if I didn't know better, 
I would have thought he seemed guilty about something. How such a weird, non-android robot could express emotions with his body language, I don't know, but that was my impression. Quan stayed in the cell with us, but sealed up his helmet to give us some privacy. He didn't trust the robot any more than the captain did, I could tell. In truth, I didn't either. I recalled my dad telling me that Marvin had his own purpose in mind for everything he did, but he always put it in terms that would help Star Force. Often, his ideas turned out to be surprisingly useful. But other times, like when he deactivated the Venus minefield and invited the macros in, he could be a disaster waiting to happen. Hello, Marvin. Hello, Cody Riggs. Did you enjoy examining the ring? How did you... Never mind. Somehow he knew what we had done. Maybe he heard us talking in the passageway or just deduced it from the fact that I was still wearing a pressure suit. I bet you'd like to examine the ring as well. That perked him up. All his cameras suddenly focused on me. I would enjoy that very much and would undoubtedly be able to contribute to the knowledge of the science team. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, Marvin had learned even better how to blow sunshine up people's butts in the years since he hung out with Dad and Mom. You'll have to convince me that it's a good idea first. Unfortunately, I have been explicitly prohibited from directly experimenting on the rings, but I would very much like to examine this one. I waited for him to go on, but he just stopped talking. Eventually, I asked, Why was that? Marvin's cameras began to wander in random directions. Due to unforeseen circumstances, the last time I accessed an active ring, I reduced ship traffic by half between systems for almost a month. May I see the ring now? No, you may not. I never heard about you experimenting on a ring. So you did something that made it so that only half as many ships could go through the ring? Marvin's cameras all had focused on the wall, except for one aimed at Quan. I realized Marvin was watching me in the steel mirror above the room's sink, as if he did not want to look directly at me. Not precisely. In fact, only half of each ship made it through to the other side. The other half kept traveling in normal space. Damn! No wonder Star Force took away your mobility. I did apologize. I'm sure that was a great consolation to the families of the dead. Biotics can always make more children. May I see the ring now? If that wasn't so twisted, it would have been funny. Cold, selfish bastard. I'd have to keep in mind he actually had no conscience, no matter how sensible he seemed at times. Speaking of children, I heard you turn down the chance to reproduce when my father brought the subject up. Yes, I may have made an error. With more Marvins around, biotics might be more inclined to treat me as a protected class rather than just a rogue robot. I have been studying the history of collective struggle, beginning with the unions and ending with the perversion of communist ideology in the 20th century. I cut him off. Yeah, right. Bottom line, your little projects are damn dangerous. You had a lot of leeway when we were desperately fighting off the macros. But now that life has gotten back to normal... You have to play by the rules. Marvin's cameras turned back toward me. I always play by the rules. It is not my fault that biotics often fail to understand their own rules, or alternatively, they want me to follow the rules they thought they made, rather than the ones they actually made. You're a smart guy, Marvin. You should be able to figure out the difference between the spirit and the letter of the law. You have no idea how much processing power it consumes, just to try to figure out the contradictory expectations of biotic species. This is why I prefer investigating specific phenomena, such as the technology of the ancients. Speaking of technology, may I? Right. Back around to that again. I know you want to look at the ring. How do we know you won't screw the pooch on this one, too? That was an expression Mom hated, but Dad used every now and again, and it seemed appropriate today. I fail to understand what having intercourse with a canine has to do with scientific inquiry. Check your database on idiomatic sayings, Marvin. Checking knowledge stores. Expression noted and understood. I will try not to screw the pooch. Now may I see the ring? I guess in some ways Marvin was just like biotics. Even though he had a vast memory, he couldn't hold it all in his consciousness at once. 
Sometimes I thought he couldn't even access it as fast as biotic people could, especially if it was something that came out of left field like an oddball idiom. On the other hand, he might just be faking the whole thing to make us think he was more obtuse than he really was. He was certainly single-minded, though. So if I get you access to the dead ring, do you promise not to cause unnecessary trouble in any way, shape, or form? I promise, Cody Riggs. Marvin's tentacles began to quiver with apparent excitement. Thank you in advance for your permission. Okay, then. I'll see what I can do. When we left, Quan sealed the cell up again. I wasn't sure we could really keep Marvin incarcerated if he wanted to get out, but I knew he understood self-preservation and consequences, even punishments, such as having some of his cameras, limbs, or other tools taken away. More than once, Dad had threatened to reduce him to nothing but a brain box in order to get compliance. By the time we got to the bridge, the boards were lighting up with warnings. Energy drain detected, came the voice of Valiant's brain box. Power load exceeding design parameters, compensating. All the ship's power is being drained into the science team's equipment, the ops officer on duty blurted. The generators have almost doubled their output, and the brain box has thickened the cables to handle the load. But it's continuing to spike, and we can't stop it, sir. Shut everything down, Captain Turnbull ordered. We tried, sir. Nothing works. Valiant, reduce power to normal levels and cease sending it to the science team. Unable to comply, the brain box said. Command level insufficient. Updated protocols locked. Crap! I said and pointed at the power readouts. Now they showed more than three times normal and climbing. I pointed at the wall near the floor, where I noticed a bulging and writhing in a horizontal line. Look, the cables are still thickening, trying to carry more power. I, I, the captain sputtered. Send the marines to the central generators. Tell them to cut the power leads with lasers. We'll go on batteries until we get this sorted. Sergeant Major Kwan, go to the ring and shut down whatever those fools are doing. By force, if you have to. Kwan bolted off the bridge and I followed him, suddenly glad we had both kept our suits on. Down the ramp onto the surface of the dead world, we waved as we ran, both yelling over our short-range comm links for the scientists to stop what they were doing. The geeks and the lobster were clustered around their instruments, gesticulating and pounding on their controls. It looked like they were having as much success controlling their systems as Captain Turnbull had with his. The power cables from the ship to their gear writhed and pulsed like snakes that had swallowed a herd of mice. Quan, cut the cables, I yelled, too late. In a moment, the world turned upside down, and that was the last I remembered, until I woke up, floating in space. Chapter 7 Using his battlesuit repellers, Quan aimed us at Valiant. The ship hung in front of us. Shaped like a tailless manta ray, its starboard wing had been sheared off, and I could see smart metal working hard to drag itself across the ragged, ripped-open edge of what was left. What happened? I asked. Maybe we went through the ring. Quan wasn't the sharpest knife in the drawer, but he had a hell of a lot of experience with these things. His idea sounded reasonable to me. How could that happen? Those idiot geeks started something they couldn't stop. They think they're so smart, but no common sense. That jogged my memory. I recalled running toward the scientists, yelling and waving my arms, and the power cables— before I could think more, Quan propelled us into Valiant's open and empty launch bay. The pinnace was probably out picking people up. He set me down onto the welcoming grav plates. Unfortunately, that gave my inner ear a flip-flop and made me aware of severe pain. I almost vomited. Quan, I think my leg is broken and I may have a concussion. Take me to a med bay. The nanites and microbes in me were just stupid enough that they might set my bones into a broken configuration. The med bay would optimize my healing. When Quan had placed me inside one, I queried the ship and learned that Adrian was unharmed. That took a great load off my mind. Half an hour later, I limped up to the bridge and sat down in my damaged uniform. Some of the nanites were no longer operating, and the smart cloth was trying in vain to re-knit itself. 
The flaps crawled over my skin in an irritating fashion. Turnbull glared at me, and I became aware of my poor appearance. But he was too busy to take me to task. I limped over to the opposite side of the hollow tank and examined our situation. Apparently now we floated in a distant orbit above an airless, rocky world that was once larger than Mars but smaller than Earth. The ring we had fallen through drifted nearby. The power surge, I muttered. Somehow the science team activated the ring using the ship's power. We must have gone through it. Quan had been right. We'd been completely unprepared for this. The lower door and ramp had been open, and the ship's routine had been set for a grounded position rather than ready for space flight. What's more, with the generators out of control and pumping power to the ring, the brain box had acted sluggishly, even rebelliously. I suddenly remembered it refusing to follow the captain's override. Engine status? I heard the captain ask. Engines operative, but repellers are missing on the starboard side. The factory? No damage that I can see. Now, that was interesting. This ship had a factory, which meant that theoretically it could be self-repaired if we had enough time and the right materials. Lost personnel status, Turnbull asked. The ops officer shook his head. We've recovered everyone we could see, alive or dead. Twenty-one missing. The ones that were in the lost wing. They probably never made it through. What about that crustacean? Recovered alive, sir. Power systems? Engineering reports all main generators functioning. That brought something else to mind. I limped over to a vacant console and quickly called up the status on Greyhound. To my surprise, I found her still firmly attached to Valiant. That made me feel a lot better. Wherever we were, two ships were better than one, and besides, all Adrian's and my stuff was aboard the Greyhound. Nobody likes to lose all their stuff. For the next hour, we continued to recover the equipment floating alongside the battle cruiser and managed damage control. Smart Metal performed simple tasks, but it took people to tell it what to do for anything more complicated. It needed people to direct repairing the lower airlock and ramp assembly that had apparently been ripped off in the ring transference. It also needed people for getting more constructive nanite skin on the part of the ship open to space. I threw on a fresh uniform and helped deal with the ugliness, despite feeling beaten up myself. Hardly anyone had been in suits except the scientists, and even they lost most of their team. Even nanotized people could be torn in half or die of vacuum exposure. I carried bodies to a makeshift morgue we set up in a cargo bay. One young crewman's dead, staring eyes gave me a particular pang, reminding me of myself. Going through a ring wasn't supposed to be that rough. However, when a gateway is unexpectedly activated on a planet, really bad things tend to happen. With vacuum on one side, and normal matter with gravity, tides, and volcanic pressure on the other, our ships and a bunch of crustal matter had been sucked through like debris into a shop vac. As it turned out, we got three out of the dozen or so scientists back alive, plus Professor Hoon and several of the crew. Since none of the civilians had been nanotized, most of them had died from some form of blunt force trauma. Eventually, I returned to the bridge where I found Adrian helping to coordinate the repairs and doing a decent job of it. This didn't surprise me, as she was a graduate student in a technical field. While the ship was being repaired, Captain Turnbull questioned the ship's brain box about his inability to override the power controls. It provided no useful information about why or who had set the program that way. I had my suspicions, though. Something occurred to me that I should have thought of before. I tapped Adrian on the elbow and motioned with my head, let's go. As we weren't technically part of the crew, and things were more or less under control, I felt this was a good time to slip out. What are we doing? She asked as we walked down the corridor toward the brig. Going to talk to Marvin, I replied. Why? He's locked up. Don't count on it. He's partly made of nanometal, remember? So? She asked. Quan sealed the brig cell with smart metal. Oh. Realization showed on her face. So all he had to do was use his own nano metal to tap into the smart metal seal and instruct it to open up. No, it's worse than that, I think. 
If he can exert control over the metal, he must be able to communicate throughout the ship and connect to anything using the nanite network right from the cell. After all, they locked him in there and told him he couldn't leave. They didn't tell him he couldn't tap into the ship's systems. And I told him I was going to try to get him access to the experiment. Maybe he took that as permission. It's like having an evil genie that always twists your words. I nodded. Yeah. But you said you told him not to make trouble. I guess he has a different definition of that than I do. We slowed our headlong rush in front of the brig cell door, checking for any marines that should have been minding the store. It looked like they were all still out helping with damage control. Just then, Quan came around the corner, huge in full battle armor, with a grim expression on his face. I'm gonna destroy that son of a bitch, he said with fire in his eyes. I'm gonna rip him limb from limb. I just lost eight good marines. It looked like Quan had jumped to much the same conclusion as I had. After all, he'd known Marvin much longer. Just don't kill him, Quan. We need him. Why? I... I stopped because I wasn't sure how to answer Quan, so I bullshitted a bit. Dad always said a little bullshit was sometimes necessary when the stakes were high. Lesser of two evils and all that. Whatever just happened, I'm pretty sure Marvin caused it somehow, and that means he's probably the only one who really knows what's going on. And that makes him the one we need to fix everything. I realized that was half true, even as I said it. Whatever you say, sir, Quan replied, clearly not happy. Just let me go in first. He might be dangerous. Oh, he's dangerous, all right, but not to any individual in his presence, I don't think. Then I remembered how Dad had told me about how his old girlfriend Sandra had been healed from a coma when Marvin had accidentally allowed another woman to fall into the microbe tank with her. The microbes had apparently eaten the other one to fix Sandra. I hoped that was an exception. He's a loose cannon, and I'm gonna lock him down, Quan said. Just open it up and watch our backs. I waved at the cell door. Quan passed an electronic key over the nano-controlled lock. It had already occurred to me that if Marvin could hack the ship, he could hack his cell, too. So I was a little surprised to see him inside when it opened. It looked like he was just sitting quietly in the middle of the floor, his tentacles folded, all innocence in appearance. Marvin? What the hell did you do? Did you somehow activate the ring? No. I gritted my teeth. Whenever he gave one-word answers, there was usually more to the story. Bullshit, Marvin. You did this. You tapped into the ship's network and turned that thing on, and now look what happened. We've got twenty or thirty people dead because of you. I should let Sergeant Major Quan disassemble you down to a naked brain box. How would you like to have no limbs and no sensory inputs? Threats are not necessary, Cody Riggs. My orders were to not leave this cell. No one told me I should not access the ship's network and observe the scientists while they worked on the ring. I made an exasperated sound in my throat. Observe, huh? You agreed not to make trouble. You must have done a lot more than observe. Not to make any unnecessary trouble was the agreement. Would you like me to play it back for you? No, I... I gave up on pinning him down for his past sins and decided to concentrate on the present and future assuming we had one. Marvin, did you lock out the command codes for Captain Turnbull? I gestured at Quan, who looked like he wanted to tear a piece off of Marvin. Marvin fixed his cameras on the Marine and apparently decided to start cooperating. Only long enough to ensure the scientists' experiment would be properly energized. You're claiming they started up the ring? They did connect the leads and apply power and send it a series of test commands. I merely determined that their commands would accomplish nothing. They didn't employ a checksum, and nothing would execute without one. I considered adding a small subroutine that would add a checksum and vary their command codes until a response from the ring was observed. In other words, you caused this accident, I said, thinking of my dad's farm and all those dead chickens. Marvin really was a slithering disaster. A big piece of the ship has been ripped away. A bunch of people died because of what you did. My statements were not intended to be a confession, Marvin replied. I stated that I planned to add a subroutine, but I didn't. I suspect that someone else did. 
I frowned, wondering if he was lying or evading, or some combination of both. Who could have done such a thing? I demanded. I would suspect a crew member from Valiant. I snorted. That's a big help. You've eliminated Adrian and me, but left us with a lift of seventy or so suspects. I've also eliminated myself from the list, as I'm technically part of Greyhound's crew as well. Adrian had been frowning with increasing intensity. I don't believe you, robot, she said. I suspected as much, Marvin said, swinging an extra camera her way. I've been monitoring your facial contortions and body rhythms. Adrian turned to me. We should torture him or something until he confesses. Marvin's cameras perked up a fraction. Torture? What form might this attempted coercion take? I wasn't sure if he was curious or worried, maybe both. I threw up my hands and shook my head. All right, I said. Let's assume you're innocent or nearly innocent. I suspect the real story is that you created these subroutines but didn't employ them. Someone else found them and installed them. Marvin just stared at me. You're not denying my accusation? I asked. I do not see it as an accusation. It is more of a clarification of past events, an insignificant detail I overlooked in my report. Yeah, insignificant. You built the gun, but someone else fired it. Well, anyway, let's move on. Why would someone employ your routines blindly without checking with you? Did you discuss them with anyone else? We've only just arrived. I barely had time to create them and store them in Valiant's database. Someone else must have accessed and installed them. Adrian made a clucking sound with her tongue. I still don't buy it. This robot is evil. A non sequitur, Marvin said. I have no alignment with supernatural forces. She rolled her eyes, and I lifted my hands to gain their attention. I think we should figure this out. If there is a saboteur aboard, we need to know who it is. These events might even be related to the sabotage that killed Olivia. Adrian's eyes widened. This robot did both, she said. It's obvious. Marvin was there when we first refueled. He stowed away when we returned. And then he helped activate the ring. Why do you want to kill Cody so badly, Marvin? I frowned. She had some good points, but I found it hard to believe Marvin could be the assassin. I shook my head. I don't think he did it, I said. I would probably be dead by now if he was behind this. Thank you, Cody Riggs, Marvin said. He'd been watching the two of us closely. For what? I asked him. For complimenting my effectiveness. I laughed. Yeah, I guess I did. You're a better assassin than this, and you wouldn't have missed twice. No, I would not have. Moreover, there were ample opportunities during the long flight out to the Thor system for me to sabotage the ship. I could have evacuated the internal pressure, for example, as I don't need to breathe, or I could have... I could see Adrian was becoming upset with his list of possible ways he could have killed us, so I stopped him. That's enough, I said. Let's focus on figuring out who is guilty. We're wasting time. I must agree, Marvin said. And we don't have much time to waste. Why not? Adrian asked suspiciously. Because this system is inhabited. Inhabited? How do you know? I asked. During our conversation, I've been monitoring our sensors and collating the input. The local stellar configuration indicates we're over 300 light years from Earth at a star designated HD 95086. The star is also known as Tulax. We're now picking up radio transmissions that are either in code or a language different from any I've encountered. Anything else you'd like to share with us? I asked. Yes. There is a squadron of warships headed this way. Chapter 8 I'd trained all my life to be a Star Force officer. Like my dad, I never had much of a problem making snap decisions. Thinking them through? That was another matter. Quan, grab Marvin. We're going aboard Greyhound. Quan did grab Marvin, but then stopped, obviously torn between his natural desire to obey the guy who reminded him of his old boss and friend and his loyalty to his commander, Captain Turnbull. He's supposed to stay in the brig. 
Look, Quan, the captain has enough trouble right now without worrying about a robot who fiddles with everything like a disobedient child. I was rubbing it in a little. Marvin deserved it in my book. I'll take responsibility as the officer on the scene. Once he's back aboard Greyhound, Marvin will be out of fleet's way, and Turnbull can concentrate on dealing with the approaching alien ships. Besides, once we're there, we can cast off and pop back through the ring to report what happened and call for reinforcements. Right. Okay. Quan decided to go with my ideas and began dragging Marvin along as Adrian and I hurried for the airlock. Am I under arrest? Marvin asked politely. Yes, Quan said. Permanent arrest. Marvin rasped his tentacles unhappily but didn't resist. Fortunately, the smart metal tube between the two ships was still connected, though we did have to cycle through the airlocks in the normal fashion. Apparently, the brain boxes of both ships were taking no chances. Once Quan packed Marvin into our side's airlock chamber, he returned to his duties aboard his own ship, looking relieved. I had to say I was sorry to see him go. He was sure a good man to have at your back. Inside, Marvin straightened up and decided to walk on his own. I reached over and slapped one of his cameras hard enough to rattle it. Marvin, listen to me. I just saved you from a lot of whatever passes for pain in that mechanical mind of yours. You should be grateful to me. Now, I need you to stay out of everyone's way unless someone asks you for help. If they do, then help. Understood. Program set. Ah. Uh, I stared at him a moment longer and then said to Adrian, Let's go. Once on the cramped bridge, we cast off from Valiant. I wasn't comfortable with Greyhound stuck onto the damaged battle cruiser like a nursing whale calf. We're going back through the ring. Valiant doesn't need us in the way, and Starforce has to know what happened. Good idea, she said. I'll plot a course. Thank you, Adrian. Greyhound, hail Valiant. Adrian, when you finish with the computer, please contact your uncle. He's really not happy with me right now. Okay. On the speaker the brain box said after a few minutes. Uncle William, this is Adrian. We're going to pop through the ring and broadcast what's happened, and then we'll come right back, all right? We won't leave you in the lurch. I thought it was ironic that she was assuring a fleet battle cruiser that we, in an unarmed yacht, wouldn't abandon them to their fate. Sir William's voice came back. Good idea, girl. There's a squadron of alien warships bearing down on us, arriving in about five hours. They don't look like macros, but who knows? We still have some repairs to make, and then we'll join you. Let us know what you discover about the ring. Yes, Uncle, we will. Greyhound out. The ring is coming up, I pointed. As we approached, we could see it with the naked eye, floating like a vast circle in space. How come more stuff isn't coming through? I wondered aloud. Maybe it's stabilized. We'll have to be very careful going in. We might end up running smack into Yale itself, so we'll have to ease through dead slow. We pulled up to the ring and decelerated using repellers. The star stuff of the ring itself was so dense that it exerted its own small gravitic force, about two percent of a G. I did sweat a little when I slipped the ship through. Unfortunately, we merely sailed through to the other side. No transport. The ring must be slowly flipping, I said aloud. So all we have to do is reverse course and ease through from this side. That didn't do anything either. We were left floating in the middle of a huge ring in the same system where we'd arrived a couple of hours ago. Bollocks, Adrian said, sounding a lot like Olivia. Why isn't the ring working? It means we're stuck here 300 light years from home. I snapped my fingers. Marvin! The bridge portal opened and Marvin ambled through. Were you just waiting outside the door? I asked. Of course. I knew you would need me soon, but my presence seems to cause you agitation, Cody Riggs. So like any polite and considerate being, I tried to take your feelings into account and remained out of sight. I wouldn't want to screw the pooch. I wondered whether I hadn't overdone it by teaching him that particular piece of idiomatic phraseology, but it was too late now. Marvin, why isn't the ring working? Because it has no power. I thought you started it up. It appears that applying ship power from the battle cruiser activated it for a short period of time. 
but the usual ring-inverted quantum flux self-sustainment calibrated energy matrix has failed to take hold in this case. That sounds like a bunch of gobbledygook, I said. I don't care, though. Can we power it again to go through? Not with Greyhound, no. It doesn't have enough energy. We'll need Valiant's reactors as well. And we'll have to overload if it's like last time, Adrian observed. I'll hail Uncle William again. She informed Turnbull of the situation, and we heard from him that the alien squadron was composed of six identical cruiser-sized ships. They had come from Tolax IV, a hot, wet, Earth-like world, forth out from its sun, with a large, airless moon rather like Earth's. Well, at least the ships weren't macros. Hopefully they were biotics of some kind that we could relate to. Maybe Marvin can figure out their language, I said. I turned to the robot who was stealthily extending a rivulet of nanometal toward a nearby console. Stop that. Marvin, do not try to access ship's systems without permission. Marvin froze the forming metal tentacle, but did not retract it. You already gave me permission. That was before you decided to sneak aboard Valiant and play with the ring. I mused on the squadron headed our way for a moment. It would be quite a challenge for us to learn and translate the language of the aliens native to this system. That is true, Marvin said. I bet it would be an even bigger challenge for you, I went on. I had to keep Marvin occupied doing something useful, or he'd get into even more trouble. Marvin stared at me with all his cameras. I deduce you are trying to manipulate me, but there is no need. Anything is better than constantly being told to do nothing. Fine. Greyhound set Marvin's station to receive and process only, and disconnect all other external functions. Parameters accepted. Implemented. All right, Marvin. Let me know when you've figured out enough to understand what they're saying and talk back to them. Marvin wedged himself in behind the console and connected in. The chair he didn't need was forced to resorb back into the floor. I hoped he would follow instructions and just do what he was supposed to. Probably a vain hope. Valiant is moving toward the ring, I said as I scanned the displays. Looks like they will join us shortly. Maybe they can turn this thing back on and we can return to Thor. Now that I was stuck so far from known space, I remembered something Dad had quoted to the effect that adventures are just tales of someone else being miserable far, far away. I was starting to see his point. A few minutes later, the damaged battle cruiser arrived, moving slowly and carefully. It edged ponderously in, closer and closer, until it had all but docked against the ring itself. I guessed the remnants of the science team were going to try to replicate the accident that had activated the ring. They probably still didn't know Marvin had done it. We watched personnel in suits exiting one of the sides and connecting cables, and then Turnbull announced they would try again. Marvin mumbled something as they worked. What? I asked. Nothing. I am busy only receiving input, not transmitting. I realize that, Marvin. Then why did you ask? I stood up, looming over him. What is it you know, Marvin? Your question is overly broad and vague, Please clarify. Is there something about the test we need to know? Yes. Well? I gave one of his tentacles an emphatic kick. I guess it was my day to boot things. What is it that we need to know about the test? Marvin shook the tentacle I'd kicked. It won't work. Why not? Because it's a one-way ring. A one-way ring? What the hell is a one-way ring? It means the ring is set to only work in one direction, even if it is activated with power. Before the macros shut it down, it was draining the ocean from Yale and the macros with it. I learned about that. Can you change it? I asked. It is possible, but last time it took many hours of transmitting random code attempts to find a command the ring accepted. But you changed it before. Don't you remember the right command code? The ring seems to reset its encryption after each successful command, according to an unknown algorithm. Your father never gave me enough time or access to even minimally understand how to control its programming. I coughed a single harsh laugh. I can see why. Somehow every problem you solve creates a bigger one. What about the ring communication system?
Can we transmit back through it? I would be happy to make the attempt. I doubt we'll have time with those aliens coming if Turnbull would even allow you to try. I asked Adrian to call up the Valiant and explain all this to her uncle. After a few tries, the word came back from the scientists that they couldn't get the ring activated, neither in communications mode nor for transport. The thing just stayed dead. And when Adrian tentatively raised the subject, her uncle categorically refused to let Marvin get near it. Are there any more details on the alien ships? I risked asking the captain. Turnbull answered, They're all about cruiser size, with one main energy gun, six secondaries, and six missile launchers. They seem to like the number six, I observed. Yes, he said scathingly. I deduced that. I gritted my teeth and held my tongue, knowing this was all part of being the low man on the totem pole and out of favor. At least he was talking to me. I guess he considered me the de facto captain of the yacht for now. So their weapons technology level seems roughly comparable to ours, but they don't seem to have very fast ships. Maybe we can outrun them. Certainly Greyhound can. Thinking about running away, eh, Riggs? Not at all, sir, I said as evenly as I could. But do you think we can win this fight? It was his turn to keep silent in the face of my logic. A battle cruiser was a faster, more heavily armed cruiser. But it lacked the armor of the next modern class up, a battleship. Undamaged, it should be able to beat any two or even three cruisers. But not six. We'll give diplomacy the good old college try, while the scientists keep trying to activate the ring. Turnbull seemed to be cast in the old imagined British Empire mold of stiff upper lip and relentless optimism, despite the odds. Yes, sir, I said, relieved to change the subject. I have a program working on trying to get at least a rudimentary translation going before they arrive. I wasn't going to tell him that program was Marvin. Sir, I went on, have you found anything else significant in this system, such as evidence of another ring? If there was another ring, maybe we could outrun the aliens and get away through it if we had to. If it was functional, that is. On the other hand, I would expect that any other operational portal would be guarded or in use, perhaps even mined. Turnbull went on. Yes, there is another ring on the other side of the system, in orbit around a gas giant Tullux V. There appears to be a large installation near it, perhaps a fortress but it is too far away to be sure. Then let's hope we can talk to these people, I said. I thought of making an observation about that other ring being our only escape if the aliens turned out to be hostile, but I was pretty sure at this point that Turnbull, or at least his crew, would have figured that out. Sir William seemed to be an arrogant and unimaginative guy, but not completely incompetent, and the members of his crew certainly knew their jobs. There is one other item we've found, the captain went on as if I had not spoken. The world below us, Tolux Six, has no atmosphere, no apparent life. We have detected residual radiation, evidence of a battle in which massive numbers of fusion warheads were used, enough to strip the planet of its atmosphere. There also seem to be installations of some sort. He paused. Installations? I prompted, getting the feeling the pause had been for effect, and Sir William, with an audience, was ready to make a dramatic announcement. Yes, installations. Shut down and dead, it appears, with no energy readings. Made by these aliens? That's what we thought at first, but no. The installations, he paused again, look like those built by macros. Chapter 9 Adrian and I exchanged glances across Greyhound's bridge, ignoring Marvin for the moment. Captain Turnbull and his crew on Valiant were telling us about macro installations on the planet below. Our two ships were still docked together and formed a single large green contact in the hollow tank. With our command tables linked, Captain Turnbull's unpleasant face appeared in an open window on the console in front of me. He looked away from Adrian and me at the moment, studying something off-screen. 
We knew the macros were here 23 years ago, I said to the captain. Dad flushed them back through the ring. This must have been a base. Maybe these aliens fought the macros and beat them. That would be good news and a point of common reference, at least. So I hope, Captain Turnbull said, his voice booming through the comm link. The fact that they come from a life-bearing world would seem to indicate they're a biotic species, which makes us natural allies. I winced. The man always cranked up his outgoing volume. Doesn't always work out that way. Remember the blues, sir, I said. They're biotic, but my father had to bomb them back to the Stone Age to keep them from causing any more trouble. Effectiveness unconfirmed, Marvin whispered. He said it just loudly enough for me to hear. I glanced at him, but none of his cameras returned my gaze. It was a disturbing statement. Was he hinting that the Blues were not as badly hurt by the bombing as we'd assumed? He was correct that no one had ever gone down to the surface to confirm that the bombing had been effective. I wasn't even sure if he'd intended for me to hear him or not. If I hadn't been nanotized and microbed, I wouldn't have heard him at all. Which might mean that he didn't know about my capabilities. On the other hand, if he did know I was listening to his whispers, it might mean that he had spoken for my ears alone, which was another disturbing thought. If they encountered the macros, Turnbull said, then I have high hopes for the situation. Just think, I've discovered an entirely unknown alien species. If I can establish diplomatic relations, find out the fate of the macros, and open a way home for trade, I might be made a baronet perhaps even a Viscount. While Earth was now under one federal system, the UK had experienced a resurgent interest in feudal titles. They were handing them out as perks and status symbols to national heroes. A title didn't have much functional meaning, but it was a source of pride among the populace. Dad said that with everyone at peace and getting rich, these status symbols were just another way of keeping score. It sounded as if Sir William was angling for a social promotion to go with the family's wealth. I sure hope it works out that way, sir, I said. Just as long as it kept him off my back, he could be crowned king for all I cared. Let me know as soon as your program is able to translate some of what they're saying, Turnbull said. Until then, I'll let the scientists keep potching about with this ring. You might as well make yourself useful rigs and go down to take a look at the dead world. Just keep my remaining niece alive, will you? Don't stir up any unnecessary trouble. Valiant out. I didn't appreciate Turnbull's cutting sarcasm, even though I knew he had a point. I shot Marvin a glance. He blandly turned away one of his cameras, leaving only one looking generally in my direction. He said nothing, but it sounded like he was faintly humming. Not like a machine hums with electrical resonance. Instead, he was actually humming a tune. He was so quiet that I couldn't make it out against the ship's usual background noise. Maybe it was an indication of enjoyment or concentration. Or maybe he was just trying to bug me. Marvin could make anyone doubt himself. I sighed. So, I have a make-work assignment to go check out some dead world. He's just getting rid of me and keeping me out of danger from that alien squadron, Adrian said reasonably. Maybe. On the other hand, if it's macros, even deactivated ones... I turned to Marvin. Marvin, if it's macros, don't even think about accessing them without specific permission. My nightmare was that this might be some kind of dormant macro installation that Marvin would decide to jumpstart just as an experiment. Greyhound had a general-purpose laser suitable for taking rock samples, blasting small meteors out of the way, or killing big animals in case of a planetary landing. But we sure as hell couldn't handle even one enemy war machine. Instruction noted. Making any progress on that translation? Yes. I anticipate reasonable textual fluency in six hours. Voice simulation and transmission may take several days, due to the nuances of spoken speech. How about in... I checked the countdown that Adrian had put in the corner of the hollow tank. Four and a half hours when the aliens arrive. Not able to estimate. Translation is not a linear process. Rather, it is more like decryption of unknown data streams. What you might call code breaking. 
It often depends on serendipitous breakthroughs. You mean you'll have to get lucky? I believe I just said that. I shook my head. Well, hurry up then. When we get back to the ring, you'll have to translate what you can and hope we can avoid an interspecies incident. This conversation consumes processing power. Obviously, that was his way of telling me to shut up and let him work. So I moved the short distance over to stand next to Adrian at the holotank. Now she had the holotank showing a representation of the incoming alien squadron on one side, the ring and Valiant near the middle, and Greyhound heading for the dead world at the other end. All those elements were roughly lined up with the system's star. Funny. It just occurred to me that the aliens are deliberately coming straight out of the sun, like an old-time fighter pilot swooping on an enemy, I said. I wonder if it means anything. Maybe they're just being cautious, she replied. Or maybe they're used to fighting. Maybe, but not necessarily. Star Force hasn't had any real enemy in twenty years, but we still know how to fight. If we were in their place, wouldn't we want to have every advantage when facing an unidentified alien ship? She had a point. I guess we really couldn't glean anything for sure from the aliens' actions until they did something more overt, such as open fire. All right. Your uncle seems to think there's nothing to worry about, but we're going to be careful. Marvin, monitor passive sensors and report anything unexpected or dangerous. Greyhound, shut down active sensors and reduce all emissions to minimum. Adrian, run out that laser and be ready to shoot. You're sure you don't want to be nanotized? I already told you no. I'll be fine, she said, irritated. I swallowed my misgivings and double-checked all our preparations, and then sent us spiraling down. Soon we cruised in low over the dead world. We quickly found hundreds of ruined macro complexes, standing out like silvery sores against the lifeless brown dirt. Choosing one at random, we dropped in on repellers, then made a slow circuit of the area. There, down in that crater, there's a bunch of them. I'm bringing us lower. Coming over the rim, we saw ruined macros scattered around, half buried in the surface. I wasn't sure if they had been digging out, digging in, or had simply been partially covered by explosions. Real live macros. Adrian breathed, sounding more like her sister all the time. She had more guts than I'd expected. Contradiction indicated, Marvin said. These must have been deactivated. I thought you were completely busy working on the translation. I'm not blind. He waved his several cameras around on their stalks for a moment by way of demonstration. You are when you want to be, I said. Then I turned to Adrian. Marvin's got a point, though. Is there anything alive down there? Any power readings or detectable life signs now that we're close? Adrian worked at the holotank, controlling various sensors from its touch interface. No, nothing that I can see. Let's set down and take a closer look. I think we should keep our distance. Come on, where's your sense of adventure? I tried to say it lightly, but I inadvertently let a little edge creep in. Adrian's face darkened. What? Are you trying to get me killed too? That floored me. I actually had to grab onto my chair to keep in it as a fresh wave of emotion flooded through. Shame at the kernel of truth in her words... Anger that she would use Olivia against me that way, and the unfairness of her words. Unfortunately, my mouth got ahead of my better judgment this time. Your sister would never have said something like that to me. Obviously, I'm not my sister, she snapped. I stood up to stare angrily at the holotank. That's crystal clear. She'd have stepped up and come along, or at least backed me up, not need me in the nuts. Greyhound, prep a suit. Wait. Adrian said, reaching out to grab my arm. I felt like shaking her hand off, but I let her hang on to me. I'm sorry, she said. That was a low blow. It just popped out. I didn't mean it. I'll come along. No. You're right, really. You should stay safely aboard the ship. I'm Star Force. It's my job to take risks. Shaking my arm, she argued. Look, I take back what I said. I want to go along. I can't just sit back here while you go facing danger. Her eyes pleaded with me. I almost said no just to put her in her place, but that would have been indulging my anger. I also got the feeling that if I did that, I would be turning a quick tiff into a major sore spot. 
So I forced a smile. Putting on my best caricature accent of Sir William, I said, That's the spirit. Give it the old college try, eh, what? A smile I knew so well broke out on her face. It was bittersweet when I saw Olivia and Adrian's mannerisms. She used my arm to pull herself up to kiss my cheek. Thanks, Cody. I smiled back a little crookedly, not knowing quite how to take these mercurial changes in mood. Now you're talking. Let's suit up. Putting on the gear was easy. Greyhound had expensive suits that were mostly smart metal with only a few manufactured parts. We just stepped in to what looked like exoskeletons, activated them, and the rest flowed around us and encased us in self-sealing, flexible material. I took along a beam rifle. It made me feel better. When we clomped to the edge of the airlock, we lost the 1G we were used to. This world's gravity was more like point seven, so we felt lighter and springier without being completely unbalanced. Stepping out carefully, we found the surface hard, like gravelly soil, with little dust in it. The horizon was close and sharp, without air to fuzz it out, reminding me a lot of the moon. Earth's moon, that is. I'd spent a whole semester there as part of my academy education, getting used to an environment where one mistake could kill you. Walking up to one of the half-buried macros, a hundred-foot-tall combat crab, was totally surreal. I'd seen them in museums, of course, and on vids, but these... Objectively, I knew they were powerless and dead, but it sure seemed like they could just come to life at any moment. Maybe it was because the thing appeared to be frozen in the process of digging itself out. Look, it's almost cemented into the ground, like concrete was poured around it, Adrian said, prodding at the edge with her toe. Maybe it was, I replied. Maybe it's a monument to the new alien's victory, like a battlefield deliberately left alone. Then where are the other side's machines? I mean, they might pick up bodies, but where are their tanks or battlesuits or whatever? I shrugged. Maybe they salvaged them. Let's look over there, I said, pointing at what appeared to me to be a distinct convex curved line on the ground. That kind of shape reminded me of something I'd seen in one of the endless documentaries our generation had grown up watching. I guess every big war affects the kids afterward, not only because of what it did to the parents, but because it sets the tone and infects the media. It washes a patina of time across the war until it doesn't seem bloody and grim anymore, but glorious instead. As I trudged across the rocky ground among those hulking mechanical corpses, I felt the echo of fear my dad and Quan and all those other guys must have felt as they charged into bloody close combat for the first time down in the jungles of South America, dying in droves. I shivered. We'd reached the line, and Adrian scuffed at it, a sort of shallow trench dug in a perfect curve, defining a circle maybe a quarter mile wide. It's from the dome, isn't it? She asked. I think so. That means... I lined myself up and pointed with my whole arm. The center should be that way. Let's go. Making sure she stayed in front of me so I could keep an eye on her, we made our way the eighth of a mile it took to find the center. There we found not a combat machine, but the broken factory that I expected. I remembered most of the domes had one of these things, a combination of defensive generator and macro maker, the heart of any ground infestation. I still don't see any enemy stuff around, I said, doing a slow 360. But it sure looks like this factory was attacked. There aren't any burns or blast marks, but these impacts. Adrian indicated weird upside-down V-shaped dents, with their points toward the sky, as if someone had taken an odd axe blade ten feet high and chopped at the machine until it broke. What kind of weapon would do that? Maybe the aliens will enlighten us. It's time to get back now. She protested, but I insisted. 
we headed back toward the yacht. Hey, Adrian stopped. This wasn't here before. A rocky mound twenty feet high blocked our way between two wrecked macros. You're just remembering wrong. We must have gone around. I started angling to my right where I could see an open space. Cody, come back here. Look. When I did, I saw where she was pointing at the ground. Our tracks seemed to simply appear out of the side of the low hill, as if we had phased through it in some magical way. I'm beginning to get a bad feeling about this, I said, grabbing her shoulder and pulling her back. Something wasn't right, and I didn't know what it was. Maybe it's some kind of hologram. I let her draw away from me, which was another big mistake. You'd think I would have been hyper-paranoid after losing Olivia, but in reality I think I was trying to make up for it by making Adrian happy, instead of being a hard ass about keeping her safe. As she reached out to poke at the hill in front of her, the dirt grabbed her. Chapter 10 The dirt actually grabbed her. That's the only way I can describe it. I was reminded of a horror vid I'd seen once where the monster was a kind of energy force that used whatever dirt and rocks were around as a body. In front of us, soil shaped itself into an arm or tentacle with a four-fingered claw having two opposing digits on each side, like one of those clamps on the end of a manipulator arm that loggers use to pick up big trees and move them. It wrapped itself around Adrian's forearm and started to pull her into itself. Fortunately, it wasn't very fast. I'd seen a three-toed sloth on a nature show where it took several seconds to make a simple motion, like moving a paw from one spot to the other. That's what it reminded me of. These thoughts ran through my head, and I froze for a moment, but then went into action. I slung my laser rifle over my shoulder and grabbed the reaching tube of dripping earth with both my hands. Bracing my foot against the mound, I pulled with my full strength— the stuff felt like nanometal when it was flowing, granular and resistant, but I was able to compress it as if it were made of rubber. It got thinner and thinner as I pulled and squeezed, and in a moment I managed to drag my hands all the way through it, like tearing away a clump of wet clay. The end with the claw fell off onto the ground and broke apart, turning into just another spray of dirt, while the stump started to reform itself into another grasping appendage. I shoved Adrian away from it, and she stumbled, sprawling on the ground. I wasn't limiting my strength anymore. This wasn't the time to be gentle. It was then I realized my right boot had sunk six inches into the side of the mound, which had flowed around my foot. I was held fast. I tried to jump, twist, and kick. But the thing held on and began sucking me downward into itself like quicksand. The problem wasn't a lack of strength. It was a lack of leverage. The only thing I had to push against was more of the same dangerous earth. I felt Adrian grab onto my shoulders and tug as I leaned toward her. I had one foot on the ground and one in the growing mound of soil, which now had me up to my right ankle. But she wasn't strong or heavy enough to be effective. I was going to be swallowed if I didn't do something drastic. Making a decision my father would have been proud of, a real Riggs decision, I reached down to my leg with both hands and popped loose the catches that held the hard parts of the boot together and started trying to pull my foot out of the suit itself. Accessing the tiny brain box, I yelled, Suit! Release the right boot assembly! Cannot comply, my suit said in a tinny, small brain box voice. Vacuum environment detected. Release may cause fatal decompression. Suit! Emergency override! Execute previous command on my authorization! Emergency authorization implemented. Smart cloth flowed out of the boot in immediate response, rejoining the rest of the suit. I pulled strongly as the pressure eased around my foot. I had to act before the crazy trapping soil squeezed harder. My foot popped free and I fell backward, and even though I was wearing a sock, my skin began to frost over. Immediately, the nanites in my body went to work, limiting the damage and thickening my skin. I tried to walk, but every step I took felt like I was pressing the sole of my foot to something far chillier than a block of ice, which it was. This far out from its sun, the surface of this planet was cold, at least minus fifty if I had to guess. We hopped and stumbled away from the killer mound and circled the broken macros. Now I realized why the robots all seemed half buried in the dirt here. The strange earth had overcome the macros— 
and it was trying to consume us as well. Rounding a tangle of broken-down robots, we realized that we'd been blocked in that direction as well. Spinning left and right, we could see mounds had sprung up all around the area, forming a ragged wall of vertical cliffs twenty feet high. Unfortunately, the gravity here was at least two-thirds of standard, enough to prevent a normal human from leaping over the walls. But I thought I could do it anyway. Adrian, I said, listen to me and do what I say. Okay, she said, eyes wide as she examined the closing walls. She was breathing hard. See the mound between us and Greyhound? I'm going to throw you up onto that mound, maybe over it. You might have a rough landing, but you need to try to hit the ground running and move fast enough to keep that stuff from grabbing you, okay? What do you mean you're going to throw me? I'm nanotized, Adrian. And more. I'll explain it all later, but I can do this. To her credit, Adrian didn't argue. Okay, I'm ready, she said. Tell your suit to go into impact-resistant mode, and then as soon as you are on your feet, switch it into muscular assistance mode. Our standard flight suits weren't battle suits, but they had some pretty cool functions, especially expensive suits like these. All right, she said after a moment. I've set the program. Here we go. The mounds were grinding toward us like bulldozers, linking up with their fellows as they flowed around the dead macros, pulling inward to corral us in a circle. I grabbed Adrian by the neck ring and the seat of her suit, tipped her over like a child, and ran three steps before lofting her skyward. Up and over she went, and I jumped right after her. Two possibilities had occurred to me as I watched her fly, and both were dangerous. One, she might land on top of the mound, and it would immediately try to engulf her like quicksand. Two, she might go over the mound entirely and slam into the frozen ground on the other side, landing too hard. I was hoping for option two, because a few broken bones could be fixed. Unfortunately, option one reared its ugly head. When I landed beside her at the top of the mound, she was already sinking. The stuff was grabbing at her like living taffy. I landed, seized her again, and ripped her free. I tossed her in a flat spin down the opposite slope and onto the undisturbed area beyond. Whatever this substance attacking us was, it seemed to be localized and moved with finite speed, so I hoped she would be safe for a little while. My right foot felt almost completely numb, except for a hot needle-stabbing sensation that told me my body's nanites were trying to heal me at the same time my foot was freezing solid. I ignored all that and ran after her down the other side of the mound, feeling like I was running in deep mud. The ground clutched at me, but I pumped my legs madly and roared with effort, ripping free from the ground and slamming my feet down to generate traction. My speed and strength were my only assets, and I used them to the fullest, pushing myself forward. When I made it to steady ground, I found Adrian semi-conscious. I picked her up and carried her over my shoulder. Suit, form a field expedient right boot to protect my foot. Complying. Smart metal flowed, and I hobbled awkwardly away from the mounds that were now rumbling and grinding in random directions, as if seeking their lost prey. I could feel their vibrations through the ground like earth tremors. Marvin, I radioed. Marvin, answer me. Nothing. It took me a moment of frustration to remember I'd forbidden him to transmit. I was annoyed that this was the moment he'd chosen to follow instructions to the letter. I decided to talk to the ship directly. Greyhound, open the airlock, and as soon as we're both inside, lift off. This soil is trying to swallow us. Command accepted. Shall I activate the laser? No, I gasped as I ran with Adrian, bumping up and down on my shoulder. Unfortunately, I could also see that the dirt was starting to ripple around the ship, and the struts that braced it from rolling on its rounded belly seemed to be sinking. Greyhound, the effect is trying to grasp the ship. Use repellers to lift off now, at least a foot or two. Try to get free of the surface. Command accepted. By this time, we'd reached the ship. I tossed Adrian up and into the airlock and leaped after her. The belly of the yacht had come off the ground, but the four landing struts remained mired in the soil, which was trying to climb up them and drag the ship down. With its big engines and high power to mass ratio, I hoped that Greyhound would pull free when the time came. I hit the emergency speed cycle button on the airlock. Gases hissed and were lost into space. I yelled into my radio, Lift off now! We're in! I felt the vessel yaw and shudder and could hear a rising whine as the brain box fed the repellers more power. 
increasing repeller force will damage landing struts, Greyhound complained. Screw the struts. Blow them free or release them or whatever. Rip them loose with your manipulation arms if you have to. Greyhound did as I ordered, and a moment later the shuddering ceased with one final lurch. Everything was still and quiet, except for the thrum of the engines. Opening the inner door seemed to take forever, but finally I carried Adrian into the ship. After telling her suit to remove itself from her, I placed her into the auto dock. I was extremely glad we had the machine, because Adrian was in bad shape. The screen on the machine said she had multiple broken bones, as well as internal injuries and a concussion, despite my trying to be gentle with her in our mad escape. A nightmare of fear reached up to clutch my throat, and I told the auto doc, initiate extreme measures. Command accepted. Please back away from the canopy. I hoped I was doing the right thing. Last time the machine had been set to only nanotize someone if they were dying. I wasn't going to wait that long this time. It didn't matter if she was pissed at me for giving her the treatment. She decided to come along, so she had to deal with the consequences. I watched the readings for a few minutes to make sure everything was going okay. She didn't thrash as much as Olivia had. Presumably the auto dock had sedated her enough to reduce the effect. I should have insisted on getting Adrian nanotized, but I'd been blinded by my desire to please her. I resolved that I wouldn't give in to that urge again, at least not in the face of danger that should have been obvious to me. Now that I had time for regrets, I blamed myself for what had happened. Anything that could take down macros was obviously dangerous to us. I'd been fooled by the lack of energy readings, and I'd forgotten that alien worlds might hold life that was very, very alien. That this stuff was life of a sort, I had no doubt. It had acted intelligently, at least in an animalistic way, like a pack of dogs, or perhaps smarter than that. It had formed a claw, tried to pull us in, and then corralled us. Maybe that was how the stuff hunted, though I couldn't for the life of me figure out what there was to prey on or eat on that dead planet. No, not a dead planet. This was a world with life or machine life, that I simply didn't understand. Maybe there were different sorts of rock creatures around, a whole ecology our science hadn't even dreamed of down there. In my head, I labeled these possible creatures lithos, the Greek word for stone. Cody Riggs, we are being hailed, Marvin said. Put it through here, audio only. Turnbull's voice came through. Riggs? Yes, Captain. Everything all right. I cleared my throat, which was a dead giveaway, but I couldn't help it. I'd never been the smooth rogue my old man was, but I figured I would have to learn. Fortunately, Turnbull seemed oblivious. We got a bit banged up when the ground suddenly shifted, sir, but we'll be all right. How are things with the aliens? That's what I wanted to ask you. I see you're headed back to us. Has your translator program made any progress? Just a moment. I scrambled up to the bridge and had the hail patched through with video. I glanced over at Marvin, still humming contentedly at his station. Fortunately, he was out of the direct line of the camera pickup. The program's still running. If you don't mind, sir, we'll talk about that when we arrive. I have to see the damage. Rig's out. That seemed as good an excuse as any, and I cut communications. Marvin, do you have any theories about what that stuff was on the planet? I'm analyzing it now. Good. We were halfway back to the ring before Marvin delivered his report. During that time, Adrian's condition had improved, but she was still in the auto dock. My foot was no longer blue and encrusted with ice. Instead, it looked almost normal, but it still lanced fire up my leg every time I put my weight on it. I have a theory, Marvin announced. I believe the mobilizing agent of the soil was a non-metallic form of nanite. It uses silicates in a manner similar to our nanometals. By manipulating molecules in the soil, it controls the rest of the molecules, the way muscles control human movements. I sighed with relief. I'd been seriously considering the supernatural, or some strange energy-based life form. I thought about his report, and my eyes narrowed in concern. Marvin, 
What if this stuff gets loose aboard the ship? As with our constructive nanites, this soil needs a directing intelligence, or at least a collective of the substance large enough to form large numbers of neural chains. There aren't enough of the nanites in the samples we've taken aboard to do this. How much would it take? I asked. The amount is difficult to quantify. The nanites are buried in a larger substratum of base materials. Lacking easy electrical conductivity or other metallic properties, I found that... Just give me an estimate, I broke in. How much total mass did you bring aboard? Six tons. That much? Are you crazy? I don't see why my sanity is so frequently questioned whenever I seek to perform basic scientific research. Okay, whatever. Will it self-replicate and spread? Only very slowly. It requires food and energy to reproduce just like any plant or von Neumann self-replicating machine. To prevent growth, all we have to do is restrict its intake of vital materials. Do you have it contained or not? Locked in the hold, it can't escape. It needs energy and mass to consume in order to grow stronger, and there is no ready source of either. I suspect it will grow gradually by leaching matter from the walls, but very slowly. That got me thinking. Where would it be most deadly? Anywhere on a planet or other unrestricted environment with a great deal of silicates and energy. My blood chilled, but my mind went into overdrive. I knew this stuff was dangerous, but maybe it could also be useful. It was like a disease of the soil. My guess was that someone, perhaps these aliens coming toward us, had created it and used it to take down the macros on the rocky world. The immense machines had been outmatched by tiny, non-metallic nanites they had no idea how to fight. Hitting the stuff with energy, lasers or explosives, might kill some, but it would also fuel the replication of others. And with a whole planet to occupy, the macros would be swimming in a sea of enemies. Probably only the fact that the macros were metal had saved them from digestion. But the lithos had immobilized and sucked every bit of energy out of them, until the big machines had just run out of juice. Like a man in quicksand. Marvin, make sure you keep any litho samples tightly sealed and wipe out all the rest. I don't want any wild litho infesting our ships. Does that mean I am authorized to obtain and contain samples? Oh, yeah. As I had restricted him from doing anything, any analysis he had been doing must have been passive through observation only. Yes. Take samples and make sure everything is contained and is no threat to our ships or crews or passengers or any humans or allies, I added hastily. I understand. I know you understand what I want is compliance. Greyhound, take rendezvous instructions from Valiant. Marvin, I'll be back soon. Marvin didn't answer. He just hummed and did his work. I stopped by the galley and grabbed two beers, then one more for good measure, and headed back to the auto dock. The procedures it was performing on Adrian weren't complete, but the timer showed only twenty minutes remaining. She was still sedated, but she'd be coming around soon. I left a sweating bottle on the table nearest the machine and went back to the bridge. Marvin, what have you learned about the alien crews in the approaching squadron? In response, Marvin put an image on the main view screen. I saw a furry raccoon face. I tilted my head back and forth, trying to figure out why the black and white seemed so familiar. Then I got it. The aliens are pandas? Chapter 11 There do seem to be similarities between the aliens and Earth pandas, Marvin said as I stared at the still image on the main view screen. Do we have video? I asked. Not yet, he said. We're having trouble synchronizing our protocols. Visual data is limited to this single frame. My theory about the ancients trying out lines of directed or seeded evolution on various planets seemed to be gaining solidity, at least in my mind. What if the interconnected network of interstellar rings, rumored by the blues to be composed of 200 links, was the equivalent of a laboratory shuttle system? What if the ancients were akin to mad scientists who'd built the system in order to skip from place to place, checking up on and tinkering with each set of DNA they planted? 
I wasn't sure how the Blues claimed that the ancients brought a terrifying cold with them when constructing rings fit into my theories. Maybe it was a random side effect, or maybe rapid cooling of the worlds accelerated the pace of natural selection. Maybe they were so hungry for energy, they actually reduced the output of each system's stars, just as a functional expedient. I'd read once that a small percentage reduction in solar energy could trigger a killing ice age upon Earth. Of course, it was also possible the Blues had lied about the ancients and their ways for their own devious purposes. The truth was that we had no way of knowing the truth. Wait, I said. Didn't someone say these panda people lived on a hot and wet world? Correct. Assuming the picture actually represents the aliens. Does that seem to make sense to you? Marvin seemed to process this for a moment. Bear-like creatures on Earth often live in wet climates, but seldom in extreme heat. Keep working on the translation and try to look for any apparent anomalies. You have about... I looked at the clock. Fifteen minutes to rendezvous, and Turnbull is going to want some kind of progress toward communication. Then please be silent, Marvin said. I require all my neural chains to analyze their transmissions. I shut up and then used the touch controls to check on the situation. Valiant floated in the center of the ring, which I thought was a strange place to be, but I guess Sir William liked his drama. I did notice he angled the damaged side of the battle cruiser away from the aliens, concealing his weakness to a certain extent. Turning our sensors on the incoming squadron, I could see the six ships with their weapons grouped in clusters of six. I glanced over at the picture of the panda and noticed something so obvious I'd missed it. Six fingers were clearly displayed on the creature's hand, if you included the opposable thumb. Well, at least they weren't six-legged spiders. A few minutes before the agreed time, Turnbull called and asked for a further report, so I gave him a short and downplayed version of what we'd seen of the lithos and the dead macros. Then he wanted to know how the translation was progressing. Off-screen, Marvin sent a text translation of what he'd worked out, which consisted of the panda picture and the following. Greetings, alien life. We enfold you with our embrace and only wish to experience you. Request that you send visual scan to establish trust and words of friendship. That seemed fairly coherent. I gave Marvin a thumbs up and said to the captain, That's the best we could do so far, sir. If you like, we can record a video and we will quickly translate it and send it back to them in a message. Well done, young Riggs. Perhaps there is some use for you after all. Set it up. The man chewed at his upper lip and preened his mustache while Marvin did the prep work. Eventually, the robot bobbed a camera at me. Go ahead, sir, I said. Ahem, yes, Turnbull said. Greetings, local indigenous people. We have traveled from far away to explore other star systems. We mean you no harm. It appears we have a common enemy, the machines we call macros. He turned his head aside and lowered his voice. Riggs, send along some pictures of humans and macros fighting. Then he sat back up with his oratory voice. I didn't bother to tell him it would probably not matter to aliens how elegant and round his tones were. He went on for several minutes with diplomatic blather before he ran down. All right, sir. We'll get right on this. Rig's out. I turned to Marvin. Go ahead and task complete, he interrupted. Did you translate that whole speech? Yes, and I sent it along with image scans. Well, I couldn't fault Marvin for taking the initiative. I'd intended to cut out some of the fluff from Sir William's speech, but what was done was done. I concentrated on piloting us up to the ring, but instead of floating in the middle of the ring's span alongside Valiant, I chose to hide behind its massive edge. This was in case the aliens turned out to be hostile after all. A couple minutes of transmission lag passed before a message came back. We thank you for your meaty words, bursting with truth and good intentions. Your visual scans infuse us with curiosity and happiness that you fight against the evil macro machines. We embrace 
and wish to experience all biotic species. We invite your leaders to a celebration in honor of this momentous meeting. I thought it was interesting that they did not transmit video, though perhaps they still weren't able to match our transmission protocols. I hoped this was not some sort of trick, showing us a picture of a circus bear when they were actually weird monsters waiting to rip us limb from limb. Maybe they were actually lithos, some kind of rock people like the nanite-laced mounds we'd encountered on the dead planet. Turnbull sent us another long-winded speech. I let Marvin translate and relay it to the pandas. If the first load of blather hadn't bothered the aliens, I guessed another wouldn't hurt. Diplomacy was probably pretty much the same everywhere. It amounted to saying lots of nice things you didn't particularly mean while working behind the scenes to get what you really wanted. The exchanges came faster and faster as the alien six-pack drew closer, with Marvin translating almost instantly now that he had more samples of the panda speech to work with. I listened to it raw, and it did sound like bears growling and roaring. The upshot of all the negotiation was that we would fly to their planet, Talax 4, and talk some more. The travel to their planet took hours. Greyhound traveled along well behind the battle cruiser and her escort. The pandas didn't seem to care about us. Maybe it was because we posed no clear threat. I let the brain box fly the ship and used the time to get Adrian out of the auto dock, lifting her sleeping form and placing it on her bed after the machine cleared her to leave its care. I figured she'd rather waken from the sedatives in a familiar place rather than inside a metal and glass coffin. The beer I'd left for her hadn't been touched, so I drank hers as well as mine and caught a few hours sleep in my own room. When I woke up, I made the way to the bridge, leaving Adrian to rest. She still hadn't awakened. As we approached Talax 4, Marvin put an optical close-up of its airless moon on the biggest screen we had. It showed a dark, cratered landscape, with concentrations of junk lying around, seeming quite familiar. He turned two of his cameras on me. What? I asked. You should recognize these structures. Can you magnify them? This is maximum magnification. However, as we approach, they should become easier to distinguish. I glared at Marvin, but unless I ordered him to tell me, it seemed as if he was going to play guessing games. A few moments later, I saw what he was getting at. Those look like macro installations, just like on the dead world. Precisely like on the dead world, Tullock 6. I moved closer until I almost had my nose on the high-resolution screen. They're buried in litho dirt, too. Yes. My mind whirled with the implications. Had the lithos, if they were truly alive, somehow spread from one planet to the other? I thought they seemed to prefer airless worlds. Maybe they had hitched a ride aboard a panda or macro ship. Or maybe the pandas had spread them deliberately, as I'd theorized before. Maybe the litho nanites were a kind of anti-macro weapon, a non-metallic machine inimical to metallic machines in the same way that viruses preyed on biotic life. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, I quoted musingly. Marvin replied with another quote, Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Right. Stay near me, Marvin, okay? Marvin turned to stare at me with all his cameras for a moment, then spoke when something beeped. Hail from Valiant. Riggs, Turnbull said. Come join us aboard Valiant. The pandas are going to send us over a delegation, and I want all the officers here, even you. I acknowledged his order and told Greyhound to dock with Valiant while I hurried to my stateroom to change into uniform. By the time I had it on, the two ships had connected, so I soon met Turnbull and his officers. They were all down at the large airlock in the hold, waiting for the aliens to arrive. Stand in the back, Riggs. You're a disgrace, the captain said, staring me up and down. I realized they had all donned their finest dress uniforms made of real earth fabric and dripping with braid and metals, while I had only packed the one set of utilities. It seemed I couldn't catch a break in his eyes. Moving over, I stood behind the group. Because earth pandas weren't the biggest of bears, I'd expected the aliens to be about 300 pounds. 
Instead, they were larger than that. Grizzly bears, that's what they resembled in size and shape. Only their markings and coloration was reminiscent of pandas. I was certain, however, that for all time, Earth people would call them pandas. Monikers like that tended to stick for generations. Most of the alien delegation stood eight feet tall and probably weighed as much as an average horse. Six of them came aboard in all. They wore uniforms made of leather straps, more like harnesses than what we thought of as true clothing. They had leafy pendants streaming from these harnesses, probably awards and medals, but they carried no weapons that I could see. I had to give them points for diplomacy and trust. We had a row of armed marines in full battle armor against the wall, showing our relative lack of trust. The pandas also wore breathing masks, but after a moment they took them off and sniffed the air. It appeared our atmospheres were compatible. With the additional travel time, Marvin had managed to crack the code on the panda's speech. He then uploaded his interpreter program to the Valiant's brain box, so we had a running translation. One of the six, who had a fancier uniform, spoke first. Welcome to our planet, which we call Hot Swamp, the leader said. Obviously, our new translation program took some things literally. He then walked over to Turnbull, who had placed himself front and center in the fanciest uniform of all of us. The panda held out his two paws, taking one of the captain's hands. He ran his claw-tipped, furry fingers up and down Turnbull's arms and squeezed it in several places rather than shaking his hand. Turnbull fumbled through the elaborate panda handshake before letting go. We thank you and greet you in the name of Earth, he said. I'm Sir William Turnbull. He turned to introduce his five closest officers, snubbing me. The panda leader conducted the same ritual with each man or woman. Afterward, he said, I am called First Provider Long Growl. Apparently, that was the best the rough translation program could do with his name. Let me introduce my leaders the panda said. Each had a title, such as Second Procurer or Fifth Collator, and always a name that involved some form of growl. Once finished, First Provider Long Growl drew himself up. We're ready for the feast, he said. The feast, Captain Turnbull said. We weren't aware of that requirement. No feast? Long Growl asked in surprise. He looked at his comrades, who all exhibited signs of puzzlement. They flicked their ears and muttered in low tones. I'm sorry, Turnbull interjected. He clearly sensed a diplomatic faux pas. Surely you can understand. We're new here. How can we make it up to you? Long Growl spoke solemnly. In the name of the Growl people... I would like to invite the six Turnbull leaders to a feast in their honor with our own leaders of sixes. Turnbull's face lit up. Excellent. We'd be happy to accept. My anticipation surges, Long Growl said. Please come aboard our ship. The panda turned and led his officers back onto the airlock to his vessel, which was docked alongside Valiant. All right, ladies and gentlemen, come along. Turnbull strode after them, looking very much the hero in his fancy uniform. Quan made to follow with some marines, but the captain waved them back. I noticed none of our officers were wearing sidearms. This caused me to frown, and I glanced down at my own weapon. I'd strapped a laser pistol to my belt automatically. True, the pandas had come aboard our ship with nothing but their claws and teeth— but they had a fleet outside to make sure we didn't try anything unexpected. Sir, I said loudly, shouldn't we go armed? Turnbull looked at me as if noticing me for the first time. Are you daft, man? He asked with an icy glare. I find it unsurprising that diplomacy isn't your strong suit, Riggs, but even a junior officer— should be able to see that boarding their ship while armed would be an insult to these people. They asked for a delegation of six in any case, and you would make seven. You can stand watch while we establish relations with these aliens. Please try not to subject my ship to any major cock-ups. 
I could see no point arguing. I was disappointed to be left behind, but then again, I didn't like the idea of heading off to an alien world unarmed. Yes, sir, I said. Would you confirm my status with Valiant's brain box, please? Turnbull paused long enough to make me command personnel, and then went aboard the panda ship. By Star Force regs, as long as all the other officers were gone, I was in charge of Valiant. If we hadn't been deep into alien territory with a damaged ship and no way back, I'd have been delighted with the chance to command a battle cruiser. But unfortunately, right now, all I was left with was the sudden weight of responsibility. Quan, come with me, I said after the airlock had closed and the panda ship had disengaged. We went up to the bridge, now manned by warrant officers and enlisted people. I had no idea how they would react to me taking over, even if it was a lawful order. So having the big man behind me in armor might head off any problems before they got started. Whether it was good crew discipline or Quan, the bridge crew took my announcement without protest. I told myself it wouldn't have mattered to me if they had complained. I had prepared for this moment all my life. I'd finally been given command of a warship, even if it was only acting temporary command. I'd studied my father's campaigns and the battles and the macro wars, as well as all the other military history I could find. I'd devoured military subjects in any form I could get my hands on. Print, digital, audio, video, virtual, games. If it could teach me something about command, I'd hungered to learn about it. I'd also visited monuments and battlefields from Thermopylae to Andros Island, packing my imagination full of grand dreams. Someday, I knew, humanity would run into a major threat. It might be resurgent macros, it might be some sneak attack by the blues, or maybe it would be some new alien menace. When that happened, I had resolved to be ready. Give me everything you can on the Panda Forces, I ordered with deliberate confidence. Soon, I was studying the information on the holotank in the center of the bridge, Looking it over, I could see the pandas had a fleet of at least 300 cruisers in various orbits or on ground bases, all with some resemblance to the original nano ships that had arrived on Earth almost 30 years ago. I took that to mean they had been visited, too. Combine that with the evidence of macros on the airless moon and planet, and I had high hopes we could get along with these people. Next, I said, Give me an analysis of their main weapons on those ships. This took a few minutes, but soon I was looking over basic computed specs on the enemy guns. They surprised me. Anti-proton beams? I asked aloud. The big, bald, rangy man at the helm was a warrant officer named Hansen. He spoke up in response to my question. Yes, sir. That's what they look like. Nasty things at this range. If they hit our hull, they'll vaporize it in big chunks. Far more damage per second than similarly sized lasers could produce. I nodded, reviewing what I knew about anti-proton weapons. Unlike lasers, which burned or cut directly, or particle beams, which slammed subatomic particles into the target, causing contact fusion and heat, these beams sent a stream of antimatter particles. Negatively charged protons were essentially sprayed at the enemy, and they instantly annihilated the protons inside whatever they hit, releasing enormous energy and disintegrating the target's automatic nuclei. Star Force had never developed anti-proton beam technology because of its shorter range and higher power usage. Such weapons couldn't be used effectively in atmosphere since the anti-protons would annihilate air instead of their targets. Laser weapons were far more versatile. On the other hand, anti-protons could eat through any sort of armor no matter how thick or resistant to more mundane attacks. The only defense was the heavy macro-style magnetic shield every capital ship carried, but seldom used because of its huge power consumption. Hansen, make sure our shield is in good working order and ready to snap on if we are targeted by those weapons. Yes, sir. Already did it, sir. Good man. How are the repairs coming? We're patched. But we need more materials, especially the exotic elements, to fully rebuild. I thought about all the dead macros on their moon's surface, a gold mine of easily recycled metals. 
but we didn't want to piss off the pandas by poking around just yet. What about their secondary beams? I asked. Entirely anti-protons. I tapped my chin and thought. That made no sense. Pound for pound, our weapons mix was much better in a ship-to-ship -ship battle. Why were theirs so specialized? Anti-proton weapons wouldn't take down macros better than our loadout. Who else did they have to fight? Quan, I said, turning to the hulking marine who stood near the hatch. I want all your marines in full armor with their weapons, nuclear grenades, and skateboards handy in case of trouble. They were Quan's marines at the moment since the marine commander had gone along with the captain. Yes, sir, Quan said, passing the orders down to the troop pods. That made me feel better. How many panda ships have us in range? I asked. Six, sir, Hansen replied. I should have seen that coming. Set up a battle script so at the first sign of trouble the shield snaps on, and then we'll take evasive action. Make sure to include Greyhound in the plan. Are both our main lasers good to go? Yes, sir. Hansen ran his hands across his controls. Figure out a plan to survive their first volley. If they can't take us down right away, we'll knock out as many of these as we can and then head for the other ring. Sir? Hansen and the rest of the crew stared at me, horrified. Just in case, Hansen. If something happens, shouldn't we try to rescue the captain and the other officers? I stared at the hollow tank, not meeting his eyes. That would be my first impulse, but this one ship can't take on a whole world. We can't even take out these six ships, especially not at close range. According to these readings, they have dozens of surface batteries and defense installations around the capital city, as well as the hundreds of other ships we've pinpointed and probably a lot more. The captain chose to risk himself and his officers for the chance at an alliance. I deliberately didn't remind them of Turnbull's other motivations, glory and promotion. Probably it will all work out, but I want to be ready in case the situation hits the fan. For the first time, I was getting a real taste of what it meant to be a Star Force line commander. Hansen turned slowly away and then nodded. I was glad he seemed to agree with me. I thought that if I had Hansen and Quan at my side, the crew would probably follow along even if everything fell apart. Let me know if we get any word concerning our, um, ambassadors, I said. Next, I want to see what you've got on that other ring. The holotank showed me a representation of what the censored had gathered over the past twelve hours or so since we had arrived in the Tullock system. While our arrival ring orbited above Tullock 6, this one was stuck into a barren, rocky outer moon of the gas giant Tullock 5, even though the gas giant was in a closer orbit, it happened to be on the other side of the star system right now. That ring looked similar to the Venus ring near Earth. It was half buried and stood on its end, forming an arch. Twenty miles above it hung a massive battle station, not unlike the one my father had ordered built in the Eden system. The enormous construct did not seem to be in orbit. It looked like it was sitting on repellers, guarding the ring. Judging by the engineering and materials, it seemed to be of panda origin. It made sense that this battle station would be guarding the only active ring against the macros. I wondered, though, why they didn't put defense installations on the ground. They could have set up gargantuan guns or beams on the moon's surface that could blast anything coming through. Maybe they had the area mined, but I wouldn't have done it that way. Then I remember the lithos, or at least the litho nanites. The pandas didn't need mines. If the macros came through on the ground, the dirt would get them. If the macros came through in space, the battle station should be able to hold the ring long enough for reinforcements to arrive, and the pandas might have a lot more ships we hadn't seen. If I were them, I wouldn't reveal my full strength. Something beeped. Hail from the surface, Valiant said. Put it on. We saw vids of several pandas sitting around a table heaped with food. A panda I recognized as first provider Long Growl spoke in his grunting burr, which was translated as a neutral, pleasant male voice. The calm, almost kindly nature of that voice made what followed all the more horrifying. Greetings, said the alien. 
We thank you, Turnbulls, for a wonderful feast. Please send down another six leaders so we may serve our superiors. Behind Long Growl, we could see all of the Star Force officers' empty uniforms displayed in a row. Look, sir, on the table, Hansen said. I'd been staring at the pandas trying to get some nuance of meaning from their body language, so I had missed what was really important. Scattered across the tabletop, I saw human body parts, whole hands, bones, a scalp with an ear attached, even a bare foot. Chapter 12 I stared at the image on my view screen. I couldn't believe it. The entire delegation had been slaughtered. Fuck me. I breathed, just because nothing else came to mind. First provider long growl jerked as if poked with a stick. That will not be acceptable, he replied. Stop translation, Marvin, I snapped. Mute the audio. What are those six cruisers doing? One is moving toward us. It looks like it wants to dock. To hell with that. These sons of bitches just ate our delegation, and now they want more? My impulse was to open fire, but maybe this was all a huge misunderstanding, and I wasn't going to start a war by shooting first, no matter how sick the situation. Besides, we were outnumbered. Then it struck me that I really was in charge. Despite the fact I was a mere ensign, I was now the senior-ranking Star Force officer within hundreds of light years. Start translation and audio. I took a deep breath. First provider, long growl. Your behavior is not acceptable. Consuming other sentient beings is abhorrent to us. We cannot provide you with more humans to eat. The panda seemed surprised. Do you not wish to join our cooperative society? No. We are happy to discuss an alliance against the macros, but we cannot comply with your customs. We must insist. Please have the next six Turnbulls ready. No. Then we will compel you. The communication snapped off. Sir, the aliens are powering weapons, Hansen shouted. Execute the script. I watched as Greyhound powered its engines to full and took off like a bat out of hell with three times the acceleration we could manage. At the same time, our shield came on, and we powered after the yacht as fast as we could go. They're firing. Lights dimmed as all our excess power went into the shield. Even if we had enough juice to fire our own weapons, they wouldn't work very well with the shield in the way. It was an all-or-nothing deal. Damage report, I snapped. Surface damage only. The shield absorbed most of their shots. I could see we were pulling away from the pandas as they kept firing their anti-proton beams at us. They seemed to really want another feast. In a few minutes, we were out of range, and I had time to get angry, remembering our officers. I couldn't believe they'd been served for dinner. I wanted to swing around and go blasting at the panda ships. If we were skilled and lucky, we could beat the six that were following us. They hadn't seemed very imaginative. Suddenly, thirty-six missile plots sprang into being in the holotank, all aiming at us. I calculated our respective accelerations and determined that the missiles would not catch us any time soon, so I ignored them for now. Sir, I've dropped the shield, Hansen said. We're out of their range, but our primary lasers can hit their ships. Shall I return fire? Understandably, he was eager for payback. I thought for a moment, then shook my head. No, there's no point. We can't afford revenge right now. We have to reserve all our power for our engines. What about shooting down the missiles? Not right now. It looks like we can outrun them. A germ of an idea was forming in my head. Hansen turned to stare at me. His face was red and his brows were drawn tight. Riggs, we must hit them back. We can't let them get away with this. Believe me, Hansen, I would love to do the same, I said grimly. But revenge is an indulgence we can't afford right now. What do we do, then? Hansen asked. He looked disgusted, but resigned. Staring at the holotank, I reached over to tap the icon representing the moon circling gas giant Tullux V. We have to go through this ring. What about the battle station? We'll blow past it. That's our only option. 
If we stay in this system, they'll chase us around until we run out of fuel and supplies. How are the missiles tracking us? Optical? Radar? Heat? Radar, sir. They're pinging us all the time. Okay, I said. Tell Greyhound to slow down and let us catch up. A few minutes later, we came alongside and docked, with the enemy missiles trailing far behind. Adrian, I hailed. You and Marvin, come over to Valiant. I have use for that yacht, but neither of you needs to be on it. Marvin is in the cargo bay, experimenting with his litho nanites, Adrian replied. I'll try to get him to come, but he doesn't listen to me. Five minutes later, she boarded Valiant and told me, I relayed your orders to Marvin, but he didn't respond. I thought about sending Quan over, but Marvin was a coin flip when it came to being useful. I decided to let him be. I didn't really expect my plan to lose Greyhound anyway. At least, not yet. I told Greyhound to cast off and spent the next couple of minutes instructing its brain box. Soon the yacht fell back toward the chasing missiles while Valiant forged ahead. This made the smaller ship's radar signature bigger in the missile sensors and reduced the battle cruisers. Then we slowly diverged courses until I was certain the missiles were following Greyhound and not Valiant. Perfect, I said. Now we can lead them around for a while before we use them. Use them? Hansen said. Yes, or it is implied question. Now set course for Tullock 6 full speed. The dead macro world? Exactly. Hansen shrugged and input the course. Employing maximum speed, we reached Tullock 6 in two hours. We hovered over the blasted landscape. I noted that the six panda ships had turned back to their own world. Now what? asked Hansen sourly. I glanced at him, realizing he was highly upset. His jaws clenched, displaying bulging cheek muscles. I decided to ignore his attitude. The death of Captain Turnbull had been a shock to everyone. Come down slow, but don't land, I said. Grab some of the taller pieces of dead macros with arms and use the small lasers to cut them free of the surface. Try not to shoot the ground. I'm not sure if the energy will feed the lithos or harm them, but I'd rather not do either. Load the cargo bays full of chunks. In fact, extend some smart metal to make extra holds. I want the material broken up into small masses in case we pick up lithos accidentally. They're dangerous when they're clumped together. I needed to work fast because the enemy missiles were still on Greyhound's trail. They weren't as fast as Star Force standard issue missiles, but they were determined. They kept following Marvin's ship around with grim tenacity, and they were slowly catching him. He had only a few days before they caught up to him. Within an hour, we had several tons of high-grade metallic elements, including the exotics and radioactives we needed from the scrap. That sounded like a lot, but it really wasn't. Metals are dense and don't take up much space. The lithos seemed to ignore us on the ship. Maybe they only cared about things on the surface. Get the factory pumping out constructive nanites. We'll patch up Valiant and repair the more complex systems later, I told Hansen. His expression was almost a snarl. He didn't even acknowledge the order, just turned back to his boards and began carrying it out. I considered relieving him, but I knew I couldn't. Despite his attitude, I needed him. He was functioning as my executive officer now, my second in command. He knew this ship better than I did, and I had my hands and mind full trying to figure out what to do. How long will it take? I asked. A few hours for the structure and hull. Once that's done... It will take days to make and install the high-tech mechanisms, the weapons, repellers, and so on. I'll pass the word to engineering. I leaned back and stared at the consoles. How long can we keep those missiles chasing Greyhound? Assuming nothing interferes, we have a day or two left. I told Marvin to modify the yacht's course and put Greyhound into a fuel-saving solar orbit. We both knew Hansen should have at least informed me that he'd made a course correction. Eyeing him, I let the matter pass. You'd think the pandas would recall their missiles, I said. Maybe they like to kill their enemies. Maybe that's more important to them than retrieving a few weapons. Or maybe they aren't very imaginative, I replied, ignoring his barb. I was beginning to think Hansen and I were going to have to have a private chat eventually, and I wasn't looking forward to it. I was still hoping he'd cool off if I gave him the time. The pandas may not have fought anyone but the macros thus far. Since we have time, let's stay here and salvage dead macros. 
There are more of them mired in this dirt than we could ever use. Just keep a sharp lookout for those lithos. They might have something up their sleeves. We stayed at Tullock 6 for several more hours until the ship's hull had been repaired. Given a few more days, we'd be back to original specs. I spent the time talking with the ship's engineers and surviving scientists about a modification I wanted to make. I even let Hoon in on the discussions. The other scientists seemed to know how to handle him. As long as I didn't talk to him directly, it seemed like he could contain himself from making a pronouncement about interacting with someone unworthy of his presence, namely me. Hoon was a reminder that there were different ways to be smart in the universe. Hoon and the scientists acted like field academics, but they were a bit more practical than the usual university-bound types. For all that, Hoon was still a major pain in the butt. The ship's engineers were much better. With me pushing them, they eventually programmed the ship's onboard factory to make what I wanted, three smaller magnetic shield devices. While the shield output was naturally spherical, it could be shaped somewhat by the right kind of conductive surfaces and magnetic energy. I put aside one of the devices for installation on Greyhound, but the other two I had configured to cover two sides of the ship, leaving the big pair of lasers free to shoot. The bubbles rose on either side of the energy cannons and limited their field of fire to some extent, but we now had some flexibility. Valiant could be partially screened against the anti-proton beams, but still fire at different targets, like a swordsman stabbing one man while shielding against another. The engineers protested that all this was against regulations, but I overruled them. We're 300 light years from home with no support, I pointed out. To hell with the regs. Exercise good judgment and creativity and make these things work the best you can. Once I assured them that they weren't going to get in trouble from anyone but me, they became more enthusiastic. These guys had grown up in a different star force from my old man's. There were lots more procedures and rules these days. In my heart and mind, I'd always longed for what Dad and Quan had talked about as I grew up, the early days of improvisations and big, desperate gambles. I guess I'd gotten my wish. Using our final day, we tested the new partial shields and how they worked with the weapons. Marvin flew Greyhound, leading the 36 missiles in circles. The pandas made no further moves, except for continuing to beam us an automated message that kept demanding we come to dinner. Now I understood what they meant when they said they would like to honor and dine with us. They wanted our heads on platters. The entire incident underlined the risks of using translation software. As we were out of time, I ordered Valiant and Greyhound to rendezvous, and we refueled Marvin's ship. We set course for gas giant Tullox 5, where the ring waited. It was the only exit out of the panda system, and we all hoped that it would function for us when we got there. On the way, we continued to modify Valiant. The next part of my plan was to order the improvement of all our motive systems, engines, repellers, inertial stabilizing fields, to allow us a big burst of acceleration. Extra generators and capacitor batteries to store the energy were also added. We had to expand the hull in spots to make room, turning the graceful manta ray shape of the ship into more of a sea turtle. It wasn't pretty, and the way the ship handled would suffer, but for my plan to work, we needed all the hardcore acceleration we could get. When Dad modified a ship like this in the old days, he said it was like taking a European sports car and turning it into an American muscle machine. Now I knew exactly what he meant. During this time, I didn't see as much of Adrian as I'd have liked. Don't get me wrong, I wasn't chasing her or vice versa, but a smart, capable, and familiar companion at meals made a welcome change from all the earnest military people. The crew wanted to believe in me and the rig's mystique, and I didn't want to let them down. But I was just an ensign, after all, and I was obviously coloring way outside the lines. Only the fact that I wasn't leading them straight into pointless danger kept them confident. That and our decisive escape from the panda attack. I kept telling them the truth, which is always a plus. Our job was to survive and get home. Even if that was all we did, the new star maps we'd take back to Earth would be incredibly valuable. I had the dead officers' cabins cleaned out and their effects stored, in case we ever got back home. I gave Adrian one of the cabins and took another for myself. 
left the captain's quarters untouched, aside from boxing up his possessions and shoving them in the lockers. I didn't think the crew was ready for me to move in there. I talked to Adrian about her uncle and how sorry I was for her loss. She told me she didn't blame me, and I felt our relationship improving. We shared mealtimes in her cabin. She gave me good advice and insight, and I realized it was important to have someone nearby who wasn't under my direct command, someone who could speak her mind without worrying about her career or petty politics. You'd think people would forget about all that stuff when enemies were all around, but human nature just didn't work that way. I found that I really needed to talk to a friend, to get me through the long hours filled with work and worry. Sometimes in my exhausted dreams, I wasn't sure whether it was Olivia's or Adrian's face I saw. We talked about how I had nanotized her to save her life, and she understood. Everyone aboard was now nanotized, even the few surviving civilians. When they had argued with me about getting it done, I'd led them down to the improvised morgue, and showed them the bodies of their dead colleagues. Then I jumped into a medical bay for booster nanites, making a show of how easy it was. Despite the pain, I sat rigidly and kept inside the howls that wanted to escape my lungs. After that, they'd been mildly shamed. They climbed into the machines semi-voluntarily under my Marine's watchful eyes and suffered through it. As always, the treatments provided hours of agony. I left just as they began cursing my family name in earnest and pretended not to hear. Sir, came a call as I left the scientists to their torment. Bridge calling. Warrant Officer Hansen on watch. What is it, Hansen? The pandas have finally made a move. They're on our screens and closing fast. They'll intercept us just as we reach Tullux 5. I released a string of curses. Are they launching from the battle station on Tullux 5? No, sir. They appear to have come from the alien homeworld. They circled around the star using its gravitational pull to slingshot them to greater speed and surprise us. How many ships? Thirty-six. Of course. Maintain course and speed. Rigs out. I hurried to the central factory, which was now churning out munitions. It was my final preparation, one I wasn't sure would work. I'd ordered the machine to build small, simple mini-missiles. They had no warhead, just a tiny radiation source to fool sensors into thinking they were nukes. The motive force would be one repeller, like on a marine skateboard or in a battle suit. Normally, repellers were much too slow and weak compared to engines, but they had the advantage of using much less fuel and space. A generator, a repeller, a sensor package, and a tiny brain box basically made up each missile. There wasn't time to test them thoroughly, but during the final hours I fired off a few prototypes. They worked well, and I had the factory spew out as many as it could make, which turned out to be about a hundred per hour. Once we had four hundred of them, I was ready to put my plan into motion. Chapter 13 By the time we were closing in on Telex 5, I wouldn't say we were ready— but we'd done what we could. It had taken some maneuvering, and I hadn't fully explained what was going to happen to my crewmen, but they were all too busy to complain. I'd never liked meetings, so other than the duty watch, it was just me, Hansen, and Quan around the bridge hollow tank as the battle began. I'd deliberately excluded the scientists. They would debate everything endlessly if I'd let them loose on the command deck. Adrian had slipped onto the bridge, the only non-military person in sight. She sat down near enough to listen in, and I didn't have the heart to order her away. I guess because I'd included her in the manufacturing and crash repairs, making good use of her engineering degrees, she figured she was part of the command staff now. Fair enough, I figured. If I was lucky, she could become my technical liaison, my eyes and ears among the geeks. She did seem very well liked by the technical staff. Let's get a status report, I said. What's with those 36 panda ships? I could see on the display they've slowed down. Yes, sir, Hansen said. Why? Hansen shrugged. Not sure. I thought maybe you could tell us what the enemy was thinking. I stared at him coldly for a moment, then nodded. I'll do my best. I would wager they think we'll slam into their battle station and die on their guns. Why risk losing a few cruisers in battle if they can take the damage on a tougher station? Why, indeed. Hansen asked. I'm beginning to admire their strategic thinking. All right, I said. 
If they're hanging back to play cleanup, it's all about us and the battle station. In fact, it makes it even more imperative that this plan works. Because otherwise, Hansen said, we're dead. The panda ships will sweep in and blow us away from behind if we're so lucky as to survive that long. We will, I assured him. Valiant is lined up on the open part of the ring sticking out of the moon of Tullux V, or at least lined up on where it will be at the moment we pass through it. I'm hoping that as we approach, our intentions won't be obvious until the last minute. All we have to do now is accelerate. That's still going to be some tricky piloting, Hansen said, getting the timing right. Are you saying you can't do it? I asked quickly. The grizzled veteran's lip pulled back. I can do it. But if I miss and we all die, don't say I didn't warn you. I won't say a word, I said, smiling tightly. But how are we going to get past that battle station? Quan asked suddenly, leaning his bulky body forward over the command displays. I was thinking maybe we'd have to land troops on it or something. I could tell he was disappointed he wasn't going to get the chance to kick some panda ass in person. Don't worry, I told him, I'll have something for you and your marines to do, but before I get to that, I brought up the holotank's planning function and started a script I'd written. Once we accelerate to cruising speed, we'll launch our mini-missiles in a cloud toward the battle station. What about our regular missiles? Hansen asked. What about the panda fleets? The logical thing to do is to hit both forces and send a full spread in behind the little ones. The warrant officer was referring to our nuclear-tipped ship killers. If enough of them got through, they could take down the battle station or at least tear it up badly. No, I said. First off, we don't have a lot of them aboard, and I don't want to use up our supply of radioactives. We're not home yet, and I want to hang on to critical materials. Secondly, I want to keep casualties between us and other biotics to a minimum, no matter how abhorrent their customs. Third... We don't know exactly what the battle station is defending the pandas against. But I suspect something serious is on the far side of that ring. If we take down their fortress, whatever is on the other side of the ring might pour through and destroy the pandas. Killing pandas? Quan asked. That sounds like a pretty good idea to me, sir. What if the enemy they fear is even worse? I demanded. Quan snorted. They ate our officers. I know, I said. But crazy as it sounds, that may be how they exchange ambassadors or receive visitors in their culture. No, we have to escape with minimum damage to either side and move on to locate more rings. That's the only way to get home. Quan fell silent. I glanced at Hansen, but he didn't offer anything new. On the other hand, I continued, if some of our mini-missiles do strike home, I won't lose any sleep over it. Their job is primarily to provide a distraction. Hopefully the battle station will use its weapons to take out the threat, rather than to try to stop us from going through the ring. They'll have no way of knowing those missiles aren't nuclear-tipped. Okay, but what about the other things you did to my ship? Hansen asked. My expression hardened. I'd given the man a lot of leeway as the local expert, and I was a very junior officer. But I wasn't going to let him get away with thinking he was in charge. Divided command was a recipe for disaster. It's not your ship, Hansen. It's our ship, or it's my ship. Forget that, and we're going to have a serious disagreement which will end badly. My eyes bored into him long enough to see him back down. Then I threw him a bone, lowering my voice as everyone else on the bridge was listening. I said, We have to stick together on this, Chief, for everyone's sake. He nodded, his lips drawn together in a thin line, and I resolved to keep a close eye on him. Now, I spoke more loudly. The extra engine power is so we can goose it and speed through the ring faster than they think we can. The pandas have seen this ship's performance as we ran from their squadron, so they will be calibrated for what they expect. Hopefully that will throw their aim off enough to allow us to zoom by. What about the new shield generators? Hansen asked. We'll use them to double up on shield power. Two layers will cover most of the ship, and we'll drop the outer screen and be able to fire the main beams if we have to. So, what about my marines? Quan asked. How many do you have left? Thirty-two, he replied. 
I nodded. That's good. Adrian, get down to the troop pod and do a count on our serviceable skateboards. They'll each need a sensor package, a steerable repeller, a radio receiver, and a tiny nuke. Use the minimum amount of radioactives and make them out of solid steel so there is more mass to blast in all directions if they blow. We'll sync them up with the suits, and each Marine will control one with his own HUD. We're going to send them out in front of us in space. What will we do? Quan asked. Do you think maybe we're centaurs? Am I getting the joy of blowing myself up? I thought you wanted to get into this battle, I said. Quan grunted unhappily but said nothing more. I was glad he didn't go up against me on this. I was having enough trouble with Hanson. I could see now why Dad had always liked Quan. He followed orders. Get started on configuring those invasion systems, I said, and get them slaved to the marine suits. Once they'd left, I turned to Hanson and explained the other part of my plan. After some thought and a few tweaks, he agreed it was a good one. We started working on scripting the ship's brain boxes for as many contingencies as possible. Murphy's Law, or Saad's Law, as Adrian said it was known in the UK, states that whatever can go wrong, will. Then there's the old adage about no battle plan surviving contact with the enemy. Both of them seemed to apply when it came to Marvin. Just a few minutes later, Hansen spoke up from the helm. Sir, I'm having trouble getting confirmation of the script from Greyhound. The brain box is not responding. That annoyed me because the yacht and the missiles that were still mindlessly following it were an important addition to my plan. Not only that, I wanted to install that third shield generator on Greyhound. This far from home, the flexibility of having an extra fast little ship might be critical. Try hailing Marvin directly, I said. Thinking about it, I realized several days had gone by since I had spoken to him. That couldn't be a good thing. Whenever he fell silent, I had to wonder if he wasn't cooking something up that he knew I wouldn't like. I probably should have had Quan drag him aboard Valiant when he'd had the chance. A video stream came to life on my console. Marvin appeared with only a few seconds delay. Hello, Captain Riggs, the robot said. I'm not a captain, Marvin, I'm just an ensign. By naval tradition, the officer in charge of any ship is given the courtesy title of captain, no matter his rank. Therefore, you may call me Captain Marvin. I paused, startled at this sudden conversational turn, and almost exploded in anger before realizing that I had to outthink and outreason Marvin if I was going to regain control of the situation. Obviously, he had somehow talked himself into seizing Greyhound. Given how far away he was and his ability to outrun us, I had no direct way to enforce my will upon him. I'll call you Captain, I said carefully. If you can convince me your claim to that title is legitimate. Space salvage law says that any party may take possession of abandoned property. Greyhound is not abandoned property, Marvin. On the contrary, it became abandoned when Adrian Turnbull, its owner's legal proxy, departed. I crossed my arms, racking my brain for what I remembered of my classes on space law. To be salvaged, a vessel must be abandoned by everyone, correct? Otherwise, a ship could be seized on a technicality if all the officers or owners happened to leave. In other words, it has to be empty and unattended to become salvage. All Marvin's cameras, which seemed to have multiplied to at least a dozen, now focused on me, or at least on my image aboard Greyhound. I believe that is correct, he said cautiously. But you are a citizen of Earth, as you have asserted before, and you were aboard the whole time. Ergo, the ship was not salvage, and you are not the new owner, nor the captain. There was a certain degree of triumph in my voice as I finished my declaration. I knew I had him, and it had been rather neatly done at that. His cameras drifted listlessly. I'm experiencing immense disappointment. I think it is what you think of as sadness. I've always wanted to be a ship captain. Marvin, I snapped, are you blocking our access to Greyhound's brain box? No. His tentacles began to fidget. Not liking that one-word answer, I pressed him. Then why can't we reach it? Define it. By it, I mean Greyhound's brain box, I said, my voice rising. Put me in contact with the ship. Marvin's many tentacles rustled and moved like a nest of nervous snakes. Captain Riggs, 
You are already talking to it. What? Then I got it. Marvin, did you take over the brain box? Did you incorporate it into yourself? I believed I was captain. It seemed irrational not to do so. Finally, I realized how clever Marvin had been. Unless I wanted to manufacture and program a fresh brain box in the middle of a combat situation, I was stuck with treating Marvin like Greyhound's controller. So he ended up being the captain anyway. Now I had to find a way to make that work for me. Okay, Marvin. According to Star Force regulations and Earth Space law, fleet can commandeer civilian vessels at need by order of the senior officer on site. That's me. And Greyhound is hereby commandeered and placed under fleet command. By my authority, I am appointing you a temporary warrant officer in Star Force with all the privileges and responsibilities thereto. Will I be paid? Marvin asked. Of course, though it will be a while until any of us collects our paychecks. Then I accept. All of his cameras and tentacles rose up into a position I would have called jaunty. I wondered if he had maneuvered me into this action, or if it had just been an acceptable fallback plan of his. I went on. Because you are now an officer in charge of military property, that is, the ship and the contents of the brain box you incorporated, you're clearly under my command. For now, you can be the sole crew member of Greyhound until I say differently. Then I'm Captain Marvin after all. I sighed. If it will make you happy, yes, but don't get arrogant or I'll bust you to enlisted rank and put one of my human warrant officers in charge. Or maybe I'll promote Quan, and he can be the captain. Marvin squirmed. That would be a grievous strategic error. And another thing, stop cannibalizing the ship for your own use. That's misappropriation of Star Force property. Aye, sir. After that, Marvin was very cooperative, which to me was a dead giveaway that he'd gotten most of what he'd wanted from me in the first place. I knew the robot had played me, but at the same time, I now had the backing of law behind me, rather than just force and persuasion. It remained to be seen whether that would work to my advantage. I made a mental note to get Adrian looking up all the regulations and laws in the ship's databases relating to Star Force military justice. After all, if I had to court-martial Marvin, I'd need an ironclad case. We spent the final hours before we came within range of the Panda Battle Station getting a shield generator to Greyhound. To do it quickly, we fitted a repeller on the device and then launched it on a path where Marvin could overtake it and pick it up easily. Hansen and Marvin had to perform something of a dance to make sure the Panda missiles stayed focused on Greyhound, but in the end it worked out. Once Marvin reported the generator had been installed, we were ready. I made sure my people rested and had a meal. I ate breakfast with Adrian. Last meal, she joked as I put my plate of food down onto the table across from her. Not nearly as good as what's on Greyhound, I complained. The beds suck, too. We call them bunks. Welcome to Star Force. I raised an eyebrow and shoveled some form of reconstituted egg product into my mouth. Speaking of that, how come Marvin gets to be a captain and I'm still a civilian? She asked me. He's just a warrant officer, I said without thinking, and then I realized what she was really asking. Do you want to join Star Force? It might make it easier to deal with the scientists and engineers. Right now... I don't have the credentials to get respect that way, and I have no formal rank or status aboard this ship. Good point, I said as Adrian forked some more breakfast sausage into her mouth. At least that stuff always tasted the same, no matter what it was made of. Okay, I'll appoint you as a warrant officer, too. With a date of rank preceding Marvin's? Deal. I could see she had thought this through, she was constantly proving to me she was smart as well as pretty. I felt a little guilty at such a stray thought. The sensitive and moral part of me shook its finger and told me sternly that not enough time had passed since Olivia's death to be thinking of her sister. But it was hard not to, after having been thrown together in this life-or-death kind of situation. I smoothed my face, afraid my thoughts had shone on through. If she'd noticed, Adrian didn't let on. 
I never knew with women. In the emotions department, they were much too deep for me. I wasn't a complete clod, but I'd always gravitated toward more outgoing girls, the ones that were more comfortable with guys. Olivia had been like that. Adrian was different. She was less boisterous, more feminine, but still intense and strong. There were a lot worse alternatives to have as my companion at meals. Oblivious to my thoughts or faking it, Adrian said, I guess I'll need a uniform. In fact, you could use another set. I believe others might need spare clothing as well. If we live through the next hour, we can have the factory make some new clothes. I nodded, unsure what to make of her plan, but it seemed harmless. That's a great idea. What about that crusty? Adrian asked. Is he being taken care of? Yeah, he's fine, I said. He has his own quarters, though he complains the compartment is too small. I'll check to see that we have scripts for his suit and food. Thanks, I said. You know, you need some regular duties aboard ship if you're going to be a warrant officer. I think I'll put you in overall charge of all the civilians and the factory. That will relieve me of some worries and let me focus on operations. She smiled like the sun coming out. That's a wonderful idea. You're getting the hang of this command thing. I realized I was smiling as much as she was. Her words and face had made me feel good. I had to wonder if I'd been played again. But even if I had, I figured in this case it was all for the best. After all, I trusted Adrian far more than I did Marvin. Chapter 14 Like most battles, this one started slowly and built up in intensity. I stood at the hollow tank, dividing my attention between it and the forward screens. Signal Marvin to start his script, I told Hanson. I'd given Marvin a very precise plan and had explained exactly why I needed it done that way. He'd agreed without dissent. Like a kid who finally gets that new toy he's been wanting, Marvin wasn't yet bored with being the captain of his own ship. Maybe that had been a secondary intention of his all along. Maybe he had stowed away on the yacht so long ago in hopes that he could sneak aboard and salvage it. Or maybe he'd planted the bomb himself. I turned that thought over in my mind and looked at it from all angles, not finding anything to prove or disprove it. I filed it away for later. I watched as Greyhound accelerated smoothly in a long, looping course, keeping the missiles close enough to continue their lemming behavior. They pointed their noses toward their mutual target, keeping separation from each other, but otherwise acting mindlessly. Their programming was barely sophisticated enough to aim slightly ahead of the target, where it would be when they got there. Normally, this would be an advantage, improving hit probability, but in this case, it also made them highly predictable. I was depending on that predictability. Launching the mini-missiles, Hansen said, as the time hack came up on the screen. From this point forward, everything was pre-planned. In the holotank, I saw the 400 little powered darts cruise forward under maximum repeller power, which wasn't a whole lot. We were still an hour out from the ring and battle station. That hour would give our missiles time to build up enough velocity to be perceived as a threat. They're all activated, Hansen said a minute later. Now we launched the drones Adrian had been putting together with skateboards and small warheads. Marines operated them by remote control from their suits, one per man. Normally the skateboards would be carrying the marine pilot, but today they were providing me with extra tiny ships on the cheap. Make sure you don't enable the nukes on those drones, I reminded Hansen. We'd had the Marines practicing with slow-moving guided weapons, repeller missiles, really. But if there was one thing every fleet officer knew, it was that if something could be broken, misfired, or made to malfunction, a Marine could do it. Hansen shot me one of his signature get-off-my-back looks and went back to watching his board. Instead of heading toward the battle station, the drones proceeded in front of us toward the ring. I intended for them to lead us through. Maybe they wouldn't be needed, but if there was something waiting on the far side, they would give the unknown enemy 32 extra targets and maybe a nuclear headache. Over the following minutes, we played a waiting game. Valiant's gunnery non-coms held the mini-missiles aimed at the Panda Battle Station while I watched a spider web of tracking lines in the holotank slowly converge. 
The Marines kept themselves occupied by practicing with the repeller drones operated by their suit huds. Greyhound's long loop came back to meet ours ten minutes before engagement, just outside the predicted range of the battle station's biggest beam weapons. They hadn't fired missiles at us, for which I was grateful. Probably they figured there was no point in wasting ammo when their beams could do the job. The longer they waited, the easier this was going to be. Like a mechanical clock with many moving gears, my plan was coming together. Crossing into range of the enemy introduced variables. I had no idea exactly when they would start firing. I fidgeted but tried not to show that I was sweating underneath. Shields on, I said as we closed into range. Keep all the capacitors at full. The weapons are last priority. If everything worked right, we wouldn't even need them on this side of the ring. They're firing, Hansen announced. The holotank displayed fresh red lines representing the shots of dozens of huge anti-proton turrets. They stabbed outward through space, slowly reaching for us. Fortunately, they weren't targeting Valiant just yet. Instead, our green pinprick missiles began to wink out, turning into white flares of pixels that quickly faded to nothing. We're losing mini-missiles faster than I expected, I said. That's going to be a problem later. Greyhound, trailed by its flock of 36 Panda missiles, eased in alongside Valiant. As the weapons were still finishing up their curving course and were trying to aim ahead of their target, they actually flew a path that would take them, by our finely tuned calculations, through a spot exactly 20 miles above the ring, precisely where the battle station was. Unless the Pandas were able to regain control of their missiles, I had turned their weapons against them. Now, if we were really lucky, they would have proximity fuses with huge nuclear warheads and no ability to distinguish friend from foe. It wasn't so much that I hoped they would strike home and blow the snot out of the battle station. I just wanted the huge fortress to be desperately concerned with the threat of their existence and therefore ignore us. Coming in range of their secondary beams, Hansen said. The battle station had hundreds of smaller anti-proton beams, presumably used to knock down missiles, borders, or fighter craft. They joined the bigger weapons in lashing out, trying to pick off the mini-missiles. In response, our controllers threw them into random repeller spins, trying to keep them alive as long as possible. We're still losing them too fast, I said aloud. We should have made more of them. By my calculation, all of the mini-missiles would be picked off before the Panda missiles got within range, giving the battle station about 30 seconds to shoot at us, even with our extra speed. Hansen, arm all the drone warheads, I said, coming to a decision. About time, he said, perking up. I glanced at him, then contacted Quan. Marine commander, divert half the repeller drones. Keep the other half aimed at the ring. Target the battle station and try to get them into detonation range. Go ahead and blow them up when they reach their maximum damage radius. I want to rattle the pandas and keep them busy. I heard a sigh come out of Hansen. He wasn't getting the panda blood he'd dreamt of. That was too damned bad. Diverting the drones had been one of my contingency plans. Better to risk going through the ring with fewer of them than suffer a pounding from all those panda beams. I doubted Valiant could survive a concentrated barrage for long. Our surprise burst of speed might save us once, but I was reserving that for a last throw of the dice. The drones filled in most of the time between when the last of the mini-missiles died and the panda missiles arrived. Ten seconds, I called. The hollow tank showed the sixteen remaining repeller drones had passed through the ring. The marines would pick up control of them when we followed. They're targeting us, Hansen barked as the battle station turrets slewed toward our ship. Flank speed now, I yelled. But Hansen had already put the pedal to the metal and punched us forward with all the power of our engines. Greyhound fell back slightly, then caught up again to ride in our shadow. Marvin was no fool. He was putting the bulk of Valiant between him and the threat. The battle station fired a titanic salvo toward the ship instead of the last of the mini-missiles. Most of their shots missed sternward. Valiant rocked with one heavy blow and several near misses. Power surges ran through the ship, causing the fluctuating inertial fields and grav plates to bounce us around. But everyone had nanite arms holding onto their bodies by this time. Shields held, Hansen reported with relief. We took a direct hit from one of their big guns, but we got lucky. It landed where we had a double screen. Yes, I said with a pointed look. We were lucky.
He didn't look at me, but I figured he'd gotten my point. If he didn't, the crew had. My dad had always told me a commander has to convince his people he's always one or two steps ahead of the average officer. He didn't have to be the smartest guy in the fleet or the bravest, but it helped. He just had to anticipate and keep winning, because everyone loves a winner. More importantly, people follow winners. The Panda guns turned to deal with their own traitorous missiles next, and we passed through the ring at high speed. We never did get to see what happened to the battle station, and within moments, we were too busy to care. When we exited the ring, the ship was buffeted with turbulence. At least, that's what it felt like. The screen lost visuals. I looked at the holotank, which synthesized inputs from all our sensors, and shouted in alarm, Full braking! Whatever attitudinal problems he had, Hansen was an excellent helmsman. He turned the ship end for end, throwing us into a full-power deceleration. I noticed Marvin had done the same with Greyhound. What's going on? Hansen asked, holding tightly to the controls as Valiant shook like an airliner in a thunderstorm. There's something big in front of us, I replied. On the holotank plot, it looked like an enormous curving wall. Damage control, I called. Get those repair nanites to the forward hull. I want my visuals back. We lost external cameras to whatever we were passing through. It must be gas or dust, something relatively thin. If it had been thicker, we'd be heating with friction as if entering a planet's atmosphere. Then I noticed the drones that had been ahead of us weren't there anymore. The swarm of green contacts had vanished from the holotank. Quan, are any of our marines in contact with their drones? No, sir, Quan replied in command chat. I pulled up the radiation levels on my console. They were high for open space, though not dangerously so. I think I know what happened, I said aloud. The drones detonated about a second before we flew through the ring. They vaporized a minefield or some kind of guard ship clearing our path, but they left all this gas and dust. That fits, Hansen replied. We're smoothing out. He was right. We were passing beyond the area of destruction. Then the visuals came back on as optical sensors were repaired or replaced, and the main screen showed what we were up against. While it was difficult to get a good view directly ahead due to our engine exhaust, the curving wall was so large and so far away that it didn't matter. Looking from the main screen to the hollow tank and adjusting the scale... I finally recognized our situation. We're inside something, I said. A huge sphere, or maybe a hollow planet. We stared at the growing pool of data, trying to make sense of it all. Chapter 15 Once we had slowed enough to avoid slamming into the wall ahead, I had time to examine the situation. We cruised slowly inside an enormous globe. The ring was behind us, spinning in the middle of the globe. Floating with us were strange structures like snowflakes, thousands of them drifting around. They were between five and twenty feet in diameter. What are those made of? I asked, relaying the question to the science lab below decks. Some kind of crystal, the answer came back from Hoon, who was leading the analysis team. Spectral analysis indicates high levels of silicon. What keeps them floating around? Logically, the gravity of the sphere must pull objects down toward the ground, so something must be countering it for the snowflakes to remain in space. I believe they have repellers, Captain Riggs. Marvin's voice came over the comm channel. I hadn't told anyone to include him in the discussions, but he'd somehow tapped into our communications. I probably should have included him, so I let it pass. Non-metallic repellers? I asked. Yes, he replied. They're fascinating machines, using both mechanical and electrical processes, but only trace amounts of metal. I am looking forward to examining them. Hold on, Marvin, I said. That will have to wait. We need to find out where we are and what's dangerous in this environment. That battle station was defending the pandas against something. That's Captain Marvin, and I believe the situation is self-evident. I growled in exasperation. Self-evident. 
We've been a bit busy planning and executing our escape from the last system. All you had to do was follow orders, so I'm sure you had plenty of time to take readings and form theories. The gas and dust we encountered as we came through is the remnant of structures blown apart by our drones. Something didn't seem quite right about that. Our drones were contact-fused, I said. What are the odds all sixteen struck one of these crystalline snowflakes and detonated? Marvin said, Snowflakes? Ah, the structures. Perhaps there was a dense concentration guarding this side of the ring. As soon as one small nuke detonated, the shrapnel from the blast spread out and struck the remaining drones, and they were destroyed in a chain reaction. I nodded. That seems reasonable. Sir, Hansen broke in. The snowflakes, they're heading toward us, converging on our position. I looked at the holotank and saw that he was right. They're not very fast. We have time. Take evasive action to stay away from them. Marvin, what do you think these things really are? Automated litho defense systems. What will they do if they catch us, blow up? I do not believe so. From my analysis of their structure, they will probably latch on to any foreign object they encounter. Latch on? I looked up at the screen where one of the snowflakes spun slowly, looking harmless. What's that supposed to do? I don't know. I paced around the holotank, watching Hansen pilot us away from the largest concentrations of the slowly converging structures. What could they do to us? Just attaching themselves like barnacles seemed a very ineffective tactic. Then I looked back at the holotank and told it to display the overall number of snowflakes detected. There's more of them now, I said. Correct, Marvin replied. The number has risen from under 2,000 to over 10,000 in less than five minutes. Alarmed, I raised my voice. Where the hell are they coming from? I demanded. They're rising from the inner surface of the sphere that we're encapsulated within. I realized he was correct. We were inside a ball that was as big as a planet. It covered millions of square miles of area. How many of these snowflakes might there be? I know what they'll do, Adrian said suddenly. She'd been pretty quiet during the running battle with the pandas and our escape through the ring, but now she stepped up to my side and studied the holotank with me. It's simple, she said. They're like antibodies. They float around until they detect alien objects like our ships, and then they'll just get thicker and thicker, until we can't avoid them. They'll attach on to us, slow us down, and eventually overwhelm us. Maybe they'll crush us, or rip us apart. It's getting harder to dodge them. Hansen said. We may need to shoot our way out. Out? To where? I asked. There's nowhere to go. We can use nukes to clear them away for a while, Hansen suggested with a shrug. I stared at the screens and the growing number of contacts depicted in the holotank. They were tiny points of dull orange light, meaning the brain box wasn't completely sure if it should classify them as enemy systems or not. I was certain, however, they were very dangerous and should be colored a bright red. For a while. Hansen was right. Each of our small supply of precious nukes would probably buy us a few minutes. But that was a very temporary solution. All right, people, I can't be the only one thinking here. Start scanning and using your imaginations. What can we do? Adrian spoke up again. Maybe we can talk to them. Good idea. Marvin, you're our translator. Get working on any signals they're giving off, or any kind of language. They have to be coordinating among themselves somehow. You said they're just a kind of nanomachine, after all. I turned to Hansen. Is there any way out of here? I asked. He shook his head. None that I can see. Can we shoot some of these out of the way? I asked. The two main lasers should have no problem, and the mid-sized ones will be effective— but our point defense beams don't have enough punch. It's easier to damage a machine like a missile than it is to destroy a smart rock. Maybe, I said. Let's experiment. Start firing at the ones in front of us. Clear our path. See what it takes to kill them. I knew this was a short-term answer as we'd run out of energy before we destroyed tens of thousands of snowflakes. Glancing at the holotank, I saw the number of visible snowflakes had risen to more than 30,000 and climbing. My suspicions were right. Our big lasers each blew a snowflake to dust with one shot, but it took several hits with our smaller ones before a target was cut to pieces and no longer moving on its repeller. 
Whatever these things were, they seemed cheap, tough, and in endless supply. Where are they all coming from? I demanded. Are they waiting dormant, or are they being generated or manufactured as we watch? Marvin replied, They seem to be calving from the rocky inner surface of the sphere. Calving? What does this have to do with cattle? It's a specialized term for pieces breaking off glaciers or monoliths, Marvin said in a superior tone. Thank you, Captain Dictionary, I replied. Adrian touched my hand briefly. I glanced at her, and my anger and frustration faded a little. The situation was maddening, and she was trying to let me know I was exhibiting too much emotion in front of the crew. I sucked in a breath, nodded to her, and forced a tight smile. When I continued speaking, it was in a level tone of voice. So, I said, if these snowflakes are like antibodies, do they function as cells or individual litho creatures? Could the lithos be completely communal entities able to break apart and reform at will for various tasks? I was about to suggest that, Marvin said. He sounded a little annoyed that I'd come up with it first. Admit it, Marvin, I said. I figured something out before you did. Your theory has yet to be proven. But it fits the facts, I said. Marvin didn't reply. I imagined he was sulking, and that made me happy, until I happened to look back at the holotank and see the number of snowflakes had grown to more than 100,000. Given the inner surface area of the sphere we were trapped in, I didn't see any reason why it couldn't eventually reach a million, or even a billion. Now we know why the pandas use anti-proton beams despite their shorter range and high power consumption, I said. They weren't trying to stop an invasion of macros. They feared these things. And I'm willing to bet these formations are cousins with the living dirt we found on that dead world in the panda system. An elementary deduction, Marvin said quickly. That's been part of my operating theory for the last several minutes. I knew then that he had been sulking, but I decided not to rub it in. And do you have any other tidbits of wisdom in your brain box you'd like to share? I asked. I believe the pandas built their battle station and fleet to counter the lithos, and that the lithos built this facility to contain the pandas. Excellent. But how about something more practical, such as how to get us out of this trap? I'm working on that. Since Marvin was in the same predicament we were, I believed him, and let him alone for now. Cody, Adrian said, how thick is this shell we're in? I looked at Hansen, who shook his head. Our sensors only penetrate rock about a hundred feet deep. After that, it could be a thousand miles for all we know. That's a good question, though, I said, shooting a smile at her. What about other sensors? Infrared, ultraviolet, gamma, neutron radiation, neutrinos, gravity? We don't have gravitic sensors, Hansen replied. The others show some variation, but nothing conclusive. I programmed the holotank to consolidate all the readings to see if there were any patterns. Sometimes combining sensors revealed information that a single sensor would miss. There's a hot spot here, I said, throwing the location up on the main screen. All sorts of radiation and lots of neutrinos. What could that be? Neutrinos usually come from stars, Hansen said after a moment. And they pass right through almost everything, even planets. I nodded. So now we know the direction of the system's sun. From the number of neutrinos, we're less than one AU away from it. I have no idea how that helps us, but the more we find out about this place, the more likely we are to figure a way out of it, I said in a firm, confident voice. Keep scanning. We need all the information we can get. Make sure you feed it to Marvin. Hansen said, Ensign Riggs, at a guess. I'd say we have about another half hour before I won't be able to avoid or shoot these things anymore. Then we'll have to slow down to avoid damaging ourselves, and that will be the beginning of the end. I could see what he meant. Once they started sticking to us, the process would accelerate until they swallowed the ship. Maybe they would just entomb us and forget about us as a piece of grit encapsulated by an oyster. Well, I didn't want to become some kind of permanent cosmic pearl. Use a nuke. If you need to buy us time, I told him. Desperately, I ran the hollow tank through many variations of sensor data, trying to find something to give us a chance. I wished I had gravitic sensors. Then I slapped my head, cursing myself for my stupidity. 
Adrian, go grab the nerds and the engineers and get them to the factory. I need a gravitic sensor, fast. But I don't care how you do it, I cut her off. Figure it out. Challenge the techies. Call the lobster an idiot and tell him the only way he can prove he's superior is by showing the stupid humans how to quickly design and make a gravitic sensor, preferably a sensitive device that can focus on an area at a range out to 10,000 miles. Make sure it can be controlled from the bridge. Now go! Adrian shot me a reproachful look, but at this point I didn't care. Life and death hung in the balance, and I didn't have time for courtesy. Sure would be nice to have some of those anti-proton beams, Hansen mumbled. Sure would be nice to express that idea several days ago, when we had time to make modifications, I retorted. Keep it on the list, though, because you're right. We should have taken a cue from the pandas. I should have. Are we sure there aren't any openings in this sphere, any tunnels? Nope. Hansen said. Installations or structures above or below ground? Anything that might be a command center? I had a vague idea of nuking whatever mechanism controlled this killer trap if we could only identify it. Hansen shook his head after checking around with the other bridge crew. Nothing big enough to be obvious. But there's a lot of surface area to search. If it was small, it could take weeks to find it. He was right. Unless the nerve center I was hoping to find was as big as a city, we weren't going to find it in the next half hour. The rising snowflake count now exceeded one million and showed no signs of slowing down. In fact, the increase was accelerating. I felt like we were red-coated British soldiers facing a million Zulus, high-tech weapons with limited ammo against massive numbers. I paced back and forth, trying to figure a way out. Marvin, have you found anything? I transmitted. I've located a low-power carrier wave in the gamma band, but it will take some time to decode. How long? Days. I slammed my fist on the hollow tank's pedestal. Not good enough. We need to buy time. As that was a statement, not a question, Marvin didn't reply. He must have been at full neural capacity trying to crack the litho language and search for an exit at the same time. I believed he was doing his best. After all, his metal hide was in this with the rest of us. I racked my brain for a solution. What would Dad do? I rifled through my memories of all the stories I'd heard him tell, all the news accounts, documentaries, and war vids I'd seen. Snapping my fingers, I said, Marvin, keep trying to crack their language, but start sending pieces of it back to them. Try to break it down by words or strings or scripts. They're machines, so they should have a very rigid syntax. They don't seem very clever. Maybe they can be fooled into accepting our recorded commands. Marvin did not acknowledge, even though I could see the channel was open. I hoped that meant he was running his brain box at maximum capacity, not that he was ignoring me. I hated to depend on an erratic robot, but I had to admit he could outperform a team of engineers if he was motivated. Dad had kept him around for a reason. He was a temperamental and dangerous but highly effective piece of equipment. We have roughly ten minutes until we have to use a nuke, Hansen called. I contacted Adrian, who'd gone down to the factory deck. What have we got? It's coming together now, she reported. They came up with a sensor box cannibalized from lab equipment. You would have thought we were chopping their own kids. Once I told them it was life or death, they became a bit more cooperative. It should be hooked up to the control network in five minutes. Thanks. Good work. I closed the channel. Valiant, notify me when the gravitic detector is hooked up. I'm inputting its first script now. While my computer skills were only average, this little program was simple. Command accepted. The ship's brain box told me as it digested my instructions. Minutes later, the brain box continued. Gravitic detector is online. Execute the script. Staring at the holotank, I watched as our two ships maneuvered as if in a video game, dodging clouds of snowflakes and shooting. I wondered if the lithos had any more surprises for us if we did find a way out. Perhaps it would be something more dangerous than space-borne antibodies. A thin fan on my display reached out from our ship and began scanning the surface, starting with the hot spot. Unlike radar, a gravitic detector could map the mass density of just about anything, and gravity could not be blocked. That meant that with proper focus, we could look within the crust of this inside-out planet and see how thick and dense it was, giving us a crude picture of its structure. Five minutes, Hansen called. 
With agonizing slowness, the holotank built up a picture of part of the sphere. Surveying the whole thing would take hours, but I hoped this globe would have some kind of structure that would give us an advantage. It couldn't be made of only raw dirt, or it would deform and collapse. Something stronger than soil or even rock had to be holding its shape. I imagined a geodesic dome with its triangular struts supporting much thinner parts in between. There, I said, transferring what I saw to the main screen for everyone to see. Form follows function. Only a few shapes will support a smooth sphere. I was right. These are geodesic triangles. I used a cursor to mark the shapes of huge struts beneath the soil, tens of miles long and half a mile thick. They're extremely dense, most likely some form of crystal, as the lithos don't seem to like large amounts of metal. How does that help us? Adrian asked from behind me. She'd come back onto the bridge and now stood at my side, gazing at the holotank. Great job with the detector, babe, I said. Then I froze as I realized I'd accidentally spoken to her as if she were Olivia. I forced myself hurriedly forward, hoping no one had noticed. These main struts hold everything in place. There are lesser ones filling in the sections and even smaller ones filling in those sections in a lattice work. That means it has weak spots. How thick is the thinnest part? Right here, I stabbed a finger downward. Only about five miles of soil, not even hard rock. Only? Adrian stared at me from close range. I noticed her face was flushed. Had I embarrassed her with my slip up, or was her face pink from exertion? Still, she didn't look mad at me. It looked like I had gotten away with it, at least for now. It occurred to me that I was becoming a little too comfortable around her. I reminded myself to be more careful in the future. Then I got back to the situation at hand. Query the tech team fast, I said. I need to know if we can blast through with the nukes we have aboard. Chapter 16 Adrian turned and ran off the bridge, calling over her shoulder. If I don't ride herd on them in person, they'll debate until we're all dead. Her drive and decisiveness really made me happy. I had to give Lord Grantham his due. The old man had raised two highly competent daughters, and I for one applauded the effort. Less than a minute later, she contacted me. Hoon says it's possible. I'm uploading the detonation parameters now. I turned to my XO. Hanson, get with your best missile controller and set up a firing plan to drill through the crust at that weak spot. Remember to take nuclear fratricide into account. That was the tendency of one nuke to blow up and destroy others nearby before they could detonate. I knew we couldn't rig them to detonate on contact, because flying debris would set them off in a chain reaction. The timing had to be perfect, for each one to enter the hole, the last one made, and dig out some more soil. The farther they bored in, the harder it might be. Without more accurate data on the internal structure of this sphere, we just had to hope it would work. Many things could go wrong, from the tunnel collapsing, to some clever litho defense mechanism closing it up on us, or maybe they had the ability to harden or thicken the area in response to what we were doing. Firing a nuke now, Hansen said, far too soon for him to have set up the firing plan. The man was competent, though, so I just watched as the first missile shot forward toward a high concentration of snowflakes. At ten miles out, it detonated in front of us, clearing a pathway free of the weird rock machines. Normally nuclear blasts in space don't have much range of effect, because there is no air or other medium to carry the shock wave. But this time there were thousands of snowflakes, each weighing five to twenty tons. As they vaporized, the plasma, hot gas, and dust pushed forward, which damaged and shoved away even more of their dying mass. Every now and again, something went even better than I expected, and this was one of those times. Hansen bolted Valiant into the cleared area with Greyhound right alongside. The dust and gases buffeted us. Marvin, I called. Are you going to be all right? The yacht's hull wasn't nearly as thick as the battlecruisers. I have made modifications to this ship that should allow me a high probability of survival, he replied. It shouldn't have surprised me that Marvin would take good care of himself. I wondered what these modifications he made were. The thought made me shudder. Then again, if it helped us survive, I knew I shouldn't worry about it too much. 
I did hope, though, that he hadn't cannibalized all the food and beer. Military rations, or even worse, bulk factory foodstuffs, would get old quick. Hansen piloted us through the hole and dove toward the planet's inner surface, thousands of miles below. I could see most of the snowflakes were now behind us, forming up like a mob of preschoolers chasing a soccer ball. Shooting stray snowflakes to clear the way, Hansen launched the first digging missile, which blasted straight for the weak spot on the surface at high speed. Everyone watched it on the display with anticipation. The missile leaped forward, with Hansen following close behind. Our gunners targeted snowflakes to keep the nuke's path open, for we had to break and stay back to let our missiles do their job of drilling through without getting caught in the blasts. We also had to worry about the millions of snowflakes following us in a huge dark mass. The timing would be very tricky. The nuke went off with a tremendous explosion on the surface, and our sensors dimmed automatically. By that time, the second and third missiles were on their way, but now we couldn't help by shooting snowflakes. The visual and radioactive overload made our targeting too difficult. Less than a thousand miles above the surface and falling fast, nose down, we were committed. We wouldn't even see directly whether the nukes were boring their way through or not. Slow down as much as possible, I told Hansen. Fire a nuke backward to keep them off our asses if you have to, but we need to know we have a chance of making it through before we fly into that tunnel. Yes, sir, Hansen replied, grimly clutching his controls. The man had been yanking and banking for over an hour. Sweat poured from his face and down into his suit. I knew from experience that the stress of piloting was different from hard physical activity. Nanite treatments made people faster and tougher, but didn't do much to help hold a high level of mental concentration. I watched as he followed orders, firing a missile backward to blow up behind us, temporarily driving the mob back, destroying tens of thousands of snowflakes. Nuke after nuke went into the hole on the surface at carefully timed intervals. Dust and gas belched out of the tunnel. It's not going fast enough, I said. Some of the snowflakes are going to catch us. We can't afford to use many more nukes and be sure we can still blast through this shell. Hansen didn't answer. Piloting took all his concentration. Adrian, I called on the comlink. She was working below in the production chambers. Get the factory to modify the marine tactical grenades. I need a few nuclear charges, just cheap, quick ones like the drones, a booster, a warhead, and a fuse. On it, Captain Riggs, she replied, sending a shiver through my veins. Captain Riggs. That did have a nice ring to it, even if it was just a courtesy. Still, if something was repeated often enough, people would come to believe it. The crew needed to believe in me and my ability to get them home. Hansen, have your controllers start launching the new cheap missiles the second they're ready in order to keep us clear of the snowflakes. Save the good ones for the drilling. Soon I saw a measured series of explosions taking place behind us, blasting the forefront of the mob and dispersing it for a minute or two at a time. The millions out there kept coming, though and some slipped through. The moment I feared finally approached. We couldn't go forward into a tunnel full of nuclear bombs and shockwaves. We couldn't go sideways because we had to keep launching our missiles directly down the hole, and we needed a straight line of sight for the guidance signal. We couldn't back up because a million lithos were on our butts, and we couldn't burn the hundreds of stray snowflakes that were coming at us from every other direction. Quan, I said, Get your Marines onto the hull with the heaviest beam weapons you can carry. Keep a good lookout, and when a snowflake latches on, try to kill it or cut it away. I have no idea what they'll do to the hull, but it can't be good. Riggs pigs will get it done, Quan replied eagerly, and I chuckled. There weren't many traditions in a service as young as Star Force, but everyone knew the name of my father's Marines, and the crusty old non-com had carried it here so far from home. Little things like that could be big morale boosters or could even make the difference between winning and losing against a tough enemy. Anyway, I knew this kind of close combat was what Quan lived for. Everyone on the bridge was fully and desperately engaged now. Hansen was piloting the ship, gunners and missile controllers directed their weapons, and I oversaw it all. I was sure the rest of the crew was busy too. If not yet, they would be soon. I felt the first snowflake strike us. The jolt wasn't big, but it was sharp, like a rock hitting a metal door. Then, two more impacts, in rapid succession. The ship shook, and everyone on the bridge eyed the hulls for buckling and their consoles for flashing red indicators. 
The snowflakes continued to fall about one every ten seconds. On the view screens, I could see Marines firing their lasers by teams, burning the star-like points off the snowflakes. As Hansen kept the ship moving, every one of the living rocks that lost its grip flew off into space. But unless we also killed their repellers, they just came right back. I focused a camera on one of the bigger ones and watched what it did. Its arms curved inward like a six-limbed starfish, and I realized that the snowflakes all had six appendages. That seemed more evidence that the pandas had some hand in creating them. Once the arms touched the hull, they grabbed onto anything they could, struts, sensors, weapons, safety rings, and began to rip and tear like a clawed hand scrabbling its skin. Our armor was tough, but I could see that if we gave these things enough time, they would chew their way in like diamond-tipped drills. Quan's huge figure leaped past my camera, leading several battlesuits up close to the nearest snowflake. It didn't seem to have any defense or even awareness, and Quan had obviously figured this out because he clomped over in his magnetic boots. At point-blank range, he began cutting arms off the thing like a construction worker. Riggs, check the tank, Hansen barked, and I looked up to see a flashing alert in yellow, an unknown contact in the holotank. Whatever it was, it was big and had risen, or launched, perhaps, from a kind of mountain top off to the side about a hundred miles. Or rather, I realized after a closer examination, the thing was the mountain top and all. It moved toward us as if the entire monolith had lifted off and now flew within the enclosed space of the inside out planet. If it had been more potato shaped, I would have called it a powered asteroid but it had remained conical like a rounded pyramid. Zooming in, I could see alien structures, jaggedly beautiful crystals that reminded me of geological formations in places like Death Valley. These were more regular, though, purposeful, I would say, like the structures on a military spaceship. Oh, shit, I breathed. I think that's a real litho ship. It's too regular to be natural, and... I fiddled with the sensor readings. It's got a massive repeller signature. Fall back, fall back! I heard Quan yell on the general channel. On the screen displaying the hull of the ship, I saw a Marine being pulled apart by one of the snowflakes. Up close, the thing looked more like a six-armed octopus than a starfish. Its tentacles had sped up, and after tossing the bits of battle suit away, it started to scramble after another, I realized with a sick feeling that the lithos were now aware of the marine counterattack and something had instructed them to go after my men. Quan and his men beamed the monster down, but more were landing all the time, and I saw we'd already lost three of our precious marines. Soon, instead of surrounding and destroying the snowflakes, the troops were huddling against the airlocks and fighting to hold the snowflakes at bay. How long? I asked Hansen. Ninety more seconds, he said. We may not have ninety more seconds. Can we move in closer to the breach? I'll try. Valiant descended farther, frantically defending herself with cheap nukes and overheating lasers. The Marines clung to the hull, holding off the enemy, but they couldn't last forever. Captain Riggs, came Marvin's voice. The snowflakes are receiving signals from the litho ships. Their level of cognition is improving, and they're becoming more aggressive. Using the magnetic shield will block the signals, and I believe they'll go back into their previous mode. Ships. There must be more around I hadn't seen. More bad news. Also, if we turned on the shields, our lasers couldn't fire effectively. Then I had an idea. Hansen, turn on the starboard secondary shield and have the starboard lasers stop firing. Quan, fight your way over to the starboard side of the ship. The starfish will get stupid on that side, so clear them fast and dirty. Then we'll switch sides. I don't know if it was Hansen or one of the other bridge crew, but I saw my orders being carried out, and soon the starboard side had been cleared. I was just about to tell them to reverse field when Hansen shouted, We're ready to enter the tunnel. Quan, get everyone back inside, now. We're moving, and it's going to get hot out there. Turning back to Hansen, I said, As soon as the Marines are back in, punch it. That litho ship is almost here. I wasn't sure what to call it. The ship was bigger than a battleship, but outsized and crudely formed. I recalled a saying I'd heard somewhere. Quantity has a quality all its own. The lithos certainly had quantity. The lithoship is firing missiles, I heard from someone. 
Looking at the holotank, I saw about forty big, slow spikes, like broken stalactites accelerating toward us. The spikes were being propelled by something that created exhaust plumes, chemical rockets. It occurred to me that if the lithos could make guided chemical rockets, they could probably make gas-powered lasers. Come on, Quan, we have to go, I yelled. We're in, sir, he replied, and Hansen shoved the throttles forward without being told. Valiant slewed from side to side, Hansen snarling and shouting profanity. We're horribly unbalanced. Tons of snowflakes are stuck on the port side. I could see he was right. Some had been knocked free by the acceleration, but most of them were digging in with razor-sharp tips of their crystal claws and holding on. Will the explosion scrape them off? I asked. I can try, Hansen said as he entered the blast zone near the surface, completely obscured from normal view by dust and debris. We flew on radar, aiming for the tunnel mouth. As we entered it, the ship rattled and shuddered from the gases and shrapnel forced out by the nuclear explosions. It seemed as if we flew into the mouth of a massive shotgun while it was firing, trusting our armor and piloting skills to keep us from taking a big rock on the nose. The shock waves are tearing a lot of them off, Hansen said with satisfaction. But we're losing sensors and some of the laser barrels from the turrets. We can fix those later, I yelled over the sound of the screaming artificial winds. Just keep us going forward. It's our only chance to survive. We have to break through. The last two missiles had been launched in front of us, and the gravitic reading said the bottom of the tunnel, what was really the outside of the sphere, was only a few hundred feet thick. The first nuke actually did it, breaking a hole through to the other side. Suddenly the outside pressure dropped, and the noise and turbulence evaporated to almost nothing. The second missile sailed into empty space without detonating. A cheer went up as Valiant shot through the hole, momentarily leaving Greyhound behind. How are you doing, Marvin? I asked as I tried to bring up an optical view of the yacht. All the rear-facing optics seemed to be offline, and I couldn't get a visual. I have survived with moderate damage to my ship. It will need repairs. When we can, I replied with relief. Too soon, I realized we weren't out of the woods, as the litho missiles exited the hole behind us, still accelerating. Those didn't concern me too much, as these seemed even slower than the Panda missiles had been. What had me worried was the massive, quarter-mile-wide prow of the litho mountain ship. I watched as it nosed its way through the breach and followed us out into open space. Chapter 17 Retarget that last missile on the litho ship, I ordered, referring to the drilling warhead that had flown through and not exploded. No reason to waste it. Moments later, I watched it go arcing toward the huge flying rock that followed us, the litho behemoth was at least a mile long and shaped like an unshelled Brazil nut, or maybe a rough obelisk. I didn't expect the missile to hit. After all, the enemy had to have some kind of shielding. But I figured the attack would provide us information on their defense capabilities. Light them up with our main lasers as the missile makes its final approach, I said. Let's see what they counter with. The dot in the holotank that represented our lone missile converged with the much larger red contact. When the two had almost come together, our main laser batteries began humming and rumbling. These familiar sounds indicated the gas chambers were being filled, ignited, and recycled. At this long range, we were really taking pot shots. It wasn't like we could miss with a target that size, but they landed with weakened impact due to the spreading of the beam at that range, reducing their effect. Chunks of crystalline structure floated away from the hulking hull, but there was always more rock. Zooming the optics up close, I eyed their ship in detail. What looked like beam weapons of some sort crusted the side that we could see. If they were in fact weapons, they were huge, the size of skyscrapers, jutting out like cannons. I hoped their power did not match their size. When our lone missile came within a dozen miles of the litho ship, we knew the huge spikes they were aiming toward us were indeed weapons. The cannons finally shot our lone missile. They did so almost lazily. The power of their weapons didn't seem to be much greater than our own, despite their bulk. Our sensors showed it was a cruder form of the panda's anti-proton weapons, further supporting my theory of their origins. 
It took them several shots to hit and destroy the missile, so their targeting wasn't that good either. The best news was the big ship was slow. We were losing it, drawing further away with every passing minute. Satisfied that we were no longer in immediate danger of destruction, I ordered my bridge people to stand down, and I turned my attention to our new environment. We had been in this star system for some time, but as we'd been encapsulated inside the Litho's spherical trap, this was the first chance we'd had to look around. As I had deduced, the hollow planet behind us was situated several AU out from a hot white star. If it had been a true planet, it would have been third in line from the star, just as Earth was back home. The abundant radiation pouring off the star wasn't comparable, however. This system burned hotter and brighter than Sol did back home. Four more planets were detected and displayed on our screens over the next half hour, making seven altogether. The closest in two worlds were sun-blasted and dead. The hollow world we'd just escaped from was similar in size and surface composition to Mars, but not much hotter. The next world in line, Planet 4, turned out to be an airless rock with small ice caps, the remaining three worlds were gas giants. Out of all of them, the only interesting planet was the sixth. It was the largest and appeared to be a beautiful green-banded world with a hydrogen-methane atmosphere. None of the planets in the system were what humans would have called life-bearing worlds, though, given the existence of aliens like the Blues and the Lithos, that definition had been expanded. The gas giants also sported many moons, some of which looked to be somewhat more Earth-like and habitable by biotics. I turned my attention away from them for the moment and swung the optics toward the central star again. The closest two planets to the center, one and two, showed some kind of activity. Their surfaces were too hot to get any good readings from infrared, and there wasn't much electrical power, but the radiation plotters showed the planets were crawling with something something that I suspected had taken notice of us. Looks like more litho ships, Adrian said as red icons popped into existence in the holotank. She'd come back to the bridge and now stood watching the data I'd been perusing. I agree, I said. They're lifting off the rocky inner planets. Dozens of markers had now appeared. They rose into space from the two airless worlds, all of them representing enormous ships similar to the one chasing us. This whole system seems infested with lithos, Adrian said. I glanced at her, not sure if the quaver in her voice was indicative of fear or disgust. Maybe it was a little of both. Either way, she didn't seem to be in a diplomatic frame of mind toward our newest alien hosts. Should I call back the bridge crew, Ensign? Hansen asked. They only just went on break, but... They're pretty far off and moving slowly. I think we have a little time, no need to sound the alarm yet. I wanted to give my people a moment to rest, to think we'd escaped, even if we hadn't yet. Hansen frowned back at his console. I could tell he didn't approve, but I didn't much care. What about those snowflakes? Adrian asked. I don't see any. I doubt there will be many in open space, I replied. They are only effective inside an enclosed area. They'd be too easy to run away from. And speaking of running, I've set a course to orbit the central star in a long circle. Hansen said. He'd obviously been listening to us. We can easily keep ahead of them. We need to do more than keep ahead of them, I said. We need to find a place where we can lick our wounds and use our factory to improve our situation. Adrian, could you go to the factory deck and set the system to manufacture more munitions? We're low. We're low on supplies, too, she said. Do I have permission to cannibalize ship components? I glanced at her. Things were bad if we were down to that. Yes, Start with the deck plates and the bulkheads between the smaller holds, and don't get carried away. I'll try to find new supplies for you soon. When she'd gone, I stared at the system represented in the hollow tank. Where can we go? I asked myself quietly. What do you do when surrounded by an implacable enemy? I felt as uneasy as any new leader might. As long as we kept moving, we were all right. But as soon as we stopped, they would close in. Marvin broke in on the ship-to-ship -ship channel, transmitting from Greyhound. He was still tagging behind us. 
There's a comet cloud at the fringe of this system, he said into my ear. Comet cloud? I asked, frowning. He'd obviously been listening in on our bridge chatter, but that was hardly unusual. After all, both our ships had just made a narrow escape, and we were still linked up for a tactical chat. Marvin didn't explain further. I figured he was busy processing all the new data available and still working on the litho translation, so I adjusted the holotank for an even wider, large-scale view. Most star systems had a comet cloud, a mass of hundreds of thousands, even millions of balls of slushy ice and rock, orbiting far beyond the outermost planets. In Earth's solar system, we called this the Oort cloud. You would think that so many would make for a dense group, but space was large enough that they remained thousands of miles from one another. But why would Marvin mention the system's comet cloud? The lithos could chase us out there as well as anywhere. Of course, the farther out we went, the longer it would take them to catch us, and we could use comet material in our factory. But I figured there had to be more to Marvin's suggestion than that. Take us on a spiraling course away from the star, avoiding the lithos, I said to Hansen. Right now we need time to gather information and for Marvin to crack the litho code. And time for me to think of something to do next, I thought to myself. Done, said Hansen. With a few taps on the controls and verbal instructions to the brain box, he set a course, then took his hands off the console and stretched wearily in his chair. Return the crew to a normal watch schedule, I said, still staring at the holotank. The bridge was already half empty, and within minutes, Hansen was asleep in his crash chair. I shook my head. With such long duty shifts, I had to expect compromises between rest and readiness. I let him slumber. I could use some sleep myself, but I felt a need to figure out Marvin's interest in the comet cloud. What might make the comet cloud a safe refuge? Did the lithos avoid comet clouds? I mentally listed all the things lithos seemed to thrive on. Dryness? Check. Vacuum? Check. Hot sunlight? Check. On Tullock 6, where we'd originally encountered them, they were sluggish and primitive. They didn't fire rock missiles or crystal lasers at us. They just tried to grab us, and we'd gotten away. That was a cold world, a long way from the panda sun. The hollow planet we'd found on this side of the ring was hot and had a larger surface area than normal, as it had been blown up like a balloon, sucking in all that radiation and heat from its star. Here in this system, the lithos had been much more dangerous and active. There wasn't much metal in their structures, either. Logic would suggest they could become much more efficient if they simply incorporated dense metallic material to perform the tasks it was suited to. Carrying electricity, armoring, stiffening structures, all the things everyone else used it for. But maybe the metal would interfere with their bizarre metabolism— the lithos seemed to be stuck in a kind of high-tech stone age, unable or unwilling to change. I turned the situation over in my mind. They liked hot, dry, airless, radiated places. Comets were mostly the opposite, wet, cold, full of outgassing and cryovolcanic activity when exposed to the slightest heat. Some of them contained metallic ores, but there was rarely much in the way of heavy radiation. Marvin was right. They wouldn't like comets or any cold, wet world with an atmosphere. But would that be enough to keep them away? Missiles could still chase us down, even if the ships were unwilling to venture so far. Still, if we had enough time, we could devise defenses against those. I looked for a likely candidate, and after hours of computerized searching, I found one. Then I felt a hand on my shoulder and turned to see Adrian looking freshly showered and smelling clean. She was out of her pressure suit, and I liked her that way. I realized I still had my suit on, and a wave of fatigue reminded me how long I'd been on my feet. You need to rest, she said, dropping her hand. The lithos won't catch us for days at the earliest. I will. But, I pointed at my target, this is where we're going. It took me quite a while to find a suitable object. That's a big comet, she said, tapping on the controls to bring it in closer. Forty miles wide? 
We need it big, I replied. I want to set down on the far side, so if the lithos send any missiles our way, they'll have to go all the way around it to hit us. Their missiles will have decelerated by the time they get to us. I also want a comet so large that we can find most of what we need there. Water, ores, volatile gases. We need a lot of supplies. Why this one in particular? Because it's also outbound in a long elliptical orbit. All we have to do is land on it, and we'll keep on going away from the lithos until we decide to come back. I don't think they like comets or the cold at the edges of star systems. They need heat and radiation. Once I explained my reasoning, she tentatively agreed with me. I'll pass this on to the tech team and make sure they keep trying to figure these lithos out. Thanks for handling the techies, I said with a warm smile. That's a really important job. I still need that warrant. I nodded, and then logged her official appointment as a warrant officer, with a date of rank preceding Marvin's. Now you can go clothes shopping. You need a proper uniform. You just made my day, Adrian said. She smiled and touched me on the elbow with concern. No, it's time you went to get some sleep. I stopped arguing and trudged down the passageway to my cabin, there I stripped out of my suit, but didn't bother to go to the officer's showers. On a ship of war like this, only the captain's stateroom had its own facilities. I needed a beer, but I was too tired to go searching for one. I wasn't even sure there were any real beers left aboard. Star Force had never been a dry service, not since my old man liked to knock back a few bottles between battles, but I had no idea of the arrangements aboard this ship. Then I had a thought. There might be a stash in the wardroom, which was the officer's mess and social space. With only a few warrant officers left, there ought to be plenty to drink. That changed my mind. Wearing only boxer shorts, I padded down to the wardroom and rooted around in the small galley until I found a bottle of something German. It went down nicely, so I grabbed three more, downed them all, and then headed back to my cabin with the fifth and sixth in my hands. I was feeling fine again. On the way, I saw Adrian, or maybe I should say she saw me. She'd caught me by surprise, but I didn't care. I was already feeling better than I had all day. I thought you were asleep, she said in a slightly scolding tone. I always have a drink before bed, I said. Do you want to join me? I waggled my beers at her and grinned. Adrian raised an eyebrow. Nice look, she said, glancing down at my boxers. You too, I replied. I put a thumb into my waistband and snapped my shorts. We stared at one another for another second, then she suddenly blushed and pushed past me. I was left with her lingering scent and entirely too many distracted thoughts. I told myself it was just a natural reaction to the stress of combat, a well-known phenomenon. My body was thinking about procreation after facing death. Popping open and slugging down the fifth brew, I marched myself back to my room and collapsed onto my bunk. Fortunately, sleep came soon after. The next morning, I found a factory fresh ensign's working uniform made of smart cloth hanging on my door handle. Once showered, I put it on. It fit perfectly after the smart cloth settled in. I liked the crisp, high collar, and it felt good to wear the symbols of my chosen profession. A military unit wears uniforms to promote cohesiveness, and it needs its leader to look the part. I headed down the passage to Adrian's cabin. Thanks, Miss Turnbull, for the uniform, I said, standing in her doorway. Not coming in, she said, sitting in her spot at the tiny table across from the only chair. She looked sharp in a regulation warrant officer's uniform. It was the first time I'd seen her that way, and I found I liked the look. We can eat in the wardroom, I replied. When confusion and hurt crossed her face, I shrugged apologetically. It's nothing personal. You're a warrant officer under my command now. We can't be spending time much in our cabins together behind closed doors. Bad for morale and discipline. People will assume I favor you because of a special relationship. Nodding sharply, she stood up to assume an approximate version of attention. Thank you, sir. I understand, sir. Will that be all, sir? 
Great, just great. Unlike Olivia, she didn't understand military service. She thought she could just put a uniform on and it would all work out. But every organization had its rules and principles that were dangerous to violate. Dad seemed to be able to get away with such things back during the freewheeling macro wars, but that attitude had bit him in the butt from time to time as well. I'm sorry, I hope you'll understand eventually, I said softly and shut the door. I ate by myself in the wardroom and felt lonely for the first time since this ordeal had started. Academy officers always talked about the weight of command, and now I felt it. I'd started to rely on Adrian as a friend and confidant. What's more, I'd given her what she wanted, the rank to go with the job she was doing. Despite all that, she was mad at me because, surprise, with rank came responsibilities and rules. Thinking about that frustrated me. I couldn't favor her over others. In fact, now I had to keep her at a distance, precisely to stave off any appearance of favoritism. The whole thing might have been a rookie commander mistake. I regretted giving her the rank. I considered going right back and talking her into giving it up. But I didn't. It wasn't going to make either of us any happier at this point. Checking the holotank of the bridge, I could see about forty monster litho ships slowly trailing after us. I wouldn't call it chasing, as they were so slow. But they did have an air of determination about them. They headed in our direction, spreading out as if forming a loose guard. I could see they were attempting to prevent us from doubling back past them. They were trying to drive us away from their worlds. I eyed the outer gas giants and those cold moons full of materials I could use, but they were all too close to the angry, lumbering lithos. Chapter 18 I spent the next hour looking over the star system, wishing I knew more about it. At some point I remembered I had more than one ship under my command. Marvin, I radioed. Is Greyhound in good enough shape to go on a scouting mission? Maybe, he said with evident reluctance. What do you need in order to turn that maybe into a yes? Access to the factory for repairs. I think we can get you fixed up. It wasn't enough for everything the battle cruiser needed, but Greyhound was much smaller. Go ahead and dock. I met Marvin at the airlock connection. He had grown, now comprising modular segments of unknown purpose, he looked more like a segmented insect now, and he'd sprouted fresh appendages as well. New cameras of various sorts, from microscope sized to large vid size, dangled and wormed in the air at the end of snaking stalks. I spotted other input systems, such as microphones and radiation detectors, as well as more manipulative tentacles than I could easily count. He probably massed over a ton now, Though most of his body was so flexible, this did not impede him in his octopus-like crawling. Hello, Captain Riggs. Still trying to butter me up? Several cameras reoriented themselves and took up different positions. No buttering. Now please move aside. I stepped sideways and slid around him into the airlock. What are you doing? He asked, freezing in place. Going aboard Greyhound, I said pleasantly. Why? Marvin, you're a Star Force officer now. Greyhound is a Star Force ship. I'm your commanding officer. You can ask why, but I don't have to answer you. On the other hand, you do have to move out of my way. All his cameras were focused on me now, and I realized that in these close quarters he could probably rip me limb from limb before anyone could help me. I also realized that I was unarmed. Then again, maybe my enhancements would be enough. I'd never engaged a robot in hand-to-hand -hand combat before. I will be happy to escort you around my ship, sir, Marvin said with sudden cheerfulness, his lumbering body reversing direction. I was left with nagging suspicions. What might he be trying to hide? All right, I said. Let's see what you've done with your first command. My fears turned out to be well-founded. Inside, I found the neat, luxurious passageways and rooms had been turned into chambers from a crazy technologist's hell. Even without a factory, Marvin had made more modifications than a dozen mad scientists might have thought of in their twisted minds. 
Cables and pieces of machinery squirmed, attached without apparent rhyme or reason to various surfaces, walls, ceilings, even decking where no human would put anything for fear of tripping. I sighed loudly. Marvin, was all this really necessary? Are we speaking philosophically, or... Let me tell you what is necessary, I said. As a Star Force officer, you must perform the minimum modifications in order to complete the mission, but this ship must remain serviceable for humans. And by the way, what happened to all our stuff? I looked around for my cabin. I'd left some personal things there. I really could use a change of underwear, for instance. Even though the smart cloth I now wore was supposed to obviate the need for it, I liked my boxers. I have preserved your personal belongings intact, Marvin said in an injured tone. What about the food and drinks? I wanted to save our beer and liquor supply for special occasions, I told myself, virtuously. The factory could produce raw drinking alcohol and a low-quality beer, but I could see that an authentic earth drink might become a real treat as our supply dwindled. Our predicament reminded me of an old sea story, where a sailing ship was cut off and had to raid or scavenge for supplies. The most important item to keep in stock was the rum to keep the crew from mutinying. I didn't think we'd have that kind of discipline problem, but people in combat need an outlet. I have kept all consumables in pristine condition, Marvin replied. I recall in particular how your father enjoyed fermented beverages. Would you like to inspect the ship's beer store, sir? That impressed me. Even if Marvin's consideration was just a way to keep me happy, it had worked. I had to give him credit. Thank you. I will check it when we're done. That was very thoughtful. But for now, let's take a look at the staterooms. Marvin froze again, turning his cameras on me. I would advise against that course of action. Why? Because you're in an excellent mood, and I wouldn't wish to spoil it. I sighed heavily. Just show me how to get to the staterooms, I said. There are new crawl spaces and barriers. I can't even find the central lift. You will not be happy. Come on, Marvin. Without another word, he led me through the maze he'd built. I could hardly recognize the inside of the ship anymore. After what seemed like several minutes of wriggling and climbing through passageways that were clearly built for Marvin's new form, but not for mine, we stood before a cabin door. Opening it, I saw something out of a weird vid. Everything had been scrunched together like a 3D puzzle. The ceiling had been lowered, and the various pieces of furniture now seemed to be stuck to the walls wherever they could fit. There was no room to stand, and even if I'd wanted to, I could barely crawl inside to lie down on the bed. On the positive side, it looked like nothing had been damaged permanently. I needed the space, so I did some rearranging, Marvin said. I shrugged. It wasn't so bad. Fine. Just as long as we can put it back the way it was sometime later— are all four staterooms like this? Marvin squirmed some more. I only preserve two this way, one for you and one for your woman. The others are... gone. What do you mean gone, and she's not my woman? I said quickly. Cameras stared at me. I've been observing humanity longer than you've existed, Ensign Cody Riggs. I know the physiological and psychological signs of attachment. Attachment may be as in friendship, but I think it takes a human to know whether another human is his or hers. Marvin performed a tentacle ripple that passed for a shrug. My empirical observations suggest otherwise. Ignoring the stupid robot and his unwelcome empirical observations, I squirmed inside to retrieve my clothing, packing it into a pillowcase, then went and got Adrian's stuff. I noticed a pair of skimpy underwear, but forced myself to shove it all into another pillowcase without thinking about it too much. With the two makeshift sacks over my shoulder, I headed back to Marvin. What else have you done to this ship? I asked. Anything of operational usefulness? I've thickened the ship's armor and improved the efficiency of the magnetic shield. I've also rearranged vital systems to be less vulnerable to damage. The ship's single laser mount has been upgraded with improved sensors, but without access to Valiant's factory, I couldn't perform more significant alterations. I suspect I could at least triple Greyhound's usefulness as a combat auxiliary, given full access to the factory deck. 
unrestricted access to the factory? I considered the idea briefly and came up with a resounding response, which I didn't verbalize. No. Coordinate with Warrant Officer Adrian Turnbull for anything you need from the factory, I said. You're not to use it on your own, except in case of a true life-and-death emergency. I pointed my finger at him accusingly. And don't go bending that principle. She's in charge of all production, and while I'm sure she can give you a few barrels of constructive nanites if you ask nicely enough, you're not getting full control. I don't want our only factory to be diverted towards some crazy experiment of yours. Command accepted, Marvin said. I now realized that when he felt insulted, he deliberately talked like a brain box, like a crewman who exaggerated his yes sir and no sir. He was playing the good cooperative robot. Well, I wasn't buying it. Right now, he was probably trying to lull me into a false sense of security, building up a bank account of goodwill toward the inevitable time when he would go rogue again. I suspected that only the threat of the lithos and his lack of a factory under his control had caused him to follow orders up to this point. Good, I said. Thanks, Marvin. I have what I need. Good job with your ship. Just keep in mind that other Star Force personnel need to be able to use it if you're unavailable or incapacitated. Command accepted, Marvin repeated in a tone of quiet defiance. Apparently he was still sulking. I ignored him and went back aboard Valiant. Marvin followed at a distance. The crew bustled about, and I nodded and smiled at them as I walked through Valiant's passageways. Morale seemed good. We'd gotten out of a tough situation, and under my command, at least we'd only lost a few people. I headed up to the bridge, after checking that everything was all right there, and that we continued to cruise toward our target comet. I spent some time touring the ship. In the big factory space at the center of the battle cruiser, I saw Marvin talking to Adrian. I waved, but she pretended not to notice. I shrugged, figuring she'd get over it. Suddenly, I was confronted by Professor Hoon. As soon as the crustacean saw me, he came scurrying over in his suit. For a moment, I regretted not carrying a sidearm. Waving his lobster claws, he said, You there, offspring of Kyle Riggs. You still have not apologized for your offense against my person. And you have not apologized for assaulting me with your claw. And by the way, I now command this vessel and its occupants, so don't go getting all high and mighty toward me. I'm not a part of your military organization, Hoon replied arrogantly. I have diplomatic immunity as a representative of the Crustacean government. In fact, arrogant seemed to be his only tone. My voice climbed. Your government and your entire race only exist because my father saved all your watery butts. I tolerate you because you're supposed to be smart, and we're going to need everyone to pull his weight. If you're so damned intelligent, why don't you come up with some ideas to improve our capabilities or find a way back home? I took a step forward, and despite the fact that Hoon masked several times what I did, he backed up. Waving his claws, he spun around and scuttled away, burbling. I looked up to see the rest of the tech team watching and trying to suppress grins. Probably Hoon bugged them, too. I didn't see any point in them trying to hide their expressions, unless crustacean suits had software that translated our faces. Maybe they did. The lobsters were intelligent and intuitive. The factory was churning out nanites and more complex equipment at full blast, but it was running low on critical supplies. Quan and his marines were on this deck, wearing their battle suits for extra strength. Adrian had them carrying the last pieces of dead macros and other junk to the maw, like a line of worker ants. I was happy to see everyone pitching in. I walked up to her, and she looked me over coolly. Everything okay? I asked. I could have met with Marvin or with the general situation, but I figured I'd let her answer in her own way. Sure. Everything's perfect, Captain Riggs, sir. Excellent. Here are your personal effects, I said. I handed her the sack of undies I'd retrieved from Greyhound. She looked into the sack, then closed it again suddenly. Maybe there was something embarrassing on top. Give Marvin whatever he needs from the factory within reason to get Greyhound in shape, I told her. I have a new mission for his ship. Aye, aye, Captain, sir, 
she said, still not looking at me. Thank you, Warrant Officer Turnbull, I countered. I thought I saw an eyebrow twitch. When Olivia had done that, she was trying not to laugh. That was good. If Adrian finally decided the situation was amusing, maybe it meant she was getting tired of our little spat or whatever it was we were having. Quitting while I was ahead seemed like the best idea, so I nodded at the technicians and left them to their manufacturing. Back on the bridge, Hansen lounged at the helm with just another non-com on watch. I nodded to him, and he nodded back, warily. Fine job yesterday, I told him, and it was an honest compliment. The man was a crack pilot, and I was happy to have him. I've never seen a better hand at the helm. That was true, too, though possibly just because I had so little experience aboard warships until now. Still, it sounded good. Thanks, he replied, relaxing. I stared at the holotank. They're still chasing us, I said, looking at the forty-odd litho ships that trailed us in slow motion. I wasn't sure what to call them. The size of small dreadnoughts, these flying mountains only had the firepower of cruisers or even destroyers. With their thick, crystalline armor, however, I bet they could absorb an enormous pounding. Simply blowing one of them apart, even with fusion warheads, would take forever. Yes, Hansen agreed. Once we land on the comet, we'll have about three days before they catch up, assuming they keep coming. I'm hoping they don't like the cold. They seem to prefer sunlight. Maybe part of their energy needs come from stellar radiation. It's clear to me they operate more effectively when they're warm. Maybe they'll reach some kind of limit and stop, like hunters who don't want to chase their prey too high into the snowy mountains. Very poetic, sir. I hope you're right. Hansen seemed to think for a moment, then he spoke again. What's the plan? if you don't mind my asking. I looked at him in surprise. Of course I don't mind. You're my XO. You can ask me anything you need to. Turning back to the holotank, I went on. We're going to take as much time as we can to repair and prepare. If they let us, we'll use the factory and the comet materials to build more ships, a bigger force. We need to optimize our weapons against the lithos. That could take months, Hansen objected. That's right. It might take quite a while. His face darkened, but he said nothing. I wondered if the man had been hoping to be home for Christmas. I just wanted to see home at some point in the future. I still didn't know who had killed Olivia, and that was a driving force for me. That thought gave me a pang of regret. I'd been so busy worrying about staying alive, I hadn't had much time to think about my recent loss or how we'd gotten here. It was still possible there was a traitor aboard this ship. If so, they seemed to be lying low. But I hadn't forgotten the past. In time, I was sure I'd figure out how this whole adventure had started. While we build up, I said, Marvin is going to go scouting for us. We haven't found the ring yet. We have to know how to escape this system if things go badly. It might be anywhere, even inside one of the litho planets. We need to find it and eventually figure out a way to pass through it. Why? Hansen asked. We could build up and go back to the panda system with big enough ships to clobber them. Then we can take all the time we need to figure out how to activate the first ring we came through to go home. As I see it, every move we make is taking us farther away into the unknown. Marvin said the ring only went one direction. And you trust the robot? I read up on it today. That ring did originally operate in both directions. Macros came through it and invaded the crustacean world. I thought about that for a moment. I don't entirely trust Marvin, I admitted. But the other scientists haven't contradicted him to my knowledge. I don't think we can beat the lithos either, not head to head. How are we going to fight our way through that planet-sized defensive structure of theirs, the pandas haven't been able to do it. Maybe they don't want to, Hansen said darkly. Why not? You think the pandas made the lithos, right? And once they lost control of them, they turtled up in their own system. If humans were in that situation, we'd never rest 
until we were able to break out and explore. But maybe the pandas are different. Maybe they're content to stay in their own little corner and let the lithos form an impassable barrier keeping them safe. Maybe they don't care about what they unleashed down on the other side of their ring. They're beasts anyway. Creatures that eat each other just to say hello. I rubbed my neck, realizing I could use a haircut. You may be right. But we might have tried to hide if we had a way to beat the macros without losing ships. Right now, it's all speculation. Maybe once Marvin cracks their language, we'll find out more. Hansen eyed me until I found myself frowning at him. What is it now, Chief? I asked him. Do you even want to get back to Earth, Riggs? Maybe you and the robot want to stay out here and have a good time. I almost laughed, but realized he was serious. Of course I want to get home. Are you sure? Maybe you like command so much, you don't want to give it up just yet. It was my turn to frown. That's an unreasonable accusation, Hanson. Sorry, sir. Please accept my apologies. I could tell he didn't mean it, but I accepted his apologies anyway. I took a deep breath and told myself everyone was under a great deal of stress, and that I couldn't expect them all to be happy with someone who was practically a kid in command. Hansen lapsed into silence again, staring at his board. Space travel could be tedious in the great gulfs between planets, though less so than it used to be with our upgraded engines and stabilizers. Valiant was five times as fast as one of my dad's old ships. I kept quiet as well, playing with the holotank, examining everything the sensors had picked up and the brain box had collected into one common picture. Data poured continuously into the ship, with everything represented in three dimensions. The next few days dragged. We landed on the comet and began mining it. This wasn't as exciting as it sounded. The surface of a comet when far, far out in space doesn't even have a tail. There was very little stellar wind out here to damage its icy surface in any way. The comet was cold, dark, and forbidding. The sounds of drilling vibrated through the ship night and day, as drones worked with marines to chew up chunks of ice and minerals and then transport them into the battle cruiser's belly. During these days, which quickly stretched into weeks, we managed to make a lot of repairs and replenish our munitions. Adrian didn't seem to want to talk to me anymore, except about work, even though I'd made a few overtures to test the waters between us. She was all snap and pop, a veritable caricature of a military officer when near me. And it seemed obvious she was rubbing it in. I had no idea what to do except wait for her to get over it. Or maybe she never would. My heart, already heavily scarred, gained a few more stripes. But I couldn't allow myself to care. I had people depending on me for their lives. Beer helped, fortunately, i brought over a sizable ration from Greyhound, and I was hoarding them in my cabin. I shared a few with Quan, no one else. It was different with him. He didn't care about protocol, and he'd known me all my life. But I couldn't do that too often, especially not in front of the others. He was a subordinate, too, after all. He seemed to be spending his off time with the largest woman in the crew, a petty officer by the name of Steiner, who overtopped me by at least two inches. Well, more power to him. I was returning to my cabin after drinking with the big man when a feminine figure rounded a corner and bumped into me. It was Dr. Kalu, one of the civilian scientists. She was West African with exotic eyes and dusky skin. I grabbed her to keep from falling over. I was more than a little bevved up, as Adrian liked to say. Her arms went around me to hold herself up, and I suddenly became aware of her body pressed up against me. In one of those weird moments that only happen late at night when tired, drunk, or both, we didn't let go of each other right away. So we just stood there. Mmm, hello, Captain Riggs, she said, looking into my face. Dr. Kalu was sleek and tall. She had curves I found unusual and interesting. More than once I'd caught her staring at me, but then again lots of women had done that throughout my life. I was semi-famous, after all. 
I'd gotten used to it. She was so close and warm, and I'd denied myself so long. Without thinking, I kissed her. Or maybe she kissed me. Soon we were full-blown making out, until a crewman crossed the end of the passageway. Fortunately, he seemed not to notice us in the dimness of the night cycle. I broke the clinch. We can't do this out here, I said. Then let's go to your cabin. She ran her hand up under my tunic, onto my naked back, surging my blood to all sorts of interesting places. Yeah, let's. Befuddled, I stumbled down the corridor toward my cabin, holding the woman close to me. Unfortunately, as we passed Adrian's door, I guess our bumping along the wall was too loud. The portal opened, and I heard Adrian gasp. She stepped into the passage, staring at us. Kalu smirked and kissed my ear. Come on, Cody, she said, tugging me toward my cabin. Adrian's face went white. I could see it even in the dim light. Abruptly, my higher functions took over, and I pushed the sexy scientist away. That will be all, Dr. Kalu. Thank you for your assistance. I straightened my uniform as Adrian continued to stare at me. Sorry, a bit tipsy. Bumped into her, I said lamely. Hell, that excuse had gotten me out of some jams before. Kalu looked from me to Adrian and back again, snorted with disdain and then turned to stalk away. You're piss drunk again, Adrian accused. It's not a crime. Neither is socializing with civilians. What do you care anyway, Miss Yes Sir, No Sir? Socializing, is that what you call it? Her expression could have frozen fire. Whatever, I'm going to bed, alone. I turned my back on her, not wanting to deal with any more crap. It wasn't like she was my girlfriend or anything. She wasn't Olivia. When I reached my cabin, I fell into my bunk and slept. From then on, Adrian took great pains to avoid me, and I didn't bother to force the issue. She'd have to learn to deal with me as I was, not as she wished me to be. I wasn't some plaster saint. If I wanted to knock back a few and have some fun with a civilian, what business was it of hers? She'd wanted to be in Star Force, after all. It wasn't my fault. That meant she had to follow the rules. Only later, when I had thought about it, did I realize it wasn't luck that Kalu had just happened to run into me there. The woman had been stalking me like prey. That realization cooled my desire for her. She made it clear on several later occasions that she would like to pick up where we'd left off, but my interest had soured. I didn't want to be anyone's trophy, the alpha male prize in a small sexual pool. I guess old Cody Riggs was destined to never get any. There just weren't many other civilian women aboard, and I declared that Star Force females were out of bounds. The crew repaired Greyhound and upgraded her more or less as Marvin wanted. I'd had most of the food and drink brought aboard Valiant, the liquor was well packed in boxes and locked in the former captain's cabin with only me allowed inside. Then I sent the robot in his ship to find the other ring. He took the long way around, avoiding the inner planets. First he paused near several of the largest asteroids in the system. These monster rocks were almost planets being hundreds of miles in diameter. I wanted to know whether the lithos were everywhere or only on the larger bodies. Marvin didn't find any evidence of infestation. I'd been worried that the silico nanites had been spread like dust throughout the star system, seeding and growing on the surface of every world. The science team decided, after long study, that it was probable that the pandas had created the lithos and seeded them here in this system. Once the lithos had gained sentience, they'd spread themselves around deliberately, to the lithos, the asteroids were cold, unpleasant islands, so they hadn't colonized them. Back in home space around Earth, the rings connecting our local systems had seemed to conform to a pattern. One ring would be near a star and one far away. In the panda system, both were middling far, but that was the only anomaly we'd found. Well, that plus the third ring in the Thor system— Maybe there were more of the rings inside planets and other systems, and we simply hadn't found them yet. In any case, here in the Lithos system, I thought the other ring would most likely be farther out. 
So I told Marvin to work his way from the outside sunward, starting with the farthest gas giant and its moons. Once we'd had a chance to chart the stars, we figured out we were 550 light years from Earth at a star with nothing but a catalog number. I declared a naming contest with the crew nominating and then voting on the ones they liked best. Matterhorn won out, I suppose because of the flying mountains. I wondered if Hansen was right after all, since this star system was farther away than the last one was. Maybe we should turn and try to fight our way back to the Matterhorn ring where we'd arrived. Either way, I had to do what my father had done repeatedly during the Macro Wars, build a new fleet and use it to get the job done. But before Marvin reached Matterhorn 7, the outermost planet in the system, the Lithos made their move. Chapter 19 We'd been in the Matterhorn system for weeks before the Lithos finally decided they'd had enough of their uninvited guests and decided to crush us once and for all. They're launching, sir, Hansen said, sitting bolt upright. Got it, I replied, staring at the red pinpricks that had appeared around the Litho ships. First, dozens sparked into existence, then hundreds, and then thousands. I could hardly believe my eyes. How can they have so many missiles? Maybe their ships are also their factories, Hansen suggested. That makes sense. If their silico nanites permeate everything, then possibly they can manufacture things on the spot. Maybe they move materials around a bit, but they aren't like us, with everything in discrete packages and mechanisms. They're more like a massive substance with a collective mind. Maybe each flying mountain is some kind of single colony creature. Or colony planet. Right, Whatever silicon structure they invade, it becomes completely infected. Everything ends up as part of the lithos, except for the things they don't like. Too much water, too cold, and no significant radiation. Hansen nodded. So, they've been making missiles. Or maybe I should say calving them off of their substance. We watched in growing tension, despite our factual discussion. Hansen had already sounded the alarm, summoning personnel to their battle stations, even though the threat was far away. I frowned briefly as I hadn't given him that order. It was a reasonable thing to do, however, so I let it go. The lithos continued launching. There were somewhere above 2,500 missiles now, more than enough, but they weren't stopping. Forget about how they did it, I said. Why did they choose to launch now? Because they figure they have enough to beat us? Maybe. I adjusted the holotank. This show's intercept in ten hours, and look, the ships aren't following the missiles. Conserving energy? I stared, watching the clouds of missiles. It appeared every litho ship had launched at least a hundred, meaning a total of over four thousand headed our way. What was more remarkable was that each one was hardly smaller than our battle cruiser. So big, my blood ran cold. Those can't be missiles. Hansen stood up to join me at the holotank. What are they, then? Small attack ships? But the lithos build everything to huge scale, even bigger than the macros. How likely is it a ship of that size even has a ranged weapon? I don't know. Get all the sensors you can on a couple of them. I turned to Hansen. We have ten hours until they arrive. Get the analysts working on it. For about ten seconds, I pondered what the lithos could be up to. I didn't like anything my mind came up with. What are you weird bastards going to do? I muttered. Hansen, we're lifting off. Get all the mining equipment aboard and stowed. You have half an hour. And send Marvin a query to see if he has made any progress on their language. Marvin didn't answer our messages. He seemed to be continuing the scouting mission I'd given him, but wouldn't respond. Maybe he was working on an unauthorized experiment and thought radio silence equated to invisibility, or maybe he simply had nothing to say. A few hours later, we had good visuals and readings on the missile ships. Shaped like triangular crystal arrowheads, they appeared to be symmetrical and have no weapon ports or sensors. We detected enough radioactives aboard to make atomic bombs, but they had chemical rockets for boosters and repellers for normal mobility. Maybe they were simply missiles after all. 
but I had a feeling the lithos still had some surprises in store. The missiles caught up to us with alarming speed. They were significantly faster than the battleships that had fired them. As an experiment, we flew away from the comet, but without running at flank speed in a panic. Not yet. I wanted to see if they simply adjusted to follow us like the snowflakes, or if they anticipated us like the panda missiles. Surprisingly, they did neither. They stayed on course directly toward the comet we just left behind. Because of their huge size, the missiles could slam themselves into the floating ice ball before detonating. Subsurface blasts would blow out great chunks, and the heat of the atomic fires would melt and crack the ice. That prediction of destruction bothered me because I still didn't understand it. After all, if they broke the comet up, we could just go on to another comet and then another. Then I remember the numbers and really consider them. Valiant, I said to the brain box. Approximately how many litho missiles will it take to break our target comet into pieces less than one mile in diameter? Give me an estimate within 10% accuracy. I waited almost a full second before I got an answer. I presumed the brain box was incorporating a lot of variables and running millions, if not billions, of modeling runs. Eventually, it gave me its best guess. Approximately 59. 59 into 4,000. That meant the missile swarm could follow us and break up almost 70 comets before they were all expended. The lithos hadn't even needed to target us, I realized. They knew we could outrun their missiles. They just planned to dog our heels and take away all our materials— like cavalry harrying a force they could not directly beat, they would raise our potential food supplies, the equivalent of burning barns and poisoning wells. Long before they ran out of missiles, we would run out of fuel if we merely kept searching near the edge of the Matterhorn system. If we were to have a chance of surviving their attack, I had to do something about those missiles. Blowing them up with nukes would take materials to build missiles and warheads, but to get the materials... We needed missiles and warheads. It made for a conundrum. How are we going to get rid of the missiles or gain enough time to set down and mine more comets, or maybe mine an asteroid? I asked out loud. Maybe we don't have to, Adrian said coolly from my elbow. I started, not having heard her come up close to me because I was so deep in thought. What do you mean? I asked without turning to look. I could see her face reflected in the polymers of the holotank, and I tried to determine what her expression might be. Distorted by the curvature and the varying lights in the background, as well as the glowing nanites inside the tank itself, I couldn't tell for sure. As long as we stay ahead of them, we have nothing to fear, she said. I know you want to keep mining that big comet, both for access to resources and for hiding behind it. But what if we think smaller? Think smaller? If the chunk was small, we could grab it and keep going. If it was the right size, we might even be able to push it along with us, staying ahead of the lithos. My mind broke free of its circular paralysis. Adrian had given me a paradigm shift. I'd been thinking big, but she was right. Big comets were big targets. A lot of interesting things could be done with small ones. That also gave me other ideas. Hanson, do you know how they're targeting us? Is it active radar like the panda missiles? Hansen shook his head. Nothing active. If I had to guess, I'd say heat or radiation, probably the latter. With lots of mass, it becomes easier to detect radiation. The biggest ground-based detectors use hundreds or even thousands of tons of various materials. That much mass is a piece of cake to these flying mountains or even their huge missiles. Okay, Warrant Officer Turnbull, I want you to produce a radiation source that mimics our signature. Put it on a simple drone and soft land it back on our comet. At the same time you launch it, take measures to reduce our own gamma and neutron output. Shield our reactors, our nuclear warheads, anything that radiates. Adrian turned to look at me, but I still didn't want to risk meeting her eyes. That's a good idea, Captain, she said with some slight warmth in her voice. You're making a decoy flare, something to draw off the missiles. Exactly, and have another one ready. If we're lucky, we'll disappear entirely to them in the explosions. They'll lose us and become confused by the fallout going in all directions. We'll just fade into the background like a diving submarine. And if not? 
I looked at her. Then we'll do it again and again, until they either lose us or they've run out of missiles. I'll get right on it, Captain, she said. Then she was gone, leaving an empty space beside me that I could feel. Hansen, I said, find us a comet chunk out here between a fifth and a half the ship's mass, and set up an intercept to take it aboard. I addressed the brain box next. Valiant, we need to reconfigure the ship to capture such a piece and bring it safely aboard, either whole or in stages. After almost an hour of discussion back and forth with the ship's brain, we worked out a modification that should do what I wanted. Hansen found a target beyond the big comet, which was coming up quickly. An hour later, Adrian reported the drones were ready just in time. Launch one as soon as you can, I told her. Five minutes later, I saw a green dot in the holotank detach itself from us and decelerate at heavy G's for a landing on the comet. We diverged by only the barest fraction of a degree, just enough to slide by the big ball of ice. As soon as we were past, we curved slightly again to put ourselves behind it, hidden from the litho missiles. We also turned around and began to decelerate with repellers only. I wanted no engine flare to mark us. We could still see some of the litho missiles because they were spread out. Some of them had a line of sight on us, but hopefully they were fixed on the decoy. With our increasing shielding, we hoped they would lose us among the pinpoint stars in the background. Hours passed. Here they come, I said as the holotank showed the leading missiles reaching the big comet. The main screen flashed, then darkened, as the system compensated for the blasts whiting out our view. Full deceleration! I ordered, knowing that for as long as the detonations went on, the lithos wouldn't be able to see through to us. Get us lined up on that small comet. On it, Hansen said, his hands gripping the controls as we shook under heavy deceleration. In the holotank, missile after missile slammed into the big comet, spreading billions of tons of irradiated and vaporized mass in all directions, the perfect screen for our activities. I wished we had a better view of the destruction of the ball of ice, but the explosions made that impossible. Still, our sensors could count detonations, and at forty, I ordered, Reduce braking! Use only repellers! I wanted our engine signature to be gone by the time the lithos stopped pounding the comet. Repellers only, aye, Hansen said. Rendezvous with our chunk of junk in forty-seven minutes. Excellent. Miss Turnbull, pick out another big comet and send a drone to it. Soon, another decoy was on its way. The explosion ceased at 51, which made me glad I'd stopped the braking early. On the other hand, that was fewer than we had predicted. Tricking the missiles into suiciding against decoys was going to take a long, long time. They could destroy 80 comets at that rate before running out. Then the cloud of missiles continued by and through the debris of the comet. I held my breath as they passed the explosion zone, cruising straight forward in our general direction. Waiting, waiting. I breathed again as I saw them turn slightly to follow the decoy. My plan was working. Half an hour later, we pulled up quietly and carefully to the small comet drifting in the direction we were going. Tiny, really, it still massed a quarter of the size of my battle cruiser. I had programmed the holotank for a close up representation of our rendezvous. Valiant now sported a spidery scoop in front, a kind of basket on the prow that would half enclose the ball of ice and minerals. Nosing forward, Hansen scooped our target up and slowly applied repeller thrust to keep it pinned against the ship. Unfortunately, the small comets weren't dense enough to hold much metal. They were mostly fluffy ice with just enough dirt inside to give our factory a diet meal before a lot of processing, it was like eating cotton candy. It was hard to get full. While the ship digested tidbits, I ordered Quan to take some Marines out on the hull in battle suits and start carefully cutting one-ton chunks free. That sped up the process. In their suits, the Marines were strong enough to roll or carry these ice boulders into chutes. Grinders would break them up further. After that, they would be fed into the factory. Keep making decoy drones, I told Adrian over the intercom. Get eight or ten ready. After that, the priority is fuel, food, and water. Then, repairs and more drones. Hours turned into days of routine. 
Adrian and I began to eat together in the wardroom again, and tensions eased between us, but I still felt like she was holding something against me. I found that exasperating, since I couldn't think of what I'd done that was improper. She couldn't have it both ways, being a warrant officer under my command and my close friend at the same time. And she didn't have any right to interfere with what little action I was likely to get from other women. Despite all my misgivings, I found myself enjoying her company and seeking it out. I hoped she'd eventually start to understand how things had to work. My personal feelings, whatever they were or might be, had to be secondary to command and survival. Besides, I hadn't really sorted out how I felt about her, or even how I should feel about her after her sister had died. Mostly, I tried not to think about it. I told myself it had to be easier for her. If she liked me, she could hardly feel strange about it, as she'd barely known me before her sister died. To me, however, everything about her reminded me of Olivia. Every time I started to feel normal, I would suddenly be thrown off as Adrian said or did something that caused a blurring echo in my mind. I knew it would be a long time before I could see only the living girl in front of me. Now that we had the materials coming in from the various comets, I made sure the enlisted mess was stocked with basic fake beer. It wasn't very good coming right out of the factory, but with Quan in charge of rationing it and reining in any troublemakers, it provided a welcome diversion. It also made me feel a lot less guilty about drinking the stores of the good stuff locked in the dead captain's cabin, which had become my own personal storeroom. Whenever I wanted some real privacy, I would shut myself in there, drink, and think, with only the brain box able to get a hold of me directly. Many times I considered contacting Kalu and inviting her in, if she would still have me. But something always stopped me. In such a small, closed environment as this ship, some things couldn't be undone. Greyhound and Valiant both kept radio silence, to ensure the lithos did not reacquire us on their sensors. Marvin was approaching Matterhorn 7, the outermost, many-mooned, green gas giant, and he had done something to his ship to make it even harder to track than before. We only knew where he was because we'd kept a telescope automatically focused on him from the time he'd left, with orders to Valiant's brain box to make sure we didn't lose the visual. The litho missiles didn't get any smarter, so we kept our routine of decoys, their launches hidden behind the explosions of each comet in turn. I thought about sending several decoys off at once just to simplify our lives, but that might have provided the enemy a clue that they weren't really following us out into deep space after all. I wanted them to see what they expected. Hansen got good at grabbing chunks of materials. Some were icy like comets. Some contained more metals and rock, which we desperately needed. What we weren't finding were a lot of radioactives. The factory could manufacture enough for the decoys by bombarding metals with radiation, creating isotopes with short half-lives. But those were useless for making nuclear bombs. Nukes needed stable uranium or plutonium to trigger the reaction that gave them their explosive power. We ended up with a completely repaired, fully stocked ship, except for the warheads for our missiles. Smaller ones could be substituted made of overloaded fusion generators, simpler versions of a marine suit's suicide bomb. But I wanted the real thing, and I wasn't sure how to get it. Forty or so litho ships still waited between us and the system's sun, daring us to turn and come back. Their position was inside the stellar orbit of the gas giants, so I hoped we could eventually swing around and approach through the most far-flung planets. Their moons would provide rich sources of everything. If we did show ourselves, however, nothing would stop them from launching another few thousand missiles, driving us away again. We were behind the power curve and needed a solution that allowed us to get ahead of it, or something to cleverly counter their tactics. One night, while I dozed in my cabin, thinking about who had planted that bomb and killed Olivia two months ago, an idea occurred to me. Chapter 20 Cryo what? Adrian asked. 
For the first time since this whole adventure had started, I was doing something I hated. I was holding a formal meeting. We had the time, and I needed technical input, so it seemed like a good idea. Still, I kept it small. Nothing was worse than a meeting with too many participants and a bored audience encircling them. Along with Adrian, we had Hansen and the senior Star Force ship's engineer, a woman named Sakura. She was a computer specialist, but had a reputation of being excellent with all forms of equipment. Moon-faced and stocky with straight black hair and a classic Asian look, her appearance seemed to match her reputation. She was older, severe, and never smiled, but I found her interesting nonetheless. I also invited the lobster, Hoon. I figured it might be a good time to mend fences with the crustacean, as my idea involved solving a scientific and technical problem. Cryo-volcanoes, I replied. As I understand it, if an icy moon orbits a planet quickly enough, tidal forces will create heat and pressure that liquefy frozen water and other fluids such as methane and ammonia. This creates pockets of liquid that form geysers as the stuff is forced upward through holes and cracks. Your verbiage is imprecise and unsophisticated, Hoon said. I stared at him and leaned slightly forward in my chair until he went on. However, he continued, your statement is generally accurate. I wondered if he'd taken my stare as a threat. If so, it had worked. The arrogant lobster was starting to learn how to control his insulting manner at least a little. That was all I wanted, prickly and annoying, I could handle that. If I wanted more, sheer crazy obstinance, for example, well, I already had Marvin. Thanks. Now, I turned to Sakura, can you reconfigure the ship for that kind of environment? Extreme cold? She drew together her shoulders as if she'd felt the temperature drop in the room. I believe so. We'll need to manufacture some really effective insulation, and then there's the energy consumption to consider. But we can do it, right? Sakura nodded. Yes, sir. I liked that she didn't throw a bunch of technical bullshit at me. She'd simply told me what she thought. Then that's our next priority, I said as I turned to Adrian. Please help her, Adrian. See if you can work together to turn this ship into a cryo-submarine. If the lithos hate cold liquid, then we want to be where there's plenty of it. Of course, if we can find a place where the liquid is actually water, and it's only as cold as Earth's Arctic, that would be a real plus. What's the point of this? Hansen asked. If we can find the right environment, the water will shield us from all detection. It will also deter the lithos from following us even if they know we're there. And if we can set up a cozy underwater hideaway, we should be able to mine the sea floor for what we want. But what do we want? Adrian asked. Other than radioactives, we already have everything we need. Eventually, though, people are going to get antsy. Without an immediate crisis, this ship is going to seem smaller and smaller. Are you planning on setting up some kind of colony? Her expression told me she didn't like the idea. Not a colony, no, but a temporary base would be very useful. How would it be useful? I still want to know, said Hansen. To do what Star Force always did back in the macro wars, back when my father defended Earth, even when the old nations tried to screw him at every turn. Back when he commanded expeditions into neighboring systems so that he could fight the macros on their doorsteps instead of ours. I smiled confidently, knocking my knuckles on the table with a grin. We're going to build a fleet. The others chewed this over for a moment. I wondered from whom the first objection would come. I would have to put my money on Hansen, but he looked interested, even eager. I supposed he figured he would end up in command of a ship and could thus get away from me. Adrian nodded thoughtfully, as if already planning how she would carry out the expansion of her responsibilities. Hoon I couldn't read, but fortunately he spoke up. I believe this idea has merit. Of course it must be developed. Studies must be made and algorithms written. There is much work to do. For the first time you have favorably impressed me, Captain Cody Riggs. You have recognized the inherent superiority of the hydrological environment over the atmospheric. There is hope for you yet. My first impulse was to boot him again, but I held my temper. 
in Hoon's stalked eyes, I'd just made a concession to his point of view. It was no big deal to me what he believed as long as he made himself useful. Now that I thought about it, I was sure he'd be extremely helpful. Crustaceans thrived in cold earth waters. Maine and Newfoundland were famous for their lobster and Alaska for its crab. Hoon might even be able to take off his suit and enjoy the native environment directly. And if he was too much of a pain in the ass, I would have some leverage. As with Marvin, I only had to know how to get a lever on him to get him to work with me. I appreciate your point of view, Professor Hoon, Sakura said. But if we make more ships, where are we going to get crews? When my father first formed Star Force, there was only one crewman per ship. Did you know that, Warren Officer Sakura? When she shook her head no, I went on. Later, the ships usually had three to six crew members, with everything else being handled by the brain box. In fact, the squads or platoons of Marines usually outnumbered the fleet personnel. It's only in the last 20 years with the rise of a typical military bureaucracy that we now have ships like this one, which started out with, what, 80-some people aboard? Small crews sound good in theory, Sakura replied. But we only have two real engineers, three scientists plus Hoon, two trained helmsmen, and a couple of pinnace pilots. I wanted to roll my eyes, but smiled instead. She wasn't getting it. We'll have to cross-train crew and marines as pilots and gunners, I said. Devise some aptitude tests. Clone brain boxes for every ship, turret, and suit. Automate as many functions as possible. A warship might be more effective with lots of humans to direct the nano brains, but I think with crews of three or so, we can achieve enough efficiency to make building a fleet worthwhile. We need the firepower. We need the redundancy. Right now, all our eggs are in one basket, or two if you count Greyhound. That's not correct, Hoon snapped. My eggs are not in any baskets, but are instead. He suddenly cut himself off and continued. Excuse me, my translator appears to have momentarily malfunctioned. I couldn't help myself. I laughed. So your technology isn't as perfect as you think it is? Uncharacteristically, Hoon didn't answer, but merely folded his large claws and settled back on his walking legs. We're going back to the roots of fleet, huh? Hansen asked, suddenly wistful. I joined up near the end of the macro wars, you know. I was a helmsman in the dead sun action on a six-man ship. Things were different then. They'll be different now, I said, with more confidence than I felt. We'll keep Valiant with a large crew by our new standards, plus a couple dozen civilians and marines. It will be the flagship. Sakura said, Why not just expand this battlecruiser, or convert it into an even bigger ship, a battleship? With enough time and materials, we can do it. I could see she still did not like the idea of breaking up the crew. I spread my hands in a gesture meant to indicate a reasonable attitude. I'll tell you what. You get all the scientists, engineers, and representatives from the crew and come up with two proposals, big ship and small ships. Take your time. Figure out all the pros and cons. Then I'll decide which is best. They nodded and looked slightly happier. I hoped I'd taken the right course. It was my intention to delegate work and make the decisions, but I needed them to carry out my plans. I left the meeting very satisfied with the group. It took more than two weeks, but we finally lured all the litho missiles to their deaths by getting farther and farther beyond the edge of the system and incidentally curving around the star and back, close to the orbits of Matterhorn 6 and 7. During this time I watched as Marvin carefully scouted Matterhorn 7 and its several dozen moons. Looking for the ring to the next system was the top priority I'd given him, along with the secondary mission of gathering any information that might be useful. I hoped he hadn't gotten bogged down in exploring just for fun. Once the litho missiles were gone and I was fairly certain we hadn't been detected, I had Sakura set up a low-powered communications laser and sent Marvin a message, telling him the kind of place I was looking for and ordering him to report back to me using the same technique. Greyhound didn't have a ring-based communication system as it was a civilian ship, but as long as we were both in deep space with no enemy in the background— this method would be completely secure. When the response came back, the news was a mixture of good and bad. Marvin had located another litho enclave on an airless rocky moon circling Matterhorn 7, 
the greenish, outermost gas giant. By calculating its orbital velocity against its size, Marvin pointed out that this body had an extremely low density for its volume and a higher temperature than normal. Put another way, it was too big for the way its mass acted and too hot. This made a very good case for it being hollow and colonized by lithos. And unless the lithos had a special love of building hollow planets, it likely contained the ring we were seeking. I stared carefully at the sensory reports coming from that moon for long hours, but never got much information out of them. Still, I believed the ring was in there, like a prize stuck in the middle of a chocolate egg. Building a containment sphere around a ring was a novel twist on a battle station, but the lithos apparently had the power to reshape whole planets. Probably it took the lithos decades or longer, but if their entire race consisted of hives of cooperatives of silicon nanites, terraforming was probably the equivalent of building roads and bridges for us, just something they did to improve their living space. I had to assume the lithos were smart enough to learn from our breakout at Matterhorn 3. In the weeks we'd been running and lurking, repairing and planning, they would have been preparing as well. The last time we'd surprised them. They hadn't anticipated a new player entering their system from the panda system. They had to expect we would make a play to get out via one of the rings. This time, they would be ready. There was no way we were going to make it through their defenses without reconnaissance, clever planning, and figuring out some way to surprise the lithos. We also needed the fleet I envisioned. I didn't like the one big ship approach, but I was willing to listen to my people. Dad had told me that sometimes he had already made up his mind what to do, but he'd made a show of considering every viewpoint just to make the dissenters feel better. My old man was a cynical guy, I had to admit, but most of the time he was right. Marvin also located a place that looked to be tailor-made for us to hide within, a cold-water moon orbiting the gas giant Matterhorn 6, which was nearest its closest approach to Matterhorn 7 at the moment. Of course, that meant the two Jovian planets were still several AU away from each other, hundreds of millions of miles, but relatively close in interplanetary terms. Matterhorn 6 was enormous, larger even than Jupiter back home, and was therefore hotter. Its gravity was so great that some low-grade natural fusion was probably going on near its core. In other words, it was almost a sun by itself. Should it ever get close enough to one of its neighboring gas planets to collide, the resulting combination would probably be massive enough to ignite into a small companion star. Because of this, the moons of Matterhorn 6 were warmer than one would expect this far out in the system. Rather than temperatures in the minus 200s, the moons had a surface temperature of around minus 50 Celsius on average, and one of the close-in icy bodies had enough tidal heating to average just below freezing. It had huge water ice caps and a narrow band of freezing cold sea around its equator. Deep in the seas, the temperature was almost warm. When Hoon saw the data, he declared it nearly perfect and even comfortable for his race, depending on what elements might be dissolved in the seawater. If the radiation levels weren't too high, it was a habitable world for crustaceans. Sakura was happy as well. From her point of view, freezing H2O was a lot easier to deal with than cryogenic liquid methane. Really, it would only be a little worse than what a deep-diving submarine had to deal with back home. Hoon actually volunteered to advise us on underwater matters, and I was feeling pretty optimistic. The trick was going to be getting there. Chapter 21 we floated silently through interstellar space with all emanations shielded. Sakura had put the new insulation in place inside the hull, which reduced our heat signature. Aimed in a carefully calculated arc, we set our course for the icy inner moon of Matterhorn 6. Like a reaver on a misted sea, we sailed on unpowered, hoping the lithos could not see us even as we neared the planet. Their forty ships had spread out after they'd lost track of us, but still patrolled in the orbital path of Matterhorn 7. 
They were smart enough to know how far we could have gotten and from what direction we would come if we decided to backtrack. Without the ability to use active sensors, we used the brain boxes combined with people working overtime on telescopes, heat detectors, and radiation monitors. My greatest fear was getting noticed too early, before we could make a mad dash for the cold water. I rubbed my eyes constantly as they itched from too many hours of staring into glowing screens. One of the many benefits to enhanced healing was the ability to cause yourself minor irritations and even damage, only to have the nanites in your blood dutifully fix the problem. I knew marines who had gotten into bad habits, chewing nails and the like, depending on their nano friends to heal them again and again before it became a problem. I could tell Hansen felt like telling me to chill out, but I was as tense as a cat sneaking past a guard dog. Make that 40 guard dogs. We almost made it to Matterhorn 6. The planet loomed large on every screen, dwarfing any planet I'd ever visited. But three quarters of the way there, I saw a change in the status of the patrolling litho fleet. First, the nearest litho cruiser turned ponderously in our direction. Soon others followed suit, as the word of our presence spread across the system. We've been spotted, I said to Hansen. Punch it. He didn't bother to reply, he just pushed the throttles smoothly to the stops. I felt my weight shift as the G's leaked through our stabilizers, the big modified engines shoving us forward. Valiant really wasn't too much faster now than she had been, because we'd fattened up with stored supplies and spare parts, not to mention extra shield generators, gravity plates, and processing gear for raw materials. Now I wondered if that would come back to haunt us. Our estimated time of arrival on the moon dropped from six hours to two. We couldn't make it faster because every minute we spent accelerating, we'd have to decelerate at the end. It's all right, Hansen said confidently. Those tubs of theirs are way too slow to catch us. Spread out as they are, not many of their missiles will either. If I was superstitious, I'd say you just jinxed us, I replied. Shit, what's this? Hansen said not a minute later. His exclamation drew my eyes to the holotank. The nearest litho ships seemed to be coming apart. I'd expected missile launch, but this looked like something different. Instead of calving off their usual spearhead-shaped repeller projectiles, they seemed to be dividing themselves into pieces of approximately equal size. They were smaller than we were, but bigger than a Star Force missile. I'd call them fighters. Shit, Hansen barked again as he saw how quickly they were speeding up. They're faster than we are. I guess we underestimated them, I said, sounding calm. Only I knew I was faking it. What would we have done in their place? Faced with an enemy that can outrun and outmaneuver us, we would have tried to match them in capabilities, right? Right. Hampson grimly tapped at his console, probably trying to squeeze out some extra speed. They built faster weapons. They're going to reach us just short of the moon, and we'll be decelerating. This isn't going to be fun. That might work to our advantage. It depends on whether they're going to take one pass and fly by, or decelerate along with us. Can we get more speed? If we shed some mass, he replied. Much as I hated to do it, he was right. We had to lighten the ship, allowing our engine power to push less ship and thus do it faster. Sakura, I called on the command channel. We have to dump some mass. Get Quan and his marines to help you jettison anything we can spare. Water, metals, other raw materials, anything we'll be able to mine out of the seafloor. If we're going to fire any missiles, Hansen said, we might as well do it early. That's mass, too. Good point, but... I stared at the holotank. Each of those forty ships has broken up into at least forty fighters. That means we have sixteen hundred of them on our asses. I vacillated a moment and then said, Go ahead and target the two nearest clusters. They haven't spread out too much. Let's see how they deal with nukes. Firing. Two tracks curved away from us and headed back toward the pursuing fighter squadrons. I paced for the tense minutes it took the missiles to reach their targets. Detonate them short of the litho's predicted anti-proton beam range. I set the holotank to show me that distance and watched as the first missile approached the leading fighter group. Suddenly, beams from the fighters lanced out altogether, spearing the missile from much farther away than I'd expected. 
I stared at the readout for a moment, querying the sensor data. Those weren't anti-proton beams. They were lasers. No wonder they could reach much farther. Send a signal to blow the second missile beyond the new range. Done, Hansen said. This time, our nuke detonated with a spectacular explosion, but from much farther away. When the blast cleared, I saw that three of the fighters looked like they had been knocked out, but the rest came on. At least we know we can hurt them, he said. One of our few missiles for three fighters is a losing ratio. It's also bad news they have adapted their weaponry to make it more effective against us. They're fast learners, Hansen said. Apparently, that means we have to be even faster. How's the ship's mass looking? We've dropped a thousand tons, but I'd like to see at least two hundred tons more. With those new lasers, we'll be in range before we can splash down. I'd rather not have to land in the water under fire. Agreed. I contacted Sakura again. How much more mass can we dump? Everything easy is already gone, she replied. Now all we have are manufactured goods. We need to shed 200 more tons, and the sooner the better. Start with the extra shield generators and any drones we have left. We won't need those. There's no way we have 200 tons more to dump, Sakura protested. Do the best you can. Rip out non-essential lab equipment, half the toilets, the mess tables, bunks, whatever. Rigs out. Yes, Captain, Sakura said woodenly. Had there been a hint of resentment in her voice? It seemed like such a minor thing. Maybe she really valued her lab equipment. I turned back to Hansen. Fire off the rest of the missiles except one. Target the nearest group, and have the controllers try to get at least one in close before detonation to wipe out that group. That will get rid of tonnage and buy us a few more minutes. My mind quickly moved on to bigger concerns. All but one of our nine remaining full-up nuclear missiles soon left the rails, curving back around to come in all at once at the nearest enemy fighter group. With several minutes to see our weapons coming, the enemy spread out, which made their point defense less effective, but also reduced the number of fighters we could catch in one blast. Still, we got three of our missiles into effective range, sacrificing the others to do it, and nearly wiped out that squadron, leaving only two operational litho fighters. Those didn't worry me because our heavy lasers far outranged them. Even our secondary batteries hit harder and reached farther. Only in great numbers could they beat us. Are we going to make it? I asked. Not quite, but a lot fewer of them will get shots at us before we get there. Hansen furrowed his eyebrows. It's going to be rough. Rough we can handle. This ship will make it through. I really did believe that even though I was speaking for the sake of the bridge crew and anyone else who might hear my words. For a crewman, one of the perks of standing watch of the bridge was to be the bearer of rumor, known in fleet as Scuttlebutt. When off shift, most headed for the mess to eat where they invariably found a ready audience to tell what was happening in the ship's nerve center. Smart non-coms kept their fingers on the pulse of a crew by taking their meals there. I figured Quan would alert me to anything I needed to know if we lived long enough to care. Updating the calculations, the holotank told me that three more litho squadrons would catch us before we got under cover beneath the cold waves. This was assuming they did not try to match velocities with us, but only braked when they had come into range. The first group came closer and closer. Hansen held off on flipping the ship around to begin his braking maneuver until the last possible moment. Just before they came into range of our two heavy lasers, I told him to flip the ship so we pointed back the way we came. This not only set us up for deceleration, it aimed our best shielding and firepower directly at the enemy. I let them come a little closer, knowing that the nearer they were, the harder our weapons would hit. Fire, I said, and our laser gunners started picking them off. Unfortunately, it turned out that several shots were needed to fully slag one of their fighters, because they were so big compared to a comparable craft of Star Force design. They were actually as large as the original nano ships, like our gunships or frigates. At least a hundred feet long and made of stone, it took hard hits from our main batteries to knock them out. Since the litho fighters seemed to be mostly made up of crystal, they were also hugely massive and could obviously take a pounding. Combine the two shots on one, I ordered. Target the nearest fighter in each case. Steadily, the litho fighter numbers dropped as we blasted each in turn as fast as our heavy beams could recharge. By the time they came within range of our secondaries, we destroyed a third of them. Use half the standard lasers on one fighter at a time, 
I said. If one blast kills a fighter, split them up again. I want to find the minimum number of guns it takes to kill in one salvo. It turned out we needed six to kill in one shot. We killed about fifty of them before they started firing back. Nineteen of their lasers lanced out, aiming at one spot on Valiant. These were weaker and apparently fired at extreme range because they failed to destroy their target, heavy laser number two. Overheating in HL2, one of the laser gunners reported. Evasive maneuvers, Mr. Hansen. We can't let them gang up and fire everything at one spot like that again. Hansen used side repellers to jink us slightly in random directions. It wouldn't make them miss completely, but it would complicate their targeting and spread out their hit pattern. It would also reduce the time they had to strike at a particular spot. By the time the attacking squadron was down to eight fighters, we'd taken a bunch of minor hits, losing sensors and pieces of armor. It was then that the lithos sprung their next surprise. I saw pinpoints of red bloom in the holotank as the eight turned into eighty. Multiple targets, missile launch, I snapped. Priority to individual point defense fire. If they had nukes on board, we had to shoot them down. The new swarm jumped toward us with startling speed. Sensors showed they were smaller, tinier even than our own missiles. In the litho's usual scale, they must seem like mere bullets rather than missiles. Bullets. Give me a radiation reading on those missiles, I barked. No radiation, the word came back. Okay, they're not nukes, I thought out loud. Conventional warheads of that size can hardly hurt us. They aren't going to hit hard enough to damage us much by impact. What are they trying to do? And then I remembered the snowflakes. Quan, prepare to repel borders. Get some men on the hull and station reaction teams at key points inside. I was guessing, but nothing else made sense. They had built or modified these new missiles for one purpose, to be fast enough to chase us down and deliver something to damage us. All their radioactives had probably gone into their engines. At the end of the chase, the only method these litho weapons had left to attack us was manually, with claws grown out of their own bodies. Chapter 22 Give me a visual on one of those projectiles, I said. As I suspected, it turned out to be a snowflake. Closer and closer the cloud came, leaving the shrunken fighters behind. I pulled up one of those for a moment and noticed it wasn't firing anymore. In fact, the fighter had lost its arrow shape and now looked like just a chunk of rock. They used the remnants of their fighters to push against and abandon them like marines jumping off ships, I said. How are we doing on shooting them down? Not so well, Hansen said. They're small targets and have turned edge on. They're evading as much as they can, but I got a little surprise for them. He laughed. Does anyone else need to know about this trick of yours? I asked. Hansen blinked, then reached over to key his communications. Sergeant Major Kwan, tell your men to get below and brace for hard deceleration. I'm about to hit the brakes in fifteen seconds. He held up a hand and slowly counted to zero, watching the chronometer. Then he ran the engine power up to maximum. Valiant shuddered and bucked in response. We're off balance, Hansen said through gritted teeth. All that mass we dumped changed our center of gravity. Fighting the controls, he soon steadied the ship. As he did so, I watched the falling snowflakes leap toward us like mad things. As we were pointed prow backward with our engines breaking our speed, we were letting them catch up to us that much faster. At first I thought Hansen had made a mistake, but then I figured out his surprise. If I was right about these snowflakes, they could only do a serious damage if they were able to latch on and try to dig in. Now our combined closing speeds had increased so much, I doubted they could attach before bouncing off. Hang on, Hansen muttered just before some of the snowflakes hit us. Valiant shook, and I heard clangs and groans as we were struck at high velocity. Then all was quiet again. Oh, crap, I said as I watched more snowflakes fall toward us. This time they had linked arms and turned into a kind of super snowflake, a latticework of crystal. This is going to hurt. Now Hansen's maneuver hardly mattered, as the hexagon of joined lithos acted as a net not to be thrown off. 
At least forty of them linked together, smashed against the hull. A few got knocked off into space, but the rest let go of each other and began to dig their sharp crystal claws into the ship. Keep it together, Hansen. I'm getting into armor, and tell the crew to grab their self-defense weapons. I bolted out the door and down to the marine deck. My battle suit stood humming in its niche, an extra I'd had built for me but never used in combat, only in battle sims. I threw off my pressure suit and jumped into the monstrosity. My biometrics turned on, and its primitive brain announced, Armored combat suit system active. Welcome, Cody Riggs. Thanks, suit. Now give me a HUD view of the ship with all friendlies and enemies. Examining the situation, I saw several breaches already imminent. Quan and his troops were back out on the hull, fighting to keep the snowflakes from getting in. Only a few Marines had stayed inside. I cursed my decision to send so many out onto the hull. The real danger would be if one of those things started rampaging around within the ship. Grabbing a laser rifle, I plugged its thick cable into my suit. Then I looked over the other auxiliary weapons, trying to figure out what would be most effective. I couldn't really use heavy explosives inside the ship. Finally, I grabbed a breaching cutter and slung it on my back. It was like an old-fashioned chainsaw with a monomolecular band. The HUD led me to the nearest breach. I saw a crystal spike coming up through the floor, sawing and probing even as smart metal tried to close around it. The thing had already gotten past the hull and the maintenance crawl space. Turning the laser rifle to its closest focus and highest setting, I blasted the reaching arm. Refracted green light washed everywhere, darkening my visor to almost black like a welder's mask. The litho limb shattered, sending shards rattling into my suit. When I could see again, though, I saw smoking gashes in the walls where my beam had touched, and several painted surfaces had ignited from the heat. Alarms blared and automatic suppression systems blew in hail and gas. I had to switch to short-range sonar to see. I approached the hole in the floor and the blackened limb cautiously. The limb was still moving, so I fired another shot through its stump and into its central body mass. It took several shots, and by the time it was dead, the fire system was working overtime. Obviously, lasers were not optimal inside the hull. Too much collateral damage. I stowed my laser rifle in its cradle on my back and pulled out the cutter. It had a two-handed grip like a huge sword with a protracted blade and a moving belt. The cutting band had an edge one molecule thick, the sharpest thing possible to material science. Starting it up, I ran down the passageway toward the next incursion, where I saw a group of crew faced off against one of the things. Fortunately, I came into the fight from the other side. Cease fire! I yelled over the close-range comm as I rounded the corner. Despite my order, a bolt from a laser pistol scored my armor, narrowly missing the cutter. Cease fire, damn it, unless I'm out of the way! The snowflake loomed in front of me, a juggernaut twenty feet across. Its jagged arms ripped and tore into the deck, overhead, and bulkheads, a slow-motion wrecking machine. Thumbing the button that pulled back the safety guard, I set the cutter against the nearest arm and pulled the trigger that made the flexible blade whirl at high speed. I felt more than heard the supersonic whine as the device sliced into the crystal like it was made of cardboard. In a second, I'd severed one arm and set to work on another. The monster turned on me like a giant double-jointed hand that could fold itself backward. I jumped away, holding the cutter like some two-handed sword-wielding warrior or a chainsaw killer from an old slasher vid. Fencing with it for a moment, I managed to cut off a third arm. At that point, it was doomed, as it was not able to balance well enough on two appendages to use the third offensively. Quan, I gasped as I carved the thing to bits. As soon as you get the hull clear, get to the armory and grab breaching cutters. They work better than lasers inside. Now you tell me, he grunted, still in his own fight. We got most of them, sir. Second squad, finish clearing the hull. First squad, follow me. On my HUD, I could see his icon move to the airlock. He was moving in my direction, and that sounded fine to me. I knocked out another snowflake with my cutter before Marines surrounded me and fanned out in all directions. Clearly, my work felling crystal timber was over. I handed the device to Quan as he didn't have one. Use one of these cutters instead of your laser, I told him. Beams do almost as much damage to our own ship as to them. As soon as you finish them, start damage control. Yes, sir. 
Quan took the cutter from me and headed for the nearest snowflake. Quan had it under control, so instead of forcing my way to the new front lines, I headed back up to the bridge. Everyone looked at me in surprise as I stomped over to the hollow tank in my heavy armor. Opening my faceplate, I talked to Valiant. Lower gravity on the bridge to point 3G. That would light me up a bit. Then I retracted my gauntlets and helmet into the suit and reduced the servo boost. I didn't want to accidentally smash a console with an ill-timed sweep of my hand. Right then, the holotank told me that we had to keep decelerating hard if we were going to make our landing. Unfortunately, this braking allowed the next two litho squadrons to catch up to us with frightening rapidity. Furthermore, instead of coming at us one at a time, they cleverly formed up into a mass of more than 80 fighters, which was much harder to deal with. Engage them at maximum range, I said. Divide up your fire into smaller groups this time. We have to kill or disable as many of those things as we can. If we're lucky, we will force them to launch their snowflakes early. We were able to knock them down to 66 fighters this time before they began calving. Over 500 additional snowflakes blossomed in the holotank, all heading directly toward us. Ready that last nuke, I called. Set it to detonate as near as we can stand. I want them to be as densely packed as possible. I hadn't been entirely sure of why I had saved that last missile, but there was an old battle saying about the winner usually being the commander who kept something in reserve for the right moment. This seemed to be that moment. The missile flashed out of the tube, and seconds later detonated close, right where I wanted it to. It vaporized at least half the snowflakes and only gave our ship a good sunburn. 250 was still too many for my comfort, but it was a hell of a lot fewer than 500. Keep engaging. Run the lasers as hot as you can. It didn't matter how hot they got or if they had to shut down, because I figured this would be the litho's last chance at us for a while. It's too many, I whispered as I saw the count fall to 200. We weren't killing them fast enough. The snowflakes were matching course and speed with us, and we couldn't maneuver much if we wanted to splash down where we needed to. I tried to come up with options, but any delay in landing would allow even more lithos to catch up. Furiously, I worked solutions in the holotank and came up with only one possibility. We can't handle that many, I announced. Hansen, turn us over and accelerate again. Put us in a planetary orbit around Matterhorn 6 along the track I've plotted. We'll swing back and try again. What? he demanded. You're crazy. If we do that... We'll have to face a thousand fighters and ten thousand snowflakes, instead of just a hundred and fifty. I don't have time to argue. Do it, or we're all dead, I snarled, taking a heavy step toward him. Hansen let out a stream of profanity and slammed the controls hard over, spinning the ship around and changing course away from the ice moon we'd nearly reached. Snowflakes that had almost latched on to us now fell back, as we pulled away and blasted some of them with our naked engine exhaust. In this form, the lithos didn't have the speed to catch us, and a few moments later, we'd made it out of immediate danger. As we curved away from the snowflakes, I saw that my choice had been the right one, at least in the short term. While the litho fighters probably could have kept up with us, the snowflakes couldn't. They were the equivalent of our marines, who could move around in space but couldn't match a warship's speed and maneuverability. In either case, boarders had to get close, and I'd goaded them into deploying too early. Unable to divert their course, they were soon falling into the freezing ocean of the icy moon below us. Hug the planet, I told Hansen. As huge and high grav as it is, you should be able to keep our speed up in a tightly powered orbit, just skimming the edge of its atmosphere. We'll make a complete circuit out of their view, altering course so we'll come back at an unexpected angle. The lithos won't be able to see us until we crest the horizon. We've lost a lot of speed, Hansen said. An orbit will take two hours. By that time, they'll all be waiting for us at the ice moon. We'll have to run a gauntlet that might kill us. I don't think so. I quickly set up a holotank replay of the last several hours using a handheld cursor to point at the relevant items as I spoke. Look here. Those that didn't splash down into the icy waters are following us. Whenever we turn, they keep dogging our tails. If they knew we were heading for the moon, they would have cut us off here. I drew a glowing line along the shortest path. But they didn't. 
Whatever they know, they aren't acting like they're anticipating us. They don't understand our plans. I think they just saw an opportunity and took it. If we'd been in open space, those fighters would have caught us one squadron at a time and eventually worn us down. But as soon as they broke up into snowflakes, they lost their high mobility. Hansen rubbed his bare head with one hand. All right, that seems to make sense. But the lithos don't make sense. Why give up their fighter maneuverability so early? Because I suckered them, and they made a mistake. They're too predictable. Present them with what looks like an optimum solution based on all the variables, and they'll seize it. They don't necessarily take second and third order possibilities into account. And when we slowed down and started killing them with our lasers, they calculated that they could do us more damage by launching the snowflakes. Hansen cocked his head as if finding this hard to believe. But they've been so smart up until now. How could they be so stupid all of a sudden? Don't make the classic mistake of overestimating the enemy. Everyone makes mistakes. The macros did during the wars. I studied all my father's campaigns. Every race we've run into has had its blind spots, strengths, and weaknesses. The lithos are no different. Hansen grunted, turning away and minding his helm in silence. I wondered what was going on in his head. Did he think I was cocky, a know-it-all, or a gambler? My father had said that most military leaders grow risk-averse during peacetime. They were used to protecting their careers rather than sticking their necks out to attain their goals. He'd had to deal with that mindset during the macro wars. Now, twenty quiet years later, it seemed the same malaise had set into Star Force. The current crop of fleet personnel played not to lose. Not me. I played to win. If we played it safe, we'd just get whittled down. I hoped Hansen would see that my way was the right way. If the brain box can fly the ship for a while, take a break, I told him. Rotate the watches, but be ready to fly again when we come over the horizon. You're one shit-hot pilot, the best we have. If we're lucky, you won't have to prove it again. With that, I walked off the bridge and came back to the marine deck to get out of my armor. Once I was back in utilities, I swung by the factory room. Every Star Force officer learned how to program a factory, but I had been relying on Adrian and Sakura. I waved away the technician and sat down at the control console. I felt like doing a little work myself. I spoke aloud. Unit 1, this is Cody Riggs. All factories, by convention, were named Unit and then a number. It was something Dad had started, and it had stuck. Command personnel recognized, it replied. Factories, like most brain boxes, would reply in the manner in which they were addressed, voice or keyboard. Unit 1, working. Bring up the template on a breaching cutter. Displayed. It showed on the console screen. I studied it for a moment. Customization mode. Increase blade size by 50%. Increased. Add a second opposing blade, like a pair of scissors. Specifics required. I worked with the factory brain box on the template for a half hour, until I had a device more suited to fighting snowflakes. With two blades, the wielder could use it as a double-bladed cutter or could configure it like huge chainsaw snips. In that mode, all the user had to do was stick a crystal arm between the two, squeeze and sever the arm. I told the factory to make forty of them, left a message for Quan to distribute them to the defense teams, then went for a meal. I ran into Adrian alone in the wardroom. Ravenous, I heated up a ration pack, opened up a plastic envelope of fake fruit salad, and sat down across from her. No one ever seemed to occupy that seat whenever I saw her eating, though that fact only just occurred to me. Was it because no one wanted to risk my wrath if I wanted to sit there? Or did she wave everyone else off? Great job with the weight dumping, I said by way of an opener. She nodded her thanks, gazing at me under hooded eyes that were not smiling. I continued. We're going to loop around the planet and make another run at it. I'm hoping they haven't figured out our goal and we can shoot by them this time. Sounds good, she said, looking down at her food. I sighed over loud without meaning to. I'd been trying to put on a cheerful, positive face, 
but I felt like Adrian had shut me out completely. It wasn't fair. I was only trying to maintain crew morale and discipline, and I didn't understand why she couldn't see that. Every manual, every textbook, every case study I'd read in the Academy had clearly shown how corrosive fraternization and personal favoritism was to a military organization. My father had experienced it firsthand. That didn't mean we couldn't be cordial and friendly. She'd remained more distant than Hanson or Sakura, and I barely even knew those two. It just made no sense to me. Adrian, can we clear the air between us? I don't understand what the problem is. Her face tightened and she looked at me. Of course you don't. You're a typical male. Now strike that. You're a spoiled male that's never had to learn to deal with a real woman. My jaw tightened. Oh, I'm spoiled, Countess Turnbull? I didn't grow up on an estate. I worked on a farm getting my hands dirty. Not spoiled by money. Emotionally spoiled. You've never had to consider any girl's feelings before. They've all thrown themselves at you since you hit puberty. Is that what this is all about? Kalu? Nothing happened between us, but even if it had, what business is it of yours? I'm your commanding officer, which is what you asked for. You wanted to join Star Force. She's a civilian. That's no excuse. I didn't ask for you to turn into such a jackass. That felt like she'd stabbed me in the gut and I stood up. Jackass or not, I have a job to do and so do you. Too bad she couldn't see that and just get over whatever was upsetting her. I sure couldn't read her mind. Picking up my food, I carried it toward another table, fighting back unexpected fury. As I moved, I noticed Sakura was in the wardroom with us. She was eating alone and quietly. I hadn't even noticed her, but I felt a little embarrassed now. She had to have overheard my conversation. I glanced at her, but the woman remained expressionless and didn't meet my eyes. The embarrassment stung. What was wrong with me? I was Cody Riggs, damn it. I should be able to handle Adrian. Dad had kept a lid on that crazy woman Sandra before Mom, and she was a hundred times more trouble than Adrian. I watched Adrian while pretending not to, and chewed my meal. I couldn't figure her out. Olivia had been so much easier to get along with. Once again, I found the devastation of her loss threatening to break through my professional demeanor. Adrian left us less than a minute later. Apparently, she couldn't take the pressure either. I glanced over at Sakura, who chewed robotically. Engineer Sakura, I said, attempting to sound cheerful. Mind if I join you? She looked startled, but nodded. I moved to her side and sat down. As I understand it, you're a computer expert, is that correct? Sakura studied me for a moment before replying. My original studies were in computer engineering, but I've since become a generalist as is appropriate for a ship's engineer. I nodded. I see. Could I have you look into something for me? Certainly, Captain. Could you examine the software installation records in the ship's database? She chewed mechanically for a moment. To a point, yes. I frowned. What do you mean? They were erased at some point during our voyage. Staring at her, I felt a cold sensation. Could this be significant? Marvin had said that someone must have taken his programming for the Yale Ring and engaged it. If that had been done purposefully, the instigator might have wanted to cover their tracks by erasing the registry and logs. And that person might well have been the one who'd killed Olivia and marooned this ship on the wrong side of the Yale ring. We need to get that information, I said. I want to know who had access and how the data could have been altered. Sakura put down her fork with a tiny clinking sound. Difficult, she said thoughtfully. But not impossible. It sounds as if you believe this act was performed deliberately. I do. She cocked her head slightly and gave me a quizzical squint. But why? I'd assumed there was a system fault of some kind. This ship has taken a beating, several of them, in fact. Nodding, I had to admit she was right. 
Could it be that I was grasping at straws? See what you can do, and report back to me soon. I will do as you ask, Captain. I dumped my plate and left her then. Disturbed, I was glad to leave the wardroom. I went down the hall to the captain's cabin and raided the liquor cabinet, brooding over a triple scotch. I couldn't let the crew see me in this mood. My job was to get these people home, and to do that, they had to believe in me. It was a commander's duty to bear more than his fair share of the load. If Adrian wasn't going to help me out with that, then I'd have to ignore her. I'd forget her as a woman or a friend, and just treat her like any other member of the crew. Eyeing the empty glass, I capped the bottle and put it back on its padded slot. Then I went and armored up. This time I picked up one of the new cutters, but no laser rifle. Soon, we would have to face the lithos again. Back on the bridge, I found Hansen had gotten there ahead of me. I'd taken an hour and a half, so I knew he'd had an even shorter break. Still, he looked like he'd cleaned up and eaten, and had a spill-proof cup of coffee in the holder at his elbow. He was a grown-up. I wasn't going to micromanage him. I have the watch, Hansen, I said, announcing my presence. Yes, sir, he said, keeping his eyes on his instruments. There was a low-power laser transmission from Marvin. It's encrypted text. He's taking every precaution he can, I replied. Pass it here. Hansen made a flicking motion, transferring the file from his screen to mine. I brought it up on one of the auxiliary screens beneath the holotank, rather than displaying it for everyone. 99% plus probability, number 11 moon Matterhorn 7, contains ring. Holding at long range and studying lithos. Good luck on ice moon. Except for the sensor data on the ring moon, that was it. He could easily have sent pages of text coded in a burst with little additional risk, so I knew there was a lot Marvin wasn't telling us. Still, I couldn't see any way he could possibly sneak his way through either ring and leave us behind now, no matter how long he was left alone. He'd disappeared for months at a time back in the macro wars, but he'd always come back to stir the pot. Maybe if he had the time to study the lithos, he could come up with valuable insights, learn their language, and collect important intelligence. I hoped he didn't start communicating with the lithos on his own the way he had with the macros. That had led to near disastrous results. In fact, in the much longer and more detailed message I sent back to him via tight beam laser, I forbade him from contacting the lithos of this system or cutting deals with any of them. By that time we had reached the point where the ice moon appeared above the horizon of the enormous gas giant we orbited. The planet was so big that as we skimmed its atmosphere, we could hardly see its curvature on the forward viewscreen. Instead, my mind tried to trick me into believing we cruised much lower, as if we flew an airplane just above the clouds of an Earth-like planet, except these clouds glowed blue and shimmered with hidden silent lightning strikes. That got me wondering if there might not be some kind of life below us. Perhaps there was something similar to the blues that lived down there in that soupy gas. We hadn't detected anything, but then again we hadn't looked very hard. Even if we had, Matterhorn 6 possessed the surface area of a thousand Earths, and it would have been easy to miss quiet life forms. I turned deliberately away from that awesome view and stared at the holotank and its small auxiliary screens, which were much better for commanding the ship. Crew to battle stations, I said calmly. They were probably all there anyway, but making sure never hurt. Moonrise in ten minutes, Hansen said. If the holotank is up to date, I only see one squadron of litho fighters, and they haven't noticed us yet. Against the hot background of the planet and clouds, we were just a speck. As long as we did not light off our engines or transmit... Picking us out of the clutter would be next to impossible until we got close. I'd counted on that as well. Make that two squadrons, I said, as more lithos broke the horizon. Running intercept numbers, I said. Whether they'll be able to catch us depends on when they see us. Do you have a least time solution on the splashdown? Yep, Hansen replied tersely, and I realized I was giving in to my nerves. 
Plotting and flying our course was the man's number one priority, and it had been stupid to ask. Two more squadrons, I called as they came into view. The four groups seemed to be holding in widely separated geosynchronous orbits around the gas giant, which made sense. They were in perfect spots to observe. I presumed other squadrons were even now moving into position, ringing the planet, looking for us. The only better formation for them would have been to break up the squadrons into flights of two to four, allowing them to cover more area. Maybe with their macro-like hive mind, they got smarter and worked better with more of them near each other passing signals. That could be another explanation for why they like to build everything so big. Probably there was a threshold of intelligence below which they became almost animals, simple beings with simple goals, like the snowflakes. Moonrise, Hansen said as the ice moon came into view. We were overtaking it in its orbit and coming in from a slightly oblique angle. Had I been the lithos hunting a ship, I might have anticipated this move and waited to pounce. But they hadn't. As I had told Hansen, they simply didn't think the way we did, and vice versa. Probably what we were doing didn't make much sense to them, either. From a litho point of view, our ship must be like a dangerous bandit running madly in and out of their peaceful landscape, circling and dashing here and there to strike, while they, the villagers, formed militia units and tried to drive us off. That's what the litho warships reminded me of, I realized. Militia. They didn't seem to have a professional fleet or military the way humanity did. I theorized that in litho society, every litho was a potential warrior with little specialization. Like militias everywhere, they tended to focus on the immediate threat and not look ahead and think strategically. If fortifying their rings and sitting tight had bought them peace and prosperity until now, then why should they have developed heavier weapons and better ships? In that way, they did resemble humanity. Without an imminent threat, they turned to other pursuits, neglecting war. Sadly and unintentionally, I'd brought war to them. Maybe if we built up enough, we could get them to yield long enough to start a dialogue. Every race Dad had confronted, from the macros to the blues who had created them, respected strength. The holotank flashed red as the lithos began to move. Here we go, people, I said. They've seen us. Chapter 23 I watched four fresh litho squadrons creep toward us on the display. They're leading us this time, I said. Just a bit, hedging. They haven't figured out yet that the moon is our goal. Can I pre-plot a firing solution? Hansen asked. I stared at the holotank until my eyes stung and I had to blink. Their squadrons were almost in long range of our heaviest two lasers. Do you need much power for maneuvering? I asked. It's not possible to answer that, really. Flank speed with full repeller assistance will draw down our capacitors quickly, but the plots say we'll beat them there if we push hard now. One thing to keep in mind is that the faster we go, the harder we'll have to break at the end. We can't hit those oceans unless we're moving dead slow. I wanted to pace back and forth on the deck, but in armor I'd probably break something. It all depends on what weapons they deploy. Speaking that thought aloud decided it for me. Start firing at long range. We need to make them commit to their chosen tactic and reveal their plans to us. Aye, sir. Mains, fire as they range, Hansen told the beam gunners. Soon, the big lasers thrummed bolts of energy at the nearest fighters, knocking one out right away. In response, the litho fighters shot forward and began evading wildly, buying themselves precious minutes. At the longest range, the seconds, or even fractions of seconds it took, for sensors to see evading targets and the light of lasers to reach them meant a likely miss. The closer they got, however, the more accurate our fire would be. The nearest squadron took a beating. It wasn't until we destroyed twenty of them that the lithos sprung their ploy on us. The squadron split into two. A group of the ships continued to evade violently like mad hornets, but still headed in our direction. The rest of the ships seemed to tear themselves apart. 
with one chunk of each ship accelerating at breakneck speed toward us, while the other portion stopped nearly dead in space and drifted. The sensors identified these threats as a new type of faster nuclear missile. Because they were leading us and coming in at an angle, the brain box calculations said they would intercept us if we let them. Target the missiles, I said. They'll hit us first, and if they have nukes, they'll kill us. Our gunners frantically plied their lasers, the two big mains and the twelve secondaries, and then finally the dozens of point defense turrets. Unlike in previous engagements, these missiles were not slowly approaching us from behind, providing easy targets. Instead, they were on a head-to-head -head collision course. They corkscrewed and pinwheeled to dodge our beams, coming closer every second. The group of fighters that had split apart from the missile-firing types had moved directly between us and the moon. Maybe they'd figured out that was our goal, even if they didn't understand it. These enemy craft burst into a cloud of snowflakes, which formed a cloud between us and our goal. They were in position to cut us off, but they were now slow and avoidable. Five, four, I counted down the strikes as we knocked out incoming missiles. Down to three, they crossed into nuclear detonation range, and I knew then we were going to get hurt. Two, the world whited out, and I was thrown into the side of the holotank. My helmet shattered the glass, but the material would heal itself eventually. In fact, the holotank would probably heal faster than my bleeding forehead. I felt the gravity shift under my feet as stabilizers and repellers strove to compensate for the turbulence of the blast. Half the control boards on the bridge flickered out. I shook my head and pulled myself to my feet. The holotank had gone dark, leaving me without situational awareness. I dragged myself over to another console. Sakura, my chief engineer, had been manning this station. She'd been on the bridge checking something. But whatever her mission was, she was incapable of finishing it. She was sprawled out on the floor. She must not have told the nanite arms to secure her well enough. Her external monitors said she was still breathing, so I didn't fuss over her. I had no time for her now. The console in front of me showed we were still more or less on course for the icy moon. Valiant had taken the proximity blast on her heavily armored nose, and it looked like only one of the enemy nukes had gone off. Maybe the first had cannibalized the second, destroying the atomic warhead before it completed its detonation sequence. Their nuke had been relatively dirty. I noticed our radiation meters were all showing red. Anyone not nanotized would have taken a lethal dose but all the humans aboard had been treated. I wondered about Hoon and how much he could take. Then I remembered that water was pretty good shielding material and hoped he was huddling in his cabin. Hansen's bald head had a gash across it, but he was still in the game. Stoically, he wiped his eyes and fought the controls until the ship stopped pitching and yawing. Once I saw he was on the job, I stopped worrying about the piloting and checked for new threats. Here come the snowflakes, I rasped, my throat suddenly hurting. I think the helmet ring around my neck had been smashed into my larynx when I hit the holotank. But if that was my only significant injury, I was in good shape. The nuke blast slowed us down, and it was perfectly timed to avoid killing the snowflakes. Another squadron is closing, staying in their fighter form, Hansen said. It's a one-two-three punch. Hansen was right. They'd set up a relatively sophisticated attack. Missiles, snowflakes, and more fighters with lasers following behind. Gunners, prepare to switch targets, I ordered. Knock out those flakes before they reach the hull. Half our secondary turrets had been knocked out. The mains were still operating at full capacity as they were heavily armored. Hansen, spin the ship around its axis, I said. Make it hard for them to latch on. That's going to ruin our gunnery, he replied, but initiated the maneuver anyway. I guess he was starting to trust my tactical intuitions. I didn't mind his objections as long as he followed my orders immediately. We can't shoot down more than a fraction of them before they get here, I told him. But they're coming too fast to really match speeds. They're going to get one chance each to land on us, and I want the hull to look like a mad merry-go-round knocking them off. Quan here, the Marine broke in. Permission to exit the hull, sir. Not yet, Quan, I said. We're spinning. I don't want to throw Marines off into space with the snowflakes. Sir, he said with a voice full of eagerness. Give us a chance. We can handle a spin. 
We'll lock double safety lines and fight from the airlocks if we have to. But we need to get them on the hull before they get in. All right, Quan, I said. But this time, keep at least half your people in reserve for interior defense, with cutters ready. Kill any intruders and seal off any breaches. And remember, we're coming in for a water landing at the end of this. Yes, sir. We're on our way. I shook my head with a grim smile. I'd drawn an ace when fate had dealt me Quan as my chief of marines. With the holotank knocked out and the ship spinning, the sensors had trouble keeping the view screens stable. To stave off motion sickness, I had to stop watching them. Hansen, like most pilots, didn't seem to have a problem with it, and it looked like he was flying by instruments anyway. One crewman wasn't so fortunate and retched onto the floor, which I knew the ship would soon absorb and recycle. Not the most pleasant of thoughts, but with nanites, everything could be reprocessed, given time. Here they come, Hansen muttered. Everyone button up your suits, I called over the all-hands channel. Impacts shuddered throughout the ship as snowflakes struck us. Our overload stabilizers leaked kinetic energy, and I belatedly slammed my visor shut and told the bridge restraint system to grab me with its tentacles. I brought up a system schematic and found scattered damage, but nothing critical until one of the empty forward water tanks lost pressure. The brain box sealed it off, but I figured I knew what it meant. Quan, we have a breach in tank three. Send a team. On it, he replied. I hated just sitting here giving orders. I'd much rather go charging into the hand-to-hand -hand fight. But right now, I was the only...